Today is the 16th of January 2023, and this is a conversation between Emilio Longo and Paul Borg. Paul, welcome to School Based Art, a learning resource for art students and artist teachers. Thank you for welcoming us into your studio today. No worries. Thank you. Nice to see you. Meet you. Fantastic, Paul. Well, let's begin with an introduction. <laughs> now, Paul, you were born in 1962 in Melbourne, Australia. You were a figurative painter located in the western suburbs of Melbourne who has been practicing for over 35 years. You have lived in the West your whole life and your paintings frequently capture the landscape, people and objects of your local environment. Working across the genres of portraiture, still life, landscape and figure painting, you paint out of your home in St Albans where your school is also located. In 1981, you graduated from the Tertiary Orientation Program in Art and Design, receiving a Diploma of Fine Arts from Western Melbourne Institute of TAFE in Footscray. And in 1984, you received a Bachelor of Fine Arts in Painting from the Victorian College of the Arts in Melbourne. You have taught for a majority of your life, spending over 30 years teaching in the TAFE sector at Victoria University before moving on to establish your own art school. You have also taught at the Hunt Club Community Centre in Deer Park, and in fact, you were one of the pioneers who helped establish the centre. During your early career, you spent some time working as a freelance children's book illustrator, and between 1985 to 1988, you successfully illustrated five of Greg Mitchell's books titled Our Car, Greedy Goat, Things Don't Change Much, Glue Stew and Letter of Rosie O'Grady, all the while continuing to paint and exhibit your work. Between 1993 to 2000, you were one of the original committee members of West Space Gallery in Melbourne, along with then-director Brett Jones and Sarah Stubbs. Since 1989, you have had 13 solo exhibitions in Melbourne and over 90 group exhibitions in your hometown, as well as internationally in Malta, India and Scotland. You have won several awards throughout your career, including the Alfred Rachel Levi Award, from the Victorian College of the Arts in 1983. You received the Folio Award from the Trustees of the National Gallery of Victoria in your final year at the Victorian College of the Arts in 1984. You were awarded a developmental grant from the Australian Council for being artist in residence at ICI Deer Park in 1992 and you were the recipient of the Vice-Chancellor's Award for Teaching Excellence from Victoria University in 2001. You have been an eight-time semi-finalist and five-time finalist for the Doug Moran National Portrait Prize, as well as being shortlisted six times and being a three-time finalist for the Rick Amore Drawing Prize. You have also been a three-time finalist for the Rick Amore Self-Portrait Prize. Since 1990, your work has been featured in a number of publications, including The Herald Sun, The Age, and the local community newspaper. You have completed several commissions for various organisations throughout your life, which include the Sunshine City Council, the Maribyrnong City Council, in which you painted a portrait of former Mayor May Ho. You have received a commission from the Hiberian Hotel in Port Melbourne, and Victoria University, where you painted a portrait of Foundation Vice-Chancellor Jarlif Ronane AM. Your work is featured in public and private collections in Australia, including the National Gallery of Victoria, the Art Gallery of Ballarat, the Trobe Picture Collection in the State Library of Victoria, La Trobe University, Geelong Gallery, Art Bank, Victoria University, Lincoln Institute of Health Science, Sunshine Council and Westland Mining. Currently, you paint and teach from your school titled Paul Borg Art School in St Albans, catering for students at various levels of development from beginner through to advanced. Now, Paul, you are one of six siblings from a Maltese family. Your parents grew up in Malta but married here in Australia. Can you share some information about your childhood and the influence that the western suburbs had on you whilst you were growing up? Yep. All right, well, um, like I said, I was born, uh, born and raised here in the western suburbs. Mum and Dad met here. They both used to attend a, a local acting school, mm. and they actually met through there. 
and um, and then when they got married, they actually set up. We had a they used to run a chicken farm here in St Albans, and so we he had that. But at the same time, they used to both work in factories. Also, Dad worked at Dunlop Olympic, working with as a forklift driver, and Mum worked at a as a seamstress at a um, f- um, a clothing house. So they both worked their butt off, basically working really hard with six kids. So so we had an interesting childhood because um, we were taught about working hard and disciplined for a very young age. Sure. And, um, yeah, in Great. that sense, yeah. So um, whereabouts are you out of the six siblings? Are you one of the younger ones? No, I'm actually the second one with a twin because I'm actually a twin, a twin. so I'm, from, I'm second. There's my, yep. Sure. So Great. Second, yep. Great. Now, I understand your love for painting and drawing begun at a young age. Mm. Was anybody in your family influencing you or was it something you discovered all on your own? No, I... Th- um, it was actually, um, I've always liked to draw and I knew, I knew I always liked drawing because I used to draw a lot at school because I hated doing everything else. Yeah. My mother once took us to a local public hall, there was an art show and I, and I liked it, I really enjoyed it and I did that. Um, I thought, oh, that's interesting, but I didn't realise people can actually do it as a, as a lifestyle. And um, But my mother always tells a story to everyone, which I don't remember, but when we were when I was a kid, I wanted a paintbrush, and I'd, she didn't have any. In those days, you know, you just couldn't go to a shop. Um, but we had a dog, and apparently I cut some of his fur off and made a brush, <laughs> and I painted. So That's interesting. <laughs> I wish she kept the brush, but she never did. But um, I don't remember it, but she, she does. So you well. actually took the dog here and you know, it I, to her? Yeah, we had a dog. We always had a lot of animals around the place, having a... Um, the, the chicken farm, we used to have all sorts of animals, and I made, a, made it from his, from, from his fur. <laughs> Him or her, I don't remember what, but he made it. <laughs> yeah. You became even more passionate about drawing and painting during primary school, mm. where you were influenced by your art teacher. What impact did this art teacher have on you? Yeah, she was actually quite, she was a young art teacher um, who only art, ran an art room, and that's all she taught. And it was the first, apparently I learnt, that it was the first art room in a school in Victoria. And um, and she used to just teach art. And we used to go to a class, which I always only enjoyed that class only. And I remember she showed a, sli- um, a slideshow once of Turner's work. Okay. And, um, and I was in awe about them. And her and I are actually still friends. He, she saw one of my paintings in an exhibition at NGV a few years ago and said, I'm sure I taught him. And then since then we made connection and wow. she lives in Ballarat. Her name is Olga Fox. Okay. And, um, yeah, and she's, um, she was a very big influence on me because she knew I liked drawing and painting and she always used to encourage me. That's great. To draw and paint, yep. So when you yep. saw those Turners uh, in your primary school years, Paul, what is it that stood out to you? What is it that captured your imagination? It's an interesting thing. I try to look back and think what made me look at them and um, because she had turned other sides. I think it was the colour, the texture, all of those and the light, and sure. I think that's what really stood out. Right. And talking to her not long ago, she still has those slides, <laughs> so it was interesting. But um, she had no, um, she didn't realise that that actually that influenced me. Yeah. That, that really influenced me. And in our, in high school, I did have an, um, a, in most of them, I went to Kiaba High School. We had a lot of hippies who were teachers then, and one of our teachers he encouraged me to do painting and drawing sure. but we had an emergency teacher who came in and she was an artist and she used to also encourage me to paint and draw that's fantastic and, yep and she was very much the type where she would say okay we're going to do still life today but we're not going to be doing fruit and bananas and stuff and she would just throw a whole lot of wood shavings on the table oh. and say draw them wow okay. and draw them and I thought what and it was <laughs> enjoyable I still have those drawings mind you but yeah, that was a, an eye opener. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting uh, beginnings. Yep. From your early days, you have been immersed in the landscape of the western suburbs. I understand during your childhood, your father used to take your siblings and yourself <laughs> out to hunt quail at Taylor's Lakes. What do you recall about these trips? And do you believe these experiences help foster an appreciation? for the landscape of the western suburbs in you. Yeah, it did. Um, Dad, when he used to take us out, he, we actually didn't hunt when we were little for quail. He, he, used to, he used to take his dogs out to train them. Okay. And, um, and we used to walk 
in the area which is now Kilo Downs yes. and, and Taylor's Lakes and that was all just paddocks in those days. So we would walk for miles and miles and miles so you can train these dogs and I was just observing the landscape. You know, I didn't realise subconsciously I was taking in the landscape mm. and I used to love there because it was so flat, the landscape, and there was thistles everywhere, sure. all that sort of stuff. And then there's a point where it was just an, an area of pine trees and, and trees. I think it used to be an old homestead that was gone but the trees were still there and we would stop there so dad would have his uh, a cigarette yeah. have a smoke and, and make the dogs rest okay. but i used to sit there and just observe and um mm-hmm. yeah i really um i used to love those walks how and old were you at that time gosh i think i think i was probably we were probably about f- um five or six maybe a wow. little bit older really young and then and then we got older we were able to hunt and he we used to go to Kyneton mm. and we used to do a lot of rabbit hunting at Kyneton and we used to walk the landscape for hours hunting the landscape and dad used to teach us about the weather and teach us about the land and he would say you know the those clouds are coming that means rain's coming in about an hour's time so we better get moving oh, wow. so he would teach us that and um and we used to have markers in the landscape like there was a well-known marker in the landscape was two trees dead trees that look like chicken's feet okay so he would say okay well we've passed the chicken's feet so um we better head back now or he would say um you go that way you lot and you go that way but meet us all at that tree there and that so we i sort of got to know the landscape okay i, I sort of identify the landscape and Great. learned how the how it worked and um mm. Or it's there and getting to know the weather, the weather patterns and so on because of sure. that. Yeah. Fantastic. Mm. In your childhood, you learned to speak Maltese in order to keep up with the conversations that were happening around you and your family. You had the opportunity to visit your family's homeland of Malta when you were 22 years old. However, once in Malta, you began to realise that you are more Australian than Maltese. Mm. As you've stated, quote, I realised I was quite different from my Maltese relatives. I've got this Maltese background, but that's all. I'm a fragment of this past culture, unquote. Many of us who have immigrant parents can relate to this idea of feeling out of step with our cultural heritage. I understand Caravaggio visited Malta in 1607 after fleeing Rome as he was accused of murder. He painted some of his most celebrated works there, including the beheading of St. John the Baptist. At any point, did you undertake research into Malta's history of art? And was there anything you came across which inspired you? Yeah. Um, what I actually found is that, first of all, I learned the Maltese language because I used to like my parents gossiping about relatives and things that was going on. My brother and sisters never learned Maltese. So I actually grasped it because of that. And um, the, the thing is, is that then when I decided when I was about 22, um, I was sick and tired of everyone referring to me as being Maltese, you know, Maltese artist, you know. And I thought, well, you know, yeah, I know, but I was born here. I'm Australian. So I decided then to do my own walkabout. I decided to actually go to um, to Malta and find out where do I come from? Who am I? Sure. Who am I? Who am I? And I went there and I spent some time there, got to know the people, understood the language and their lifestyle because it's similar to what we grew up with here. But I started to feel out of place. Right. And I had to write, um, do an interview on, on the radio there and I actually did say that um, the Maltese men, a lot of the Maltese men have bird cages with finches in them and they take them to church with them, they take them everywhere. Oh, wow. And I actually said in, in, in that radio interview is that um, I'm here, I've been here for about two months but I'm starting to feel like that bird in that cage. Okay. And because the land that I feel I belong to and I think I belong to is much bigger, Australia is much bigger. But I still wasn't sure. And then a friend of mine who was a historian there, he said, I've got something to show you. And he took me to a cemetery. And in Malta, I said, what do you want? Why are we going mm. to the cemetery? So we went there and then he said, have a look around and see what you notice. And we walked around and then suddenly I saw these graves of Australian soldiers oh, wow. that were stationed there during the war. And he knew that. He knew I was going through this stage of who am I? And, um, and when I looked at those graves of Australian soldiers, I just, I just went, I just froze. And I said to myself, I'm not from here. Mm. I'm from the land where these people came from. Sure. I belong where they came from, where these people have died for, for Australia and for the world. 
I belong. I belong. I'm Australian. Yeah. I'm Australian, mm -hmm. and I don't care what people think. I, I'm, I'm I'm very proud of my Maltese heritage, mm -hmm. and I felt there. Um, because I, everyone there felt that I wasn't really Maltese, you right. know, because of the way I dressed, the way I spoke, mm -hmm. and so on. And I started to realize, no, I'm, yes, I've got Maltese heritage, which I'm happy and proud of, but I'm Australian. Sure. That's my home. You know, mm -hmm. that's, where, that's where I belong. And then I started, started to get homesick, and so on. I started to feel like, no, I, I want to go back. Mm -hmm. I want to go back home. Sure. And I did, because I could have stayed longer. You know, I could have stayed much longer, but I decided, no. How long were yeah. you there for? Well, I was actually there for about four months. In Malta, for about two months. In Europe, for I travelled around to see all the galleries and see sure. all the artists that I like mm -hmm. and looked into and so on. And and I realised that, um, and because I loved, um, you know, people like uh, Velasquez and Goya, so I needed to go and see them. I, the Spanish artists I really liked. Yeah. And as far as I know, I've always been we've told that we're Maltese, uh, of Maltese heritage. And I only um, learned in the last couple of years that we have a great grandmother who's Spanish, which I had no oh, idea. Wow. <laughs> My mother didn't even know. Mm -hmm. She didn't even know she was Spanish, so that makes sense. But yeah, it's a, for, for me, it was actually. Um, Going there was to discover who am I. Sure. You know, am I uh, Maltese and do I stay there? Mm -hmm. Do I stay there or do I belong there? Mm -hmm. But I realised, no, I don't. I belong here. Right. And I had, and since then, I had no interest in going overseas and travelling. Mm, you know, I've always, I always yeah. feel that this is, this is my place. Sure. This is my land, that I belong here. That's great. And, yeah, and that's how I feel. And that's why, because I always, I was, as I was saying, I was getting annoyed with people saying, you know, where are you from? Oh, I'm from St. Albans. No, where are you really from? No, I'm, yeah, well, you mean to say, where are my parents are from? Parents Is that from? what you mean? Yeah. yeah, my parents are actually of Maltese heritage. They're from Malta, but I'm actually Australian. Yeah. Yeah, um, of Maltese heritage, but I'm um, Australian. This is where I'm from. Sure. Yeah. That's great. And, yeah. and it's a, a great time at 22 years old, being a young man, to have, you know, known your place in the world yeah. at that particular point. So you mentioned that you went to Europe from Malta, Paul, uh, and you looked at some of the, the major galleries and mm. experienced some of the artworks. Uh, which galleries did you visit? I went to the Prado, oh, which great. Is, of course, is Velasquez and Goya's work. <laughs> sure. I went to the Louvre. And I saw for you a Rembrandt carcass, which is a great painting, mm. and um, so, saw some Vermeers. My favourite Vermeer wasn't on show; it was actually somewhere else at the time, okay. which was supposed to be there. I went to Holland. Um, um, I went to see both classical and contemporary stuff in Holland, mm. and um, where else? I went to in England, and I went to the Port, the, um, the Tate Gallery, the National Gallery, great. all of those, and I saw wonderful, and I saw Turner's works <laughs> um, without frames. I had them without frames at the Tate, and they were amazing, and I thought, yep, this is the image I remember seeing in those slides. Yeah, sure. <laughs> so when I was at Thing, yeah, so I saw a lot of artworks. But in Malta, what I actually saw, apart from the, the Caravaggio, the beheading of St. John, I saw a lot of what we call, they call votive paintings. Okay. And what they are, are small little paintings in churches that people make a promise. Mm. They make a promise to, for example, this church called the Madonna of Ruins, mm. that they make a promise and they say, if my family arrive in Malta, in Australia safely, I'll make a painting with an aeroplane and them arriving. Okay. And, and if they arrive safely, they make this painting with a picture with Madonna in the corner and they put it in the church. Sure. And then there was what the first car accident in Malta, the first... Um, um, uh, um, illness or something like all those, and these paintings were very old, but they were just left in this building that sure. anyone can take them off the wall. Yeah. So right. on this radio interview, I actually did mention that your best museum is that because mm -hmm. that's a history of Malta, mm -hmm. of the migrants, of everything else, and so on. And then since then, they've bolted them to the wall so no one can take them off sure. the wall, and they're protecting them. Yeah. But they they're an influence on me because I start to realise. They were painting the everyday, mm -hmm. and um, and that's what I liked. The everyday sure. was something of importance to me. Right. Yeah. Well, it sounds yeah. uh, very similar uh, similar to the, the Mexican tradition where they had those votive paintings. As that's well, right. Yes. Influencing artists like Frida Kahlo. Yes. Going on as well. Yeah. That's interesting. They're very naive, like Frida Kahlo's work. Yeah. In that sense, and sure. that's what I liked about them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they were really honest. Well, you, yeah. did you travel on your own? Paul? Yeah, I traveled on my own. Oh, great. Yeah, I didn't want to go on any of those Kentucky tours or anything <laughs> like that. And um, so I just sort of traveled on my own. 
in a sense, it was great. In a sense, it was very lonely. Sure. I, I was in countries like Spain and so on. I couldn't speak the language. Mm. And I felt invisible. Right. I felt invisible. People try and talk to you, and I felt really invisible. All the Americans were loud that were in Spain. They kept on thinking I was Spanish and kept on saying things to me. And I thought, oh, I'm not Spanish. Not Spanish yeah. I'm not Spanish. I'm not Spanish. You know, I'm Australian. <laughs> and, um, yeah, that was quite interesting. Interesting. Great. <laughs> Moving forward, yeah. you attended Kiaba High School. And it is in these years that you began to take art seriously yep. and made a decision to pursue art. You have mentioned that you weren't very successful academically in school. Mm. Can you elaborate on this? Yeah, look, I, um, when I was at primary school, we had nuns. Yeah, that was at the Catholic school. And we didn't really learn much at all. It, um, the nuns weren't very good. They were quite um, violent and very, um, you know, today they wouldn't be allowed to teach full stop. But... Um, I, didn't remember, I don't remember learning anything from them. Um, what I did learn was that we had emergency teachers that used to come in, and one of them used to teach, um, come in, and she said, well, apparently you're supposed to be doing maths today and this and that and so on. No, we're not. We're going to go into the yard, and she used to bring a guitar, mm. and we used to sing songs and learn songs, and that was oh, great. Wow. Yeah. That taught me a lot about music. Um, but then in, by the time I was in grade four, one of the, we used to have the old Dick and Dora books mm. in my days where you – it's very rhythmic reading okay. and you have to stand in a line and one by one you read a page. You had to um, read your page and next the kid moves on, the next one reads. And one of the teachers there, who was a lay teacher, no nun, she knew, she picked on that I didn't know how to read. Mm. And I used to look at the illustration. So if someone said Dick and Dora jumped over the fence, yeah. the one that had a, next one had a picture of a w water, a bucket of water, I would say Dick and Dora got water. Okay, right. right. But she picked it up. So as soon as it came to my turn, she covered the actual, oh. um, she covered the illustration and she said, read it, Paul. Mm. And I uh, looked at her and she said, you can't read. And I said, no. Mm. And I was, how old was I? I was, gosh, I, eight or ten. Okay, wow. I didn't know how to read. Mm. I didn't know how to read. And my parents couldn't teach us how to read. They were busy, too busy. They couldn't read or, or um, write English anyway. Right. And um, so, yes, yeah, so I wasn't getting it from the nuns and I wasn't getting it in, but the, from my parents, but the lay teacher realised. So by that stage, by the time I got to high school, I wasn't very good at writing essays. Sure. And um, so academically I wasn't very good. And, um, and, but I focused on what I was good, which was drawing and painting. Sure. And that's, and the teachers knew that. They all knew that he, he's really good at painting and drawing, Paul. You know, right. you know, getting to do that, he's really good. But reading and writing wasn't my strength. Sure. Yeah. You sound yeah. like you were really a visual learner from early on. Oh, yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Because I, I was very quiet. I was very quiet. I used to, um, what's the old saying that you, you learn more by observing than, by, than saying? Mm. So I used to sort of sit there and just look at things. And I was the type of kid that if we were walking home from school and there was a, a grasshopper caught in a spider's web, mm. I would sit there and just watch it for a while and see what happens to it and see it wow. getting spun by a spider and so on. That's the type. Very observant. Uh, I used to, yeah, very yeah. observant. I used to like looking sure. and watching. And to me, that taught me a lot. Sure. Yeah, being observant, yeah. There's a, yeah. a Melbourne artist, uh, Paul, Peter Drivotz, who I believe you went to primary school. Uh, yeah, yeah, actually, yeah, he was at the same primary school taught by the same person Olga that's interesting and yeah he became an artist he's an artist also yeah, yeah. and I only came across not long ago that he's an artist also and I thought oh my gosh there you go so she had quite an influence mm -hmm. this person sure on us and um yeah that's great yeah, do, so, do you yeah. keep in contact with Peter at all no or? no because I since primary school I haven't spoken to him so I wouldn't mind catching up with him and um and apparently I think I was in a show that he was in oh is that right and I didn't realize that was him <laughs> <laughs> It's a small world, isn't it? It's a small it? world, yeah. yeah. Now, yeah. by the time you got into high school, were you drawing and painting representationally? Uh, yeah, look, when, um, when we were doing um, painting at high school, as I mentioned before, that emergency teacher, um, she encouraged us to paint the um, things that we can relate to. And, um, okay. and, and what she said, she said, um, paint something that you know. Mm. Painting something that you know. Mm. Don't go and copy something. Painting something that you know. And at that time, I was really working at the age of 13 at a moccasin factory, you know, because wow. my parents didn't have much money. And if I wanted to buy a pair of jeans, um, my, my mother used to work for this factory that was next door to us. And um, so I started working there. Mm. And, um, and I set up 
moccasins and everything else from that factory, boxes of wool and everything else. I set them up and I, I did a drawing from it and oh. a photo, I think, then. Yeah. And I still have it. And I actually did a drawing of this still life, of <laughs> these moccasins and stuff like that, which now, in hindsight, symbolically, the moccasin was like the, um, what was the old saying? They used to call them marriage shoes of the western suburbs. Okay. But <laughs> it, it was a symbolic of the western suburbs. Yeah. I didn't realise that. And then there was one painting I did of my bed with a jumper hanging over the bed and a chair with a shirt hanging over it. So they were oh. the everyday objects yeah. that I did. And um, and a kettle, a, a kettle and something like that. Things like that, they were sure. everyday things. And I got that from uh, the two teachers I had in high school that encouraged art. Okay. Yeah. And this, yeah. You're, you're in your early teen years? At yeah, I was um, yeah, 15, 16, 17. Wow. And, but I really knew that I liked drawing, but I, there was no, no idea that you know, there was such a thing as art school or, or becoming an artist. I just liked drawing because I knew that I was good at that. Yeah. I, I used to feel relaxed when I do, did that. But when I had to do maths, when I had to do writing, I was nervous and I was really terrible because I, I just couldn't do any of them. Sure. Couldn't sure. do any of them, no. So at, mm. at this early point, Paul, who were some of the artists that you were looking at? You mentioned Turner was yeah, one. Yeah, one. Turner was one. And I think in high school, the, t the teacher that we had there in um, got us to look at um, – and uh, Van Gogh, of course, mm. but also because I did a, a still life of glass, um, she got me to look at an artist called Audrey Audrey Flack, an Australian oh, yeah, Audrey, yeah, a, Australian yeah, painter, yeah. Yeah. and uh, she's Australian. Yeah, um, it's been a while, but anyway, and um, I looked at her paintings. Sure. And who, who else? There was another artist that we were looking at, but yeah. So uh, and we went to an excursion to the National Gallery. Okay. And the uh, Bob Cooper, who was the teacher then, he took us to the NGV. Sure. And that was the first time I ever went to a gallery. Wow. And, and saw that. And what was interesting about the NGV, I must add to this, is that when we were kids, my father, parents used to take us to Flinders. We used to go fishing there. Okay. And on the way there, we used to go down St. Kilda Road, and there was that building with the, the of course, the National Gallery, the water coming down. Yeah. That was my favourite building. <laughs> I said, we're going past that building with the, yeah, yeah, we're going past that building. I had no idea it was the National Gallery. That's great. Not knowing that many years later that I'll be studying at the art school there and everything else. And sure. it was just, I thought, oh, well, God, <laughs> this is the NGV. <laughs> That's great. Fantastic. Fantastic. <laughs> at one point in high school, you decided not to pursue art any further until one day when you visited the Western Melbourne Institute of TAFE in Footscray and ended up in the art building by mistake. Mm. You have stated, quote, At that stage, I didn't even know that such a thing as art school existed, but I felt straight away that I was meant to be there, unquote. How did you initially find yourself visiting the Western Melbourne Institute of TAFE? Yeah, it was actually, it was called Footscray TAFE then. It was only called Footscray TAFE. Okay. Yeah, and um, what actually happened is that um, I, I did my, in those days, HSC, and I knew I was going to fail because I knew okay. that I wasn't very good at exams, I wasn't good at writing, all that sort of stuff. And then I thought, so then I decided to, um, a friend of mine there at high school, he wanted to go and check out an architectural course in Footscray. Oh, I see. And we oh, went there. In those days, you never went on the train on your own. And he wanted me to come along. So I went along with him. We ended up in the wrong department. Okay. We ended up in the art department. And I looked around and I thought, wow, this I like this. I didn't know there was such a thing as an art school. And then I just spoke to someone there and I applied there and then okay. and I applied and they said yeah look um, come in and say so and say bring in your folio and all that sort of stuff and I brought my folder in and surprising um, so in and after was the um, the one of the teachers there she recognized my work because she was actually on the committee that used to assess HSC folios those days they used to go to the exhibition buildings and they go through all the folios okay. from all the schools in Victoria yeah and she said to me she said when she saw my work she said at the assessment then she said gosh she's this person's good I wish she would come to our school <laughs> and here I am there with my folio and they took me in straight away they wow. said they said um do you want to come here because we want you here and I said oh yeah okay so <laughs> Straight away, I straight away, you know, went straight away, and I got in, and um, yeah, and I and I enjoyed it because it's what I wanted, and it was I started to see different things because being brought up in St Albans and the Western suburbs, the only culture there was was sports and cars, yeah, all that stuff, which bored the hell out of me. So suddenly I was in this school where I was actually open to all different things. That's which, fantastic. Yeah. So did you finish Year Twelve, Paul? I, I did. I finished Year Twelve. I failed miserably, though I must admit I actually passed 
the history side of it. Oh, no. and, and my art teacher was a bit shocked because he knew I couldn't write essays well. And he said to me, he, when I went there to get the results from him, he said, what did you do? And I said, what do you mean, what did I do? And he said, well, which essay did you write about the questions? And I said, the Van Gogh one. And he said to me, so did you write about his influences, about his colour and influences the post-impressionists and the impressionists? I said, oh, no, I didn't. <laughs> I typed him in blank during okay. the exam. I actually wrote about his influences, about how he changed the way we see things. He changed um, the area where he worked. He, he created employment for the future. Yes. He created focus on this. I went totally opposite of what we learned. <laughs> and he said, I thought you must have done something different because you passed. <laughs> oh, wow. So they must have Great. found something really unusual about this person writing this essay. Yeah. Not the usual essay. They, so they passed me on. Fantastic. <laughs> because I went on a tangent and wrote something else. Sure. So was that a history class or art history? Well, that was in, in there you did practical history and art history in one class oh, in, in high school. Right. So I definitely passed the prac. And I passed the history, which I, I actually anticipated I was going to fail the history because my writing was terrible. Sure. But sure. I passed it. That's I great. I passed it, yeah. So great. only just because of that essay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Were there mm. other art courses that were available at the time or was Western Melbourne Institute of TAFE your only option? Well, that's all I ever knew about by accident because we were – um, our career teachers then weren't really that informed about what was on, yeah. what art schools were around, or yeah. is there such thing as art schools. And at that stage, I was actually applying to go to Melbourne State College to learn to become a teacher. Okay. And I applied for that, but I know I knew I wasn't going to get in because I failed. Mm. And I knew I wasn't going to get in, so I was quite depressed. All my friends had passed because they, you know, they were, had good um, background in learning, all that sort of stuff, and reading, and I knew that I was going to fail. Sure. And um, so... But in, it, it was a blessing that I came across the TAFE by accident. Sure. Yeah. So you said you wanted to become a teacher. At that point, an art teacher? Yeah. Oh, yeah, great. because I never knew that you can actually become an artist as a career. Right. You know, there was no such thing. I thought art, becoming an artist was something that was in the history. In, in, in history, that's it. Yeah. You, you can't be an artist. Mm -hmm. So I thought, well, I have to do something to get a job. So that's why I thought I applied to become an art teacher. Sure. I knew I like art, and I'll become an art teacher. Fantastic. Yeah. Great. Yeah. In 1981, you were accepted into the tertiary orientation program in art and design at the Western Melbourne Institute of TAFE in Footscray. What was your response to being accepted, and what did your parents think? Uh, okay. Well, first of all, I was excited, as I mentioned before, that I got into that. I was excited because I thought, oh, this is what I like. And my parents sort of... Um, they weren't the type of parents, even though Maltese parents can be a bit strict, but they weren't that type of parents who were saying, oh, you're not doing that, you have to go and get a job. They weren't like that mm. was, because mum, especially mum, was crea creative. What we did was up to us. Mm. Even though dad would like us to get a job like my brothers and sisters did, sure. he would, through my mum, you know, my mum would say, dad wanted to know, are you going to get a job? Are you going to... Mum, I'm studying, you mm. know, and so on. And But he didn't sort of say no. Mm. He, That's what you, you want to do. That's up to you. Sure. So in a sense, they encouraged us to do what we wanted to do. That's great. Yeah, because like my mother wanted to be a singer, a singer when she was younger and she bought a guitar here in Australia. And um, when her mother found out that she was going to do singing, that she had a guitar and she was going to do singing, she said to her, what's this? And she said, I'm going to learn how to sing and play the guitar. She made her take the guitar back to the music shop and get oh. her money back. She goes, none of, none of my daughters are going to, my daughter of mine is going to learn how to sing and the guitar mm -hmm. and so on. Sure. So my mother, that's why she wasn't going to stop us because she knew. She, had been, she had been sort she of She had she been out. stopped from being, yeah, her, being yeah. creative herself. Yeah, sure. So she said, well, it's up to you what you want to do. Fantastic. And they didn't, they, for a long time, they didn't accept me being an artist and going to art school mm. until I started having my first exhibition and illustrating a book, all that sort of stuff. And, oh, okay, he's doing something. Sure, so, yeah. sure, great. From the West, it's hard, you know. It from is, From the West, it it's is. hard, like, you know, especially getting a job. <laughs> That's right. Uh, a lot of um, migrant families, that was the attitude, you know, you That's come, right. come to this country and start working yes. and earn a living. Exactly, yeah. I understand you spent a year completing the orientation program in art and design at the Western Melbourne Institute of TAFE. Can you provide an overview of what you learned during your time there mm. and who were some of the teachers you encountered? Yeah, I actually, the head of the department there, his name is John Barnby, which I actually just caught up with the other day. Oh, great. And um, 
and he was the head of the department and he taught drawing and painting. Mm. Um, so we all had to do design. So you had to learn design, principles of design, art history, painting and uh, drawing and sculpture. We did mm. that also. And, but painting wasn't an actual class. Everyone had to do drawing and those of us who liked painting because we all had to experience it, and then those ones who liked it, he would push us to do painting more. Okay. All right. So John Bambi taught us painting. Um, there was a guy called Robin Whittaker, uh, sorry, Robert Whittaker. Mm -hmm. He taught sculpture. Mm -hmm. Yoss Law, who taught us sculpture also, and she was very crafty in terms of all mediums mm. and hands-on person, so I learned a lot from her. Sure. And uh, Robin Baker taught us history. Okay. And, yeah, so th and, um, and you had to do an academic subject still because it was TAFE was still, you had to do an ac academic subject. Sure. So I did English and sociology. Okay. So we had to do it because I failed it in HSC, so I still had to do those. Sure. And they were okay, but I mainly focused on the art, mm. and that was it. Mm. And, and did you do well academically in art school in, in your orientation? program um academically in terms of still in the writing and so on not that great and so on um but i mainly did okay in the art history i did okay mm. i did okay there but the practical side of it i always got good marks sure and marks for that and so on and then um and and, and i knew that all they were concerned about is a, is a folio having because the, the program was about getting a folio together yeah. so you can apply for tertiary level sure and that that's what that was about right yeah. right yeah was there much tolerance for realist painting in the school at the time you mean at the TAFE? Mm. Well, the TAFE, um, the teacher taught us about working from life, drawing from life. Oh, wow. So that was important. So um, so we did that. So it, they did tolerate it because they, it was all about learning about drawing from life. Okay. And so all the still lives that we did, everything, the fig we had figure drawing, we did, everything was from life. Wow. And he pushed that. And then occasionally you had classes where you'd be a bit more inventive in some of your design classes and so on. But in the drawing classes and painting classes it was always working from life that's fantastic it was working from life because right. he was very much himself yeah doing that and um so yeah so and you took to that yeah. quite well that yeah you noticed that was your forte something that you excelled yeah. in yeah exactly yeah, yeah. fantastic yeah. yeah i always had always my was my work was always hung up because i could draw well wow. and paint well and that's what right. okay that's nice <laughs> <laughs> i was a shy kid so i was got embarrassed about the things being put up but it, look it was um it was great it was really it good. sounds like you, you really found you know something you're good at that, at that point well that's it yeah so struggled True. through high school but once you got to the orientation program in art school yeah you were, uh, good at you know you found something you were good at exactly yeah that's right in high school they didn't acknowledge that i was a good drawer and painter mm. but in art school it was like i felt like this is what i'm good at i felt like i was worthy because sure. i wasn't before i thought i was no good at math no good at writing none of that stuff so i was useless i felt useless in mm. that sense sure um whereas art school made me feel like I had something. Great. I did have something to offer. Great. Yeah. The following year, in 1982, you applied for a Bachelor of Fine Arts in Painting at the Victorian College of the Arts. VCA has quite a prestigious history and has a rich lineup of Australian artists who have passed through the school. Were you surprised once you were accepted into the school? Yes, I was. I went to the interview. I went to all the interviews, MIT, Paran, all those and the VCA, and I actually got into all of them. Great. And, um, and I had to make a decision, and I decided to go to the Victorian College of the Arts, and, and it was a bit of a shock because um, the students came from different parts of Melbourne. There's only one, one or two from the western suburbs. The rest came from all sorts of Melbourne. Mm. So in the first year, I found it a bit difficult because people thought differently. They th they um they converse differently mm. to a point where actually I went through depression for a while because I thought, oh, maybe this is not the right place for me. Maybe I should have gone somewhere else. Mm. And then eventually there was a mature age student there who said, you know, why are you here for? And I said, because I want to learn how to paint and draw. And then she said, well, that's what you should be doing. Mm. And pick up those teachers who will teach you those and learn. That's what you're here for. Yeah. And I had good teachers then because we had people like Peter Booth was teaching then. Um, we had Elizabeth Gower, um, mm. Peter Pardos, and Guy Stewart, and the dean was 
John, the English John Walker, okay. and Philip Hunter and Jeff Lowe. A lot of those are part-time teachers. Marin Man Earth. Um, yeah, we had so many. And Norbert Luffler, mm. who came a bit later, he was a history lecturer then. Sure. And Ger Elizabeth Gertzakis, who was one of our first history lectures then. And Janine Burke, wow. who was a history lecturer. So we had a quite a few different people there. I've forgotten so many of them, but there is... Um, and the, the students of that year, most of us are actually still practicing. That's great. And uh, because um, people like Louise Heeman was the same year mm. I was there, Brent Harris, yeah. um, Chris Dyson and David Glennis. So most of us are all from that same year. That's fantastic. And um, we all still make art. That's great. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. It's yeah. Uh, definitely difficult, you know, once you, after five years of, they say after five years of finishing art school, you know, it's usually the ones that are going to stick with it, stick with it, and those that That's true. don't drop off and do something else. Yeah, I think, I, I think they say only 5% will continue, the rest yeah. will do something else. Right. But I was very lucky then because I had people there who actually painters who like painting and like sure. drawing. Gareth Sampson, who was one of our main teachers there, he pushed drawing a lot mm -hmm. and he used to say, draw, draw, draw. Yeah. You know? And he was very critical and very hard, but in a sense it was great the way he taught. I remember when he used to teach figure drawing, I used to be very shy and quiet mm. and I used to turn up to figure drawing and all the other students will push in and the older ones will push in and I end up getting the worst spot, you know, yeah. which is the foreshortening spot. Yes, yeah. Because everyone will be spot. And Gareth Sampson realised that I was always getting the bad spot. And he came up to me one time and he said to me, you always manage to get the harder spot, don't you, Paul? And I said to him, yeah, I said, yeah. He said to me, mm, but don't worry about it because by the end of the year, you'll be a better drawer than all of them. Right, yeah. And I didn't understand it then, but then I did because mm. he knew I was tackling the hard one, That's the right. hard part, part, part points of yeah. perspective to draw the figure. Yeah. And, yes, I realised that I... <laughs> And learned quite a lot. Sure. And yeah, so I was grateful for him for making me realise that yeah, you know, That's just great. keep doing it and good. He pushed drawing a lot. That's he pushed great. Pushed drawing a lot. When you did get into the VCA, uh, did you notice that your parents um, accepted what you're doing more so? Or they looked at you as doing something that was actually becoming serious. Um, they, I think they still realised I was serious because I went to art school, but it still wasn't like oh, he's going to art school. Telling yeah. you, oh, he's at art school. Yeah. You know, he, it, they were more like. The other um, brothers, well, he's got a full-time job, he earns this yeah. and they've got this and everything else. But it was like, to me, it was like, well, yeah, he goes to uni studying art. Yeah. Yeah, but they didn't understand it. Sure. They didn't understand what it was about. Of course. So they weren't sure. They weren't sure. So I thought, okay. And then th I think once they came to an opening I had there okay. and they came along and under they saw what I was doing, mm -hmm. what we were doing, and that was okay. Sure. But, um, but, yeah, they still didn't understand why am I doing art. Mm -hmm. yeah, so, mm -hmm. mm. It's hard for, for um, you know, migrant families. Which I understand. I understand that yeah. because they've had to, like you said, they have to work hard yeah. and earn a living and all that sort of stuff mm -hmm. and so on. Uh, so it was difficult. For yeah. them, art sort of seemed like, you know, a luxury or something yes, that wasn't it's, necessary. Yeah. It's a hobby. It's a hobby. It's just a hobby. Not a, not that's a it. And I used to get relatives and friends saying, oh, it's a nice hobby, so what are you going to do for a living? Yeah, that's you right. Know, exactly. Um, okay. That's the attitude. Yeah. 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 Same attitude all mm -hmm. the time. What was your initial impression of the Victorian College of the Arts? And do you think your time at Western Melbourne Institute of TAFE prepared you well for the VCA? Yeah. I th um, the, the, the TAFE, because we learned all these skills, I, was, I already had skills. So I went to the VCA and I already had skills about drawing and so on, even though I learned a lot more still. Sure. Um, my first impression going to the VCA was scary. Because, um, um, like I said before, people from different backgrounds in terms of most of them came from the eastern suburbs mm. and, and their cultural and their way of thinking was different. They used to sit around and talk about the meaning of life, of the meaning of life every day. Mm. You know, I, I wasn't used to that. Right. I wasn't used to going there and sitting there for about two, three hours talking about the meaning of life. Mm. Where I came from, you get off your ass and do something and work. Yeah. So it was very difficult. They're talking about all these philosophies and they quote all this and it's like, <gasps> and then if I said something like, oh, yeah, I walked yesterday and my, I walked so far my leg fell off, you mean, so to speak, 
you know mm, mm. what do you mean yeah that's i just said my leg i felt so tight my leg no it's not literal yeah so, so i was being corrected yeah and right. for, by some people there and also because i was from the suburbs especially being a wog from the suburbs yeah. i did get a, bit, a bit of um, racism from some oh, of the yeah. couple of the students there not the teachers um but a couple of the students there they sure. gave me a bit of a hard time yeah and um i never told the teachers that but i, I was getting that and um and i just put up with it and mm. i just sort of put up with it because i was really used to it from mm. other places so um but it, it was scary it was scary and like i said before i went through a stage where i thought i think i need to get out of here mm. so i actually left for two weeks oh did you i left i left the vca for two weeks and didn't go and then i decided to go back because i realized no i want to paint i want to draw yeah and that's when i went back and that person that mature age person who knew i was having issues yeah um, and another teacher richard javier his name was he sat me down and, and i told him what was going on yeah and then i got my i refocused refocused That's great. and i decided to stay mm -hmm. to stay and um, i'm glad i did i stayed absolutely yeah that's yeah. great. Did you eventually find a small group of friends that uh, you got on well with? Well, I already had friends there. Okay. I had friends there. And um, um, there's one guy who came from Sydenham who was with me there. So I already knew him. And there was a guy, a mature age guy there then who's also a musician, Chris Dyson. Okay. And he... Um, he always had his studio space next to me mm. and I learned a lot from him okay. and I, um, he was more a figurative abstract sort of painter and very creative and a good thinker and he used to say things to me like you know I'll be confused about something whatever and he would say Paul just ignore the BS the bullshit yeah. from there and just do what you're doing and focus on that sure. and so, so, yeah. good advice yeah and um, there was one teacher who's passed away now, Paul Pardos, he, I had a tutorial with some of the staff there and I was doing still lives in the landscape and they were trying to push me away from that. Mm. You know, don't, um, oh, yeah, it's interesting with you doing a bit boring, a bit boring what you're doing. Um, why don't you do this? You know, this is what's going on in the art world. You should be doing this, this and that. And I thought, no, it's not what I want. Anyway, and then... Um, so I was then even more confused. And then um, Paul Pardos, actually, he actually came up to me two weeks later and he said to me, look, I drove through the western suburbs the other day, which I never do because he lives in the east. He had to go to Ballarat. And he said, I was driving through the east, western suburbs and I saw your paintings. I saw your landscape. Oh, okay, yeah. I saw your landscape. Mm. He said, so all that stuff that they said at the tutorial about changes and change forget about it just do what you're doing you're onto something stick to what you're doing sure and that was That's a great, great advice that was really good advice. and that lifted you yeah that did lifted me i thought yeah. okay well, i'm doing something right i sure. must be doing something right sure and i i i kept doing what i was doing great and doing that there yeah fantastic mm. now you've already touched upon the next question somewhat yep. being a realist painter how was your work received by lecturers at the victorian college of the arts um it was actually um because there were painters themselves who were realists, they actually, um, uh, um, in terms of realism, not photorealism, but just figurative, mm. they were supportive. Sure. The majority of them were. Mm. Uh, some of them were. Some weren't. Um, there was um, one guy in particular, um, John Walker, he was the English, mm. he, was, he became dean then. Okay. He was a friend of Fred Williams. Okay. And he came over to give, I think, a give a talk or something at one stage and then he decided to apply for the dean and he did and he came up to my studio space saw my painting of the still lives and he said to me you need, go and have a look at the works of chardin mm. and i thought okay here we go this is another contemporary painter or mm. something that i'm going to get bored or whatever and so on and i thought but i used to follow instructions because i thought you know keep your mind open paul and i went to the library i found a book on chardin and it was a still life painter Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh my gosh, this is what I like. And then I saw him again and he said, Did you? I said, yeah, I found Chardin, thanks for that. And he said to me, you're a descriptive painter. Mm. You know, when you paint, if you want to make glass look like glass, that's what you do. If you want to make rock, um, ceramic look like ceramic, you make it look like ceramic. So look at Chardin, look at people like that. So I was really happy because he knew where I was coming from. Mm. He was a painter, he was a painter's painter. Mm. And then one time we went into the NGV he used to take us in there and there was that wonderful painting that's still there of john constable's um 
um, the guy opening the, um, what they call it, the, where the boats go through, I can't remember, it's got, I'm blank for a second, there's a study of a okay. larger painting. Right. And I was sitting there looking at it for a while. And he came up to me because I was staring at it. And he said, do you like that? And I said, yeah, I really like this painting. And he said, yeah, there are two types of paintings. You know, there's um, hard edge paintings and much more freer paintings. Mm. And in this one here, there's a freer painting. The paint talks to you. Mm. It talks to you. Sure. And he said, um, is this what you like? I said, yeah, I really like this. And he was encouraging in that way. And he said, you know, that's great. and he pointed a few things about it and so on. And that's when he told me it was a study for a major painting. Yeah. And, and I realized then that he, he, he's a painter. He mm. understood that, you know, th that Isla wanted to learn painting. That's great. You know, and of course, the turn of painting was there and he pointed that out. Sure. Then, yeah. Fantastic. He great. was really grateful for that. Yeah. Good, good. Now, who were some of the teachers you had during your time at the Victorian College of the Arts? You've mentioned several already. Yep. yep. Is there any others you you could recall? Um, I'm just remember we had a lot of sessionals that used to come in yeah. and doing that there, and um, yeah, so they, they, they were the main ones there, mm. that, that, that the ones that, that stood out for me sure. and helped me quite a lot. It's so interesting that saying, you, yeah. you had Norbert because when I was there, I actually had Norbert as well, mm. and um, yeah, you got along well with Norbert. Yeah, I did. I, I, I school was a bit nervous, mm. so I got to know him a little bit. But I got to actually know him more after I left art school because I used yeah. to bump into him and we used to talk. And he, um, it turned out he came from the same. I learned while I was in art school, he came from St Albans himself, which I didn't know. You wouldn't think that. No, and we actually <laughs> lived. He lived, he actually lived a few doors, few doors down from us. Yeah, and I mean, we used to have a dog that. A guy with a Volkswagen accidentally hit, and it was was our fault because the dog ran out. Okay. And then I found out it was actually him. I found oh. out later, and my mother went over to his place and told him off, and all that sort of stuff. And then when I went to art school, I saw him. I thought, oh my gosh, this is the guy that <laughs> my mother told me. Of. And um, but he was always supportive, and he always, he always supported my work. And um, the dog didn't die, by the way. It was just oh, you know, okay. um, yeah, good. It, um, was out for letting him running around, but um, he was very supportive, and he and he knew us coming from, mm. and he always encouraged me and encouraged the way I was going, and always saying yep. And he pointed at a few things in my work that I was doing subconsciously, which I didn't know. Mm. There was about the everyday that mm. I didn't see, and he pointed those out, mm -hmm. and he made me realise that. Um, um, what how, what painting and what art re is really all about. Sure. And it's not about trying to make something look real. It's about saying something else, which I knew that because that's what I was trying to do in the work. Yeah. And he actually um, made it much clearer for me. Sure. And by that stage, um, I started to enjoy painting more and doing mm -hmm. a lot more mm -hmm. and getting into it. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's incredible because he's pretty much had contact with every – major Melbourne artist, Norbert. Yes, that's right, he has. Yeah. He has. He's, had, he's been a big influence in the, mm -hmm. in the art world in, Mel in Melbourne and artists in Melbourne. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, he's had a really good influence. In, and he, and yep. his practice is teaching. That's, yeah. He doesn't actually create you know, art himself, no. but his practice, his art practice is actually teaching. Yeah. He could recite art history of a Top of his head, exactly. Yeah, he's incredible, incredible. Yeah, he seems like a sort of person you have to listen to what he has to say because he knows what, he, what he's going to say is quite exactly. important. Yeah. <laughs> but but that's yeah. uh, that's quite yeah. an interesting story, Paul. I, I wasn't aware that uh, Norbert Weifler actually had run over your dog. So yeah, yeah, it was. Uh, yeah, it was. Um, I told him about that once. You remember? And he said, "I do vaguely remember." So yeah, that was my our dog. And <laughs> sorry about my mother came yelling at you. Sure. But um, yeah, it was. Yeah. We, in those days, we still had our animals running around the street, so it wasn't his fault. It was just that the dog jumped in front of sure, his car. But yeah, sure. but he was, um, yeah, it was, um, yeah. And I think that dog lived for many years after that. But oh, that's but cool. yeah, but yeah, he was, um, yeah. It was a shock when I went to art school. And I thought, I think I know this guy. <laughs> <laughs> now, what are the chances? Yeah, what's right? the chances yeah. of that happening? Yeah. yeah. Now I understand the Australian painter Lewis Miller was completing his masters while you were an undergraduate at the Victorian College of the Arts. Mm. Did you have much communication with Lewis? Uh, not really much communication. I knew of him then and I knew they had his works there that we used to see and when they were in exhibition. But how I actually got to know him a bit more is that when I was at the VCA, my mother was in the hospital at the old, I think it was a Prince Henry then, the hospital that was near the VCA. Okay. And um, she, um, she wasn't there. And mum said, oh, there's a lady here that her son's an artist also. 
okay. and everything else. And I said, oh, it's interesting. Found out it was Lewis Miller. I think it was Lewis' mother or someone he knew was there in the same room with my mum. Is that right? They're in the same room with my mum. And I thought, and when she described him and when I, um, and then he, I think he came in or I can't remember what happened then. I thought, oh my gosh, that's Lewis. So, yeah. Oh, so um, you saw him in the hospital? Yeah, I think or? it was, I can't remember if I saw him at the hospital or, or she mentioned his name and it was Lewis. And I thought, okay, it's Lewis Miller. Mm. And then I remember saying something to him afterwards. Oh, my mum's in the hospital too where your mother is. Or whoever. I can't remember who the person was that he was visiting in the hospital. Mm -hmm. It was in the same room. Wow. I thought, oh, my gosh, that's Lewis. Um, sure. Yeah. So I got to know him more then. But we weren't sort of, um, even from that point, we weren't very close friends. We just sort of bumped into each other, had a good chat. Sure. He's a really nice guy. Every time I bump into him, he always says hello and how's your work going and mm. – and I always admired his work because he's a great painter. Sure. And yeah, so that's um, great. Yeah. Nowadays, you do you see Lewis much? Only at the exhibitions if I go. He's yeah. there, and we might like at the Brick and Mortar Portrait Prize. He'd be there, and I have a brief chat with him, or sure. say hello, or something like that. Mm -hmm. I'm just a very private sort of person. I find that I get really nervous talking mm. to people and sure. all that sort of stuff and especially if they're well known you know, yeah. it's like that and so on and yeah so but um yeah but um but we've, we've, yeah, if he always makes an effort if I'm like, uh, he's there and he sees me always he comes oh, hi paul how are you going yeah. everything else and i yeah and yeah he's a real gentleman he is he's one of the real gentlemen and yeah and he's a as I learned, he's a, from art school, he's an honest painter. Yes. And as yeah. John Walker used to say, you know, you can't go wrong if you paint the truth, Paul. Right. Paint the truth. And that's what Lewis does. You know, mm. he paints the truth mm -hmm. and, um, and what's in front of him. And that's, and yeah, and that's what I've learned is, you know, paint the truth. Mm. Paint the he's, truth. He's had um, great exposure recently, Lewis Miller, through uh, Graham Drendel's winning portrait yeah of Doug Moran is uh he actually painted Lewis Miller that, yes. that was the subject of his portrait so uh he's done very well for he's himself done very well yeah Lewis. good on him yeah good on, good on him. him during one particular critique an English artist by the name of John Walker mm. was quite impressed by your still lives and told you to study the work of the 18th century French painter Chardin were you already aware of Chardin's work at this point? Now, you've already touched upon this. Yeah. No, I wasn't. I wasn't aware of his work okay. at all. I wasn't aware of his work at all. He, he made me aware of his work. And, um, yeah, and that's what I like. That's why I started to uh, – I learned in art school that you latch onto the teachers who know where you're coming from. Mm. And, and as that mature age student, um, the two of them that I knew there, they used to say to me, listen to everything – Take in the good stuff and, and just let all the bullshit sh sh shit stuff out, out of your head. John Walker knew where I was coming from. So when he introduced me to Chardin, I continued up my still life. Mm. Because he was giving me, in a sense, the authority to say, if that's what you like, then that's what you should be doing. Right. Don't do what everyone's telling you, oh, because that's what's happening in the art world. Go right. and do, you should be doing this, you should be doing that, because that's what's fashionable. He was sort of saying, if that's what you like, Paul, then that's what you should be that's learning. Great. That's, and, what, that's what you want that to hear. Was, that's what I wanted to hear. Yeah. That's what I wanted to hear. He was, to me, he, he yeah, he was a really good um, mm. um, a, a advisor in that sense. Sure. Sort of saying, you know, paint the truth. Great. And be your, paint the truth about you. Yes. About you. Great. You know, what is it you like? Don't follow fashion. Do mm. what is it that you like? What that's is it that you want to be? Fantastic. Good yeah. advice. Yeah. Now, another painter that you were looking at quite intensively during your time in the Victorian College of the Arts, Paul, was Vermeer. Mm. So what mm. was it about Vermeer's work that really uh, captivated you? A couple of things. First of all, the, um, the everyday. It's the everyday, you know, someone reading a letter, all that sort of stuff, the everyday, things like that. But also the light. Mm. I love the light in his work. Sure. And the light in his work was warm and it was inviting and so on. And, um, and I studied his paintings thoroughly and um, all his paintings. And I remember even when I was studying the painting, The Girl with a Pearl Earring, mm. um, looking at that one. Because that used to hang in our library when I was in high school, that painting. Okay, and a reproduction. A, a reproduction yeah. of it, sorry, not the real thing. <laughs> reproduction. And for many, many years, I studied his work, looked at his work, and, um, and then, and of course, he read stories about how that painting is a portrait of his of a mistress and mm. so on, and I made a movie about that. Sure. And I used to think about, okay. And then when I was much later in my and in the last few years, I did a portrait of my daughter many years ago. When I painted the portrait of my daughter, I thought to myself, 
No, that's his daughter. Mm. I've got a feeling, I could be totally wrong, mm. I don't know, but I have a feeling that that painting was of his daughter. Mm. Do you think it's because of the intensity and sensitivity in which it's painted? I think so, yeah, because I do know that the earring that she's wearing was his wife's earring. Mm. So, if I'm, I've got my history right. So when I actually was painting my daughter's, it just clicked. I was just painting my daughter's portrait and, and I thought, oh, my God, I'm sure that is his daughter. Mm. She was coming of age. There was a painting sure. of saying, you're coming of age, I'm going to paint you because mm -hmm. you're coming of age. Right. But I could be wrong, but that's how I feel when I sure. look at that portrait. And I always felt that. I never felt when the people who say that he it was, I said, because most of his paintings were from a voyeur, yes, voyeuristic right. point of view. That's right. And I thought, no, to me, um, this one, there's something about this. There's something about this. And, um, yeah, so... It, yeah, it's only recent, more recent in the last few years, probably when I did my daughter's portrait was 2015, whatever it was. From that point, I thought, I think that's his daughter. Mm -hmm. But I loved his light. Yes. And I loved um, the composition, how he, he plays with the natural and geometric form was within the one thing mm -hmm. and how he, he worked with that. That's what I liked about him. Great, mm -hmm. great. Yeah. I understand Peter Booth, who was one of the lecturers at the Victorian College of the Arts, would sometimes take his students in his car out landscape painting. Yeah. Um, I can't remember if he actually used to drive a car or not, but I know he used to take us out. So we all had, some students had cars, and he would say, we're not going to be drawing and painting in here today. He goes, we're going to Dalesford. Okay. So <laughs> we'll, we'll all meet there, and he'll go buy a big, a big thing full of sausages. Okay. And we'll have a barbecue. Sure. And he used to take us out and draw. That's interesting. And paint in the landscape, and he will draw and paint himself. Okay. Which was fantastic to watch him do things and he and he, he was such so down to earth and um and and he made it enjoyable he didn't make it like a class where it's sort of mm, you know, like you know these are the rules class. and this is what's yeah. going on and this is what you yeah. have to be doing he would just go, go there and have fun mm. you know he would say then he'll come back with a drawing and he'd see insects and he turns into this wonderful drawing oh wow and people would say jokingly would say to him what the hell are you on peter to draw that yeah you know, that's how he was, and mm. I used to love that. I said, gosh, you know, he's turned that something that was out there into something so beautiful. Mm. And I thought that was inspiring. That's great. Yeah, it was really inspiring, and yeah. So I did occasional trips, not a whole lot, but we did occasional trips. Mm -hmm. that, so you would just yeah. uh, get into a friend's car and you would all go down Yeah, to like a, mature age students had cars, we'll get into their car and yeah. go out. That's fantastic. And, and do that, yeah. Great. It's great. Whilst completing your studies at the <laughs> Victorian College of the Arts, I understand you supported yourself by working in a moccasins factory. Did you find that having this job distracted you from painting or was it a refreshing release from being in the studio? Yeah, no, actually, I actually started, in, as I mentioned before, I actually started working in the moccasins factory when I was 13, yep. so quite young. And um, But I used to work during my after school and I used to work during school holidays so I never had school holidays because I always used to work because you know we didn't have any money mm. so and I want money to survive and to do things so I in a sense I did find it as if I was stressed out at uni I'm going to go at work and I just focus on that and not worry about anything else and do that so in a sense I found it as, as a release mm. from my stresses from being at uni and lots of stuff but um, but at the same time, it gave me money mm. to actually buy materials because right. you know, it's not as if I was going to go, go to my parents and say, look, can I have $100 to buy four tubes of paint? Mm. You know, they hardly had money themselves right. with, with all those kids. So it so I had to earn a living mm -hmm. and um, and that at least gave me money to go buy materials. Sure. So yeah. right through yeah. your time at VCA, you were working in the, the Moccasins factory? To yeah, most yourself? of the time. Um, towards the halfway through second year, I was able then to apply for TEAS, okay. which in those days was called TEAS. It's very much like our study today. Oh. But it wasn't something you had to pay back. It was something that you applied for and if you qualified, you were given some money per week. Okay. to continue on with your studies. Mm -hmm. And because I had worked for so many years mm. and I proved that I worked for so many years, then I was able to qualify because my parents' income wasn't enough for me to survive, um, to say, oh, look, your parents earn too much so you can't get it. Sure. They didn't. Mm -hmm. So the, the TEAS program, or the TEAS was actually allowing me to get some money for fortnight, I think it was, oh, so great. I could have some money. Mm. That way I didn't have to work at that factory 
Sure. And then I can focus on the studies more and that's lots great. of stuff, yeah, which it is really good. It can cool. be very expensive being an art student. Well, yeah, you know, the paints were expensive and, you know, I couldn't afford, I used to paint on, um, I remember in art school, um, a few of us, um, like I mentioned before, Louise Human um, painted on masonite boards. We all did. I painted on masonite yeah. boards because I couldn't afford canvas. I couldn't go and say, oh, I'm going to go buy some linen today. There's no way. <laughs> so I used to paint on anything and anything. That's right. And if someone was throwing out a piece of wood, I'd take and take paint it, it. Work on paint it. Paint on it because I couldn't afford it. That's right. I couldn't afford it. Mm-hmm. So masonite, I painted a lot of masonite in art school mm-hmm. because it was, and the good thing is, um, because because I was painting very tight paintings. Sure. And they're too tight and too anal in the sense of very tight. Um, one of the teachers suggested cut out cut some boards, which I did with Masonite, and do quick studies. Right. So I used boards, cardboard, anything, mm. and do quick studies. Spend 10, five, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, and no more. Sure. And doing real quick. And I did that, and that taught me a lot about painting. It's it's actually, actually, I think it was John Walker who taught me that, and even Philip Hunter. To t- both encouraged me to do that. And it taught me a lot about putting things down quickly in mark sure. and don't overwork it. No, don't overwork it. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. It's interesting. Um, I, that was very much my experience as well. As well, when I was in the VCA, a lot of students were working on um, masonite was very popular and also marine ply because it was yeah. cheap and you could get big sheets of it, cut it off. Wasn't as expensive as as canvas. Yeah. Uh, another one was finding things on the street, just in hard rubbish. Yeah. You know, doors and all types <laughs> of things. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Sure, sure thing. Yeah. Now, in your last years at the Victorian College of the Arts, you received the Folio Award from the Trustees of the National Gallery of Victoria. Mm. How did this come to be? Uh, what they did is, at the end of the year, they had all these awards to give to students, and you had to submit. You had to put your artwork for submission for assessment mm. and you had your studio space so you put all your work up and then these committees will go through and look at the okay. artworks and they decide who give the awards to mm. so i won that for drawing great. which was great so that was very supportive mm-hmm. and um yeah i was actually chuffed because i thought oh okay so i won an award for that which was really good so yeah were yeah. your parents proud um, again, it's like, oh, mum, I won an award and a thing for drawing. Oh, that's nice. You know, it's like they don't understand. They understand. They understand. I'm sure they probably were, but they just really understand it. Sure. So, yeah. Great. Yeah. yeah. And, um, yeah. So Great. That was that one there. So that was, um, yeah, there's quite a few different awards, but, yeah. That was one of the main ones you won in art school. Yeah, that was the main one. Yeah. Yeah, I think it was a couple, but I remember that one for sure. Yeah. Well, you, you won one particular award, which, which you received a French box easel. Oh, uh, no, what actually happened with that one is that they showed us before the school holidays, we had five weeks off, and they had these two box easels. Yes. And they said, um, we're going to give these away to students who do the most work over the holidays. Oh, okay. And I used to work a lot anyway. And I said, well, I can't afford that. There's no way I can afford that. And I knew the other, other kids, they can. And there's no way. And I said, I'm going to work my, I'm going to paint a lot because I want one of them. Sure. <laughs> I still have it. And, <laughs> um, and it was myself and Lynn Boyd was the other one okay. that won the other one. So and I was shocked because they said, oh, the, the, the two boxes go to Lynn Boyd and Paul Borg. And I thought, oh, my God, you know, because there's no way I can afford. Yeah. They're, they're right. expensive. At that time. At that time, yeah. yeah. And I still have it. I still take it out with me when I go out into a landscape. That's fantastic. Yes, yeah, so I've had it for over 30-something years. But wow. Wow. <laughs> so you mentioned Lynn Boyd. She wouldn't happen to be related to Arthur Boyd, right? No, I don't, I'm, I'm not too sure. I don't, no, I don't think she was related to the Boyd family. Yeah. I don't know. I, I never asked about that, but I don't think she was. Sure. She was a very quiet painter very beautiful painter mm. and um yeah yeah mm. she was um she was she was in i can't remember if she was third year then or in post grad then i can't remember she was but she was at the vca at the same time sure, sure. Was there, yeah. you graduated from the victorian college of the arts in 1984 leaving art school can be a daunting time mm. for some art students oh, yeah. what was your experience like once you were out of art school yeah, it was daunting for me because then I thought, okay, what do I do now? What mm. do I do for a living? I have to look for work. How do I survive? I don't want to give up painting. So I have to be careful about if I get a full-time job, am I going to lose painting? Yes. And so I tried to balance it. But I still had, so I looked around for all sorts of work. And um, 
um, I went to um, shops and I went to receptions, places to see if they wanted someone to work as a bar person or something like that. All those, and I went to, and the Moccasin Frank Track I was working at, they weren't um, running anymore anyway by that stage. Oh, okay. And, um, um, and I wouldn't, wouldn't want, wanted to go back to that anyway. But, um, and then I thought to myself, okay, so what am I going to do? And then, um, then I decided to, um, I went to the court, to the, um, the age. Okay. And I went there and I said, look, I can draw really fast. Did they want a court <laughs> artist or something? Sure, and I sure. spoke to someone there who liked my work. He goes, unfortunately, we've got one, but um, I will let you know. And I also went to publishing houses mm. and I showed them what I did. That I can draw. And I said, do you have anyone, um, they want me to draw, illustrate books and so on. And they said, I will get back to you. And yes, down the track, one publisher company, uh, contacted me and said they've got a book to illustrate. Mm. And that was good. But by that, by that stage, I worked at a clerical job. Okay. And I, I lasted a week. Right. I yes. think a week or two weeks. I think it was two weeks it was. Mm. And all you have to do is sit there and mark these, go through these data sheets mm. and make sure the data was right. Mm -hmm. That's all. So it was pretty boring. Mm -hmm. And I thought to myself, I'm not going to be doing this. And everyone worked so they can get a roster day off eventually. And I thought, I'm not going to be doing this mm -hmm. after what I've been through and learning. And then one day I just went in there and I went to the supervisor there and I said to him, look, um, I can't do this. Mm. I can't do this. I'm, I've been trained in the arts and I feel like I'm, I'm wasting my life. I'm wasting my time. And he goes, what do you mean you're an artist? And I said, I studied here and there. And he said, what the hell are you doing here? I said, well, I needed a job, yeah. but I can't do this. First of all, it's, it's not me mm. and I can't do this. And I left, I went. And then I looked, um, tried to look for other work and I had part-time jobs here and there. And then the TAFE who I taught, the head of the department there rang me and he said, um, are you interested in coming and helping out my class? Because he was getting busy with a lot of paperwork. Okay. And he said, you just come in and I'll do the introduction. He, he does the introduction to the class and then you just help the students. Sure. So I was doing that. And for the first few weeks, I was just doing it more voluntary. Mm. And eventually, he, I was being tested basically to see if I could teach. Sure. And then eventually it, it went on and it went on and I was given the keys to the staff room and everything else. And at the end of the year, I was starting to get, by that stage, I was starting to get paid. Mm. So I wasn't free for nothing for the long, I was, I was getting paid. And then I went to give him the keys back and he said, keep those keys. And then he called me back and the next year to come and teach again, but actually run my own classes. And eventually I ended up staying there for 30 years. I wow. was teaching for 30 years. That's incredible. <laughs> yeah. That's incredible. So Paul, you were 22 when you went to Malta. Yeah. Was that after the VCA? Yes. Yeah, that was after the VCA. Okay. So I graduated. Yes, yeah, I would have been about 22. I'm trying to remember the age now. But anyway, it was after, after the VCA, I decided to that I needed to go and see things. And, and it was sort of students, a lot of students were going overseas and seeing stuff anyway. Mm. And I thought maybe I should do the same. So, yeah, it was very much um, maybe a year or two after the VCA. It could have been a year after the VCA. I decided to just go, mm -hmm. go overseas. Good time and, to and, travel after yeah. you just finished your studies. That's right, yeah. yeah. It was a good time. And I thought, yeah, I'm going to go and see. Sure. And see what I wanted to see some art. Right. Yeah. Do a grand tour. Yeah. 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 Mm. In 1985, the year after graduating from the Victorian College of the Arts, you were offered a teaching position at Victoria University. Mm -hmm. At this point, Western Melbourne Institute of TAFE became Victoria University. That's right. Yep. Yeah. Yep. How did you come to receive this teaching position? Now, you've you've answered that. You've elaborated on that. Yeah. So, um, is there anything else you wanted to, to add to that at all? No. I th all I would say is that um, the, the, the guy who ran the department, John Barmby, he wanted people to teach who were actually practitioners. Okay. Who weren't people with PhDs, masters, or anything like that, because it was a TAFE course for one. Yep. And he wanted people to learn skills. Mm. And um, and I remember that he told me clearly that you know I want people who who know their skills, and that's what I want. Sure. So that's how I got that. And I was I was sessional for about eight nine years, and eventually I was given permanent contract. Okay, great. And I know when I applied. For for the permanent contract, there were outsiders that applied, right? And they all had their PhDs and masters, and um, and I was told by another teacher that 
they felt that they should have got the job, they should get the job because they had their PhDs or whatever. Yeah. But the head of the department made it very clear to the others who were doing the interviews and said, I want um, a practitioner. And yes. Paul's a practitioner, good, so good. I want him back to do fantastic to be a practitioner here. So yeah, so and that's why I end up that's staying great. there. And, that's great. Yeah. When you started teaching at Victoria University, did you have to develop your own curriculum from scratch? No, uh, there was a curriculum set. Okay. For a while, for a little while, that there was things that you had we had to go by, but then eventually, as the years went on, then I started to cha- um, change the curriculum a little bit. Okay. And um, and they were given uh, um, freedom to do a few things as long as we, had, we stuck to some things that the TAFE board wanted us to do. Sure. And and we did that. But for say for example, because I taught painting, there were two painting classes. One where I taught painting from life, and the other class was um, a, a painting experimental painting, like doing color scales, all that sort of stuff. Mm. So in my class, um, coming back from overseas made me see things differently mm. because I had an uncle there who was an engineer and he showed me an exam paper mm. and he said, me, have a read of this exam paper and tell me what it's for. And it was asking questions about art. Mm. And I thought, it's for an art school. He goes, no, try again. And I said, well, okay. One asked about architecture, this and, and building this. Oh, sorry, it's for architectural school. He goes, no, try again. Mm. And I said, what that? He goes, this is for engineering. Yeah. And I said, what do you mean? He goes, this is part of the engineering exam. Mm. They ask art questions. I know you're from Australia, and if you study art, you do art. If you study architecture, it's just architecture. If you do engineering, it's just engineering. Mm. Whereas here in Europe, you learn everything. That's right. Everything. Yeah. The aesthetics of the beauty when you're going to do architecture of the building. Mm. And engineering, the art side of it, all that stuff. If you're learning a doctor, you're learning about people and patients. You look at portraits Mm -hmm. and so on. So anyway, so when I came back to Australia, I was still painting, teaching from life, but I used to experiment with the students and say, okay, today, this week we're doing a still life painting in black and white for the next two weeks. But in your own time, which was separate from the curriculum, I used to say to them, I want you to work on a project to do it black and white, but not a painting. Anything else. Mm. You can do a short film. You can do a performance. You can write a song. Yeah. You can do whatever you like. Yeah. And then I'll give them that time and then they all have to present it in class and do something that was totally different but related okay. to the issue of black and white. I see. And they would do that. And I also used to, because my other passion is music and because I sing and play the guitar, I used to sort of, we used to have a, um, a whole IT system set up in the mm. room with the, um, screen everything else i used to play music that's related to what we're doing on the day okay and, and say okay today we're doing black and white so it's, i play songs about black and white or mm. show a short sh- clip of something in black and white mm. and if they um so i would do that and then talk about the history of music mm. so because i knew that a lot of my students weren't going to become painters right i knew yeah. that some will, will go off and become something else mm-hmm. so I, I expose them to as many different things as i can that's great and I, I do it here. I do the same thing here mm. at this school. Mm. And yeah, some um, some of my students have gone in different fields. The head of the conservatory at the National Gallery, Michael Vaku Cox, was one of my students. Okay. I taught him. Wow. I taught him, and um, and um, and some have gone to music. Some have gone to theatre, right. and all sorts of things. Mm-hmm. And um, but I learned. I, I learned. I changed the curriculum to a point. Mm. And um, still keeping it within their foundation of what we, that was expected. Sure. But I allow these other things there. That's Because I knew realistically that, you know, yeah. Like one student I bumped into not long ago, um, um, he thanked me because he was a bit of a hard basket because he came in late. Mm. He, he was lazy, all that sort of stuff. And I took him aside one time and I said to him, you know, you've got, you've got skills that people die for. He goes, oh, here we go. You're going to lecture like mum and dad and my high school teachers. I'm not. I'm not going to lecture you. I'm just telling you, you've got really good skills. But if you want to waste them, that's your problem. Yeah. But just don't come in late and disrupt everybody else, mm. you know. But you've got skills. Mm. Except the fact that you've been given skills. Mm. And think about it. Anyway, and I saw him not long ago, uh, a couple of years ago, and he decided that he continued on to go and do art, but then he went to um, study um, 
what's it called, to do with biology and all that sort of stuff. Okay. And he works in the field oh, wow. with scientists and everything else. He got his master's in that. Mm -hmm. And he said, and he told me, he said, you know, you, you, I gave you a hard time, Paul, but you gave me a kick up the butt that I needed. <laughs> 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 and, and, I, and I pursued and I did something with my son. I said, you sure did. Good so idea. it was good to hear that because I thought, well, I've done something right. Sure. But yeah. So It's good yeah. that you were able to change the curriculum up a little bit and put your own, your own yeah. fingerprint on it, yeah. essentially. And the head department sort of allowed us to mm -hmm. because he he would say that. You know, he would say, look, if, you wanna, if you're doing figure painting with a student one day and you want to set up and paint yourself, do it. Mm -hmm. Sure. And I did. Great. So, so he gave us that freedom. That's fantastic. That freedom to do things, yeah. Good. Some of your colleagues while teaching at Victoria University were Anthony Riccardi, Jonathan Walker, Peter Burke, Julie Patty, Patty, yep, Patty, mm. Shannon Smiley, and Gina Calabashis. Calabashis, yep, yep. Mm. I understand Shannon and Gina were your former students. Yes. Were Anthony, Jonathan, Peter, and Julie already there? When you arrived, or did they come later? No, Julie Patey was there when I arrived. Mm -hmm. um, she was there. Um, Anthony Riccardi came later. Peter Burke came about two years or three years after I was there. Mm. I, I actually really knew him because he was a friend of a friend, and we were at TAFE the same year, though, Peter and I, but oh, okay. we weren't in the same group, so I didn't know him then, mm. but I knew his friend. So I got to know Peter, but he, um, he was teaching about yeah, two or three years after I was there. And um, and there was a few others, and then, and then Shannon, I taught him, mm -hmm. and I taught Gina, and then later on we brought them on to actually work with us That's as great. teachers. And there's all, there was also another one, Carolyn Cardinet, who was a student, okay. and also taught there with us for a while too. Okay. And I had a few, there's Carolyn, uh, her teachers at the VCA, Lisa Radford, who was students yeah. of mine. She, yep. um, she, she's head of painting, I think, at the VCA, VCA now. now yeah. yeah, so I taught most of those. And mm -hmm. yeah, That's great. It was great. So, and um, because the TAFE years that we had, it was like a great family community, mm. you know, we all helped each other. And the great thing to know today is that most of those years, those groups, they all stick together as friends. That's still. right. They're still good friends with each other. Mm. And I've got to teach some of them and their kids now. Some of them yeah. actually taught their kids. <laughs> you know, they, so it was, I was very lucky in that sense mm. that, um, yeah, and having these two, um, Gina and Shannon working with me was great and sure. we're still in contact with each other. We go out painting when COVID stopped that for a while, yeah. but we, we used to go out and paint together sure. and do all that. So, mm. Yeah, yeah and, and you do begin to realise uh, as well how small the kind of Melbourne, the Melbourne art world is Yes, when, yeah. you've, when you've started, in, you know, been to an art school and you've gone through the years with the, that same group of people. Um, later on, you start to you know you start to see them and these art prizes popping up and you're like oh you know I went to art school with with him or with her mm -hmm. and so on. When when Shannon and Gina were your students, were they standouts? Did you could you see potential in them? Yes, being yes. Um, Sh Sh Shannon and Gina, Shannon especially because he was a part time student. Mm. He used to come at night classes, and I knew he could draw well and so on. And then I encouraged him to go full time, mm. and then he wasn't sure but then he decided to go full-time mm. and um and and Gina was um very talented and very sort of hands-on and so on and um she was um and because we used to go on excursions for a week mm. painting and drawing out in the landscape that's great in Dalesford in those days all that sort of stuff and and I got to get, get to know them more got to see what they do more mm. and so on so yeah so it was that it was um there was standouts. People could stand out really well. Sure. And so on. And, look, and there was even students who had no skills when they started, mm. but I knew they had the discipline. Right. And as I, as I say to them every year when I used to start, that being an artist is 20% skill and 80% discipline. Right. And I had, I, I had students who struggle. Yeah. And I used to say, you have to work harder. Mm. You have to work harder. You know, you don't have their skills, work harder. And eventually they end up, going on and some of them are actually practicing and they're doing quite well okay. because they realize they had to work harder sure so and then i've had students who can paint and draw really well mm. but they their heart wasn't in it 
Right. Yeah. So they had the skills, but they never continued it because their heart wasn't really That's into right. it. Yeah. yeah. Well, their heart wasn't into mm-hmm. it. Yeah. It's interesting. One of your colleagues at uh, Victoria University, Anthony Riccardi, was actually uh, my art history lecturer when mm-hmm. I was in RMIT TAFE. So he was actually working in both um, campuses at the time. He was doing part time, I think, at Victoria University. That's right. Yes. And then part time at uh, RMIT. Um, uh, as well, RMIT mm. TAFE, which is which is uh, really interesting. Mm. Now, you mentioned that you do still keep in contact with uh, some of your your colleagues mm. over the years. Um, do you find that having that um, collegial group around you uh, as an artist is something that uh, is beneficial? Yes, it is. Yeah, I I find it um, that to me it's that I still need, to, even though I learn how to paint and I can paint all that stuff, I still need that critical sort of um, uh, views from from colleagues of, sure. of things I'm working on mm. and so on. Um, the guy I mentioned before, Peter Burke, he has been a good friend of mine for years. So if I'm working on something and I'm not too sure, I know that students and friends will say, oh, that looks good. Yes. I want someone critical. So yeah. I'll, I'll ring him up and say, look, I'm working on something. And I want you to come and have a look at it. And he'll tell me. He'll go right through and say, well, that doesn't work. That doesn't work. Get rid of yeah. that. And and he's very good at that. Mm. And and that's what we all used to do. Even Gina, Gina always rings me up and she says things like, oh, Paul, I'm doing this and I'm doing that. How do I, what colour should I use for this and what should I do this? And so I'll give her some critique. Sure. And she sometimes gives me critique. I that's might send great. her an image and say, what do you think? And mm. Shannon is the same. Mm. You know, Shannon would ask for advice on certain things and sometimes I might ask Ask him for an opinion, sure, and um, and doing that there. He's got a painting that's actually hanging at Ballarat mm. of a landscape with a, 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 a brick building and a fence, mm. and he actually based it on one of my paintings. Oh, did he? And okay. I didn't mind it because he, he, the painting I did of my backyard with a fence and the building, he said I really love that painting. He had it on his phone. That's how much he liked mm. my painting. He said, "Do you mind if I did a painting that was in the same?" Way? I said, "Yeah, fine. Yeah, yeah it's fine. You know, it's what artists had done in history. They interpret each that's other's right. things and so yeah. on." And yeah, so, and that's how we work. I like that because it's sort of, it keeps you going. It keeps Absolutely. you fired up. It keeps you fired up. And, Absolutely. And it, it's not, it's not competing. It, it's, it's sort of like, you've encouraged me to do this and it keeps me focused. So, and vice versa. It's really something yeah. you miss when you leave art school because you're in this environment where you can bounce ideas off one, one another and, and, um, you know, get feedback on your work. And then yeah. all of a sudden you, you leave and then you're in your studio. And you're on your own. You're isolated. It's very isolated. Especially in the Western suburbs. I, I decided not to go into communal studio and not to leave, move this part of town. Sure. And that's why, as you mentioned before, being part of the Hunt Club, that was an art group there that we used to hang around and then we, then we set it up and start teaching there. Mm. I got involved with that so I can keep in touch with the art community. Sure. And I was involved with West Space mm. um, Gallery, mm. the artist-run space. Uh, I was re- one of the original uh, members there because that kept me in touch with artists and so on, yeah. so, and it keeps me going. Because otherwise, I'd know if I, I'll just lose it. I'll, 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 I'll be disheartened, and mm. no one's interested in art. No one cares about this, and no one cares about that. Yeah, what you do, so then I'll just sort of lose the plot. That sense of yeah. community is, is very. It's, it's important. It's very important. It's, it's the idea when the 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 guys used to hang around at the salon in France. That yeah. was that's why. That's why they used to go there and have a drink and talk about each other's work and argue about each other's work. That's right. That was a form of mm-hmm. encouraging each other. Even if they hated each other, it mm. doesn't matter. That was a way of I'm gonna do a better painting than that. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Healthy healthy competition. Healthy competition. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well uh, I do remember vividly I must have been uh, 21 years old at the time, walking into Victoria University on their uh, open day. I was still deciding which TAFE I wanted to actually apply to. And uh, you were there on the day mm-hmm. and uh, Shannon Smiley was there. And um, yeah, it's quite an, it was quite an impressive um, studio you had. And, and mm-hmm. the student studios, you had that magnificent view of uh, Flinders Street Station. Yeah. It's, it's a shame that, that all that is um, now gone. It's all gone. Yeah, yeah, it's all gone. It's pretty sad. Yeah. Now, as you've mentioned, you developed good relationships with Shannon and Gina in particular. I understand you had an exhibition together in 2012 titled We Are Here in the Chapman and Bailey Gallery in Abbotsford. Mm-hmm. The exhibition focused on depictions of Australian lifestyle. How did this exhibition come to be? Well, that came about is that Gina actually um, um, planted the seed. She said that we should have an exhibition together because we're sort of interested in the similar sort of things in the vein 
of uh, our, our surroundings and so on. And then we looked at galleries and so on, and then we came across that gallery that we decided to apply for. And then when we started to put that together, I we had to come up with a title. Mm. And um, and then I said, and then I went back to uni the next day, and I said to Gina and Shannon, I said, don't know, but I had a dream last night that we had we called it we are here okay so what about that mm -hmm. and they looked at each other and thought that sounds good mm -hmm. i think it's there and then i didn't realize the we didn't realize the magnitude of it because it was saying that we are here and that, you know that the, in terms of the us where we are in suburbia who we are and everything else we are here, are here. and yeah. The, yeah. yeah so um yeah so we decided to stick to that title Fantastic. And, and have that so yeah yeah I, yeah I recall seeing some photos of that show and you had a lot of uh, more studies that you exhibited in that particular show. Yes. Small panels, paintings of your backyard. That's so right. On yeah. And so forth. Yeah. So the, um, because I was still working on that series. Mm. So I only showed, I think, one large painting in that one, but the other ones were all small studies. And sure. that was only the beginning of the study because I ended up doing more after that. And then later on, I showed them later on mm -hmm. um, in, the, in the house. But, um, but yeah, so that was um, just the beginning. That was the beginning of that series. Right. And the backyard was the focus for then mm -hmm. yeah they're a great series of paintings i really uh really like those thanks those paintings done in a different times of, of day different lighting as well yeah like to see. And, and it's also different moods and that's why the whole sh um, when i end up having the show here in the house i cleared my lounge and the kitchen everything else and i had the large paintings and all the small ones right. all together in the house because the view of the backyard mm -hmm. i was actually driving somewhere because i was trying to find what gallery should i show this should i approach a gallery should i not and then I was taking my daughter to her scout group and on the way there, a song came on, which was, um, what's his name? The song was um, Come See the Real Thing, Come oh, See yeah, the Real Thing. Yeah. And I thought, oh, hang on. So I <laughs> thought, hang on, I'm going to show the, the whole show <laughs> at the house because yeah. they can come and see the paintings, but they can see the backyard. So they can see the real thing. They can <laughs> see the real thing. Exactly. So I did that and, um, and the friends of mine helped me set the show up and um, we did all that there and it was interesting because um, I ended up calling it Swing High and Swing, swing Low, low yeah. because it's different paints, different grounds. Some are mm. painted on board, some are painted on canvas, some are painted on tea towel mm. material, some are painted on whatever. But it was about more to do with mood swings mm. because I suffer from anxiety a lot and mm. all that sort of stuff and the back it's my backyard. My backyard is that sort of the issues that I have to deal with, mm, all that sure. sort of stuff. So I decided that um, call it um, swing high, swing low, and and also because there's, there's a main children's swing in that in, yeah. that, in that in all those paintings, yeah. and um, and that's why I did that. And it was interesting because people interpret it very differently. Mm. And um, I remember Anthony Riccardi saw that, and he said to me, it reminded him him of Cezanne's. Mm. Mountain, um, Mount Saint Vitoire, Vitoire yeah. of those mountains, and yeah. I thought, oh, yeah, that's true. That's interesting. It's like a series of those, but um, but to me, it was a way of expressing myself. Um, I wasn't trying to do replicas of the backyard. I was trying to, you know, if I might do a painting and leave it there for a few days, and then put turps on it and scrape it back, right, and then see what that's left, and that'll be a painting, sure, and see what happens to mm -hmm. it, and then. Um, the one with the tea towel, I had a tea towel and I painted on it. I used actual line patterns on the tea right. towel as the fence line yes. and did yeah. that. But I have in there, there is, um, there's a, a windmill that you got from Copper Art that everyone used to have in their mm. backyard mm. and which is very symbolic of colonialism. Yes. And then you had the fence. Mm -hmm. um, which is, of course, a boundary, mm -hmm. and the swing, which you do with childhood, everything else. A lot of people didn't get it. They didn't understand what it was about, but sure. it doesn't matter. Yeah. If they just saw it as a backyard, that's fine. But mm -hmm. to me, there's a lot more in it. Right. It's about that um, where, we're, where we're at, mm -hmm. and to me, it's about, you know, trying to depict my life. Mm -hmm. you know, this is where I'm spending all my time. Sure. And, yeah, yeah. Sure, and it's interesting because as you do study the the series of paintings that you created eventually you see the fence falls over uh, at one point uh and then uh i think you've got to back up and you created more paintings around it yeah that's right yeah when, when the f fence was blown down i actually did a separate painting many years later sure and it was that was actually fallen over and i can't remember i think i think i think it was called um um a, a building a boundary or something like coming uh, um, breaking down the fence or something mm -hmm. or something like that something to do with a change sure using the fence as a symbolic thing right all that sort of stuff interesting so, yeah. 
Great. Yeah. Mm. I understand one of the paintings you had in this exhibition, which is the We Are Here exhibition, uh, was inspired by Max Meldrum's infamous painting, Petrit's Farm. Would you say that Meldrum is a major source of inspiration for you? Um, not in all his work, only in that painting, because that, that painting was actually hanging at the NGV when I was a student. Okay. And every time, in those days, you had to walk through, through the NGV to go into the art school, which used to, used to be at the back. Yes. And I used to stop there and look at that painting for a while because I loved it. It's one of my favourite paintings, Picrette's Farm, Picrette's Farm. And, um, and then one time um, when I came out of my back door, mm. when I looked at that view of the light, everything else on the house behind me in the fence, sure. it reminded me of that painting. Yes. And that's what got me inspired to do that series at the backyard because of that painting. Because mm -hmm. it was my favourite painting. Com compositionally, they're very, very similar. Yes, exactly. Yeah. yeah, I deliberately did that, and then there's that painting by um, Wright with the um, the moon. Yes, Joseph and, Wright. Uh, Joseph Wright Joseph with the moon, Wright. everything yeah. else, the moon and everything else, because the night paintings I did. Sure. And so on. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. During your years teaching at Victoria University, you used to catch the train from St Albans Station to Flinders Street. You created an interesting series of pastel portraits over these years, whereby you executed quick sketches of fellow passengers. Can you explain more about this series of portraits and how they came about? Okay. Yeah, it's interesting because there's actually two sets. There's um, pastel, which is oil pastel, not mm -hmm. dry pastel, because I was smudged. Right. And I did the first series I did were actually colour pencil. Oh, uh, okay. and, and what I actually did is I used to get a, the A5 size books mm -hmm. and I used to colour the paper with grass right. and then dry them the night before and then I just draw people on the train with the colour pencils okay. and them very quickly. So I used to do three drawings on the way up and maybe three drawings on the way down. Wow, so you'll and, be at six in one day. Yeah, sometimes <laughs> I might do less. It depends how long I'll spend on the drawing. Sure. And sometimes there's something I'm really focusing on. I might do that one drawing the whole trip okay. and so on. Right. But I try to disguise myself so that people don't watch see that I was drawing. Otherwise, other things will happen. But I did that and then I started to use oil pastel right. and I used to use one of those brushes that has that you put water in basically water put, brush but yeah. I used to actually put solvent in it and I used to oh, smudge you? with okay. to do that to smudge with it and the oil pastel was much freer mm. and I did those and that, that came about the actual there because I used to get stressful going to work but at that stage I was sort of um I hate because I hate, the city I'm not a city person no yeah and every time I go into the city I used to get a headache I always do and if I read I get a headache. Even oh. with glasses, I get a headache. But if I draw, I don't. Oh, that's and, interesting. And at yeah. the same time, I wasn't doing much painting because I was busy teaching all the time. Right. So I thought, well, at least this allows me to do some art and do some drawing, yeah. just practicing. And then my friends saw them and they said, Paul, you should be showing these. I thought, they're just drawings. Mm. No, you should be showing these. You should be doing something with these. Right. So I decided then to actually put a show together right and that was at the university i thought we had this foyer with these wonderful long cabinets with glass sure. so no one can access them right and i decided to put a show and the show was called on the line right meaning on the train line yeah at the same time also online as you can see that you can view the show online, online on the internet yeah. and i think i was probably the first person in melbourne to have an exhibition online because wow. that was way back in 2009 okay so oh, i had an exhibition online and yeah so i um did that and because there's, there's, there's over a thousand drawings i think altogether. there's wow. quite a lot because that was about four or five years of drawings that's that incredible I did. So it's quite a lot and so that was pretty much every day you were on the train mm. you, would, you would you would draw yeah on I your way draw. to work yeah, yeah. And people got used to me people who recognize me say oh, hi again you're drawing again and i remember one time i stopped drawing for a particular reason and someone who didn't like me drawing but then one person said to me you're not going to work today and i said yeah you're not working today i said yeah i'm on my way there you're not working today and i said yeah and they said and I go, oh, you mean I'm not drawing? I'm not drawing so, yeah. And they said, no, I'm not. And I told them what ha happened, an incident I had. And they said, they loved it. They said, we loved it when you used to draw. So just keep drawing. Keep drawing. Yeah, and people used to have conversations with me if I was drawing. I never used to give them away to so keep them. Mm. And, um, and one person one time um, what, saw me draw her. Mm. And um, there's a couple of incidents, but this one was an interesting one because she actually came over to me and she said to me, did you just draw me? And I said, yes. She said, oh, thank you, and walked off. Oh, lovely. So she felt like, oh, gosh, if I, someone saw me important enough to draw, then I must 
you yeah. may notice. Yeah, I was noticed, and yeah. that was wonderful. Then I had an incident where um, I was drawing. I was wearing red, which I'd never do, and I thought whoever sits on the train first with red, I'll draw them. Okay. And this woman was in red, and it was a fair distance away. So I was drawing a thing, and another person next to her started yelling at someone on the phone and being aggressive and saying, it's so wrong and they shouldn't be allowed and it's a thing. And so I, was like, I thought, oh, gosh, she's having a bad time with someone. And then she said, it's a, it's a pervert. He shouldn't be allowed to be doing this. And I thought, oh, geez, that per person's bad. And then she yelled out at me. She said, you shouldn't be doing this, drawing people on, on the train. It's rude. Oh. You're a pervert. And I thought, sorry, I've actually got permission from the railways to do this because I wrote to them. Yeah. And I said, it's only interpretation anyway. Yeah. And I can do this. There's nothing against it. And you shouldn't be doing this. And then it, people on the train start to get onto her side and saying, yeah, it's not right. It's, not, it's wrong. And I thought, sorry, I'm only drawing. This is my job. This is what I do. Wow. This is my. This is what I do. And so on. And then I said, but if you're not happy with that, and I gave the drawing, but actually folded it in a few to damage it. Okay. And David said, you can throw in the bin if you want to. Yeah. And that's fine. And so on. So hopefully it's not in their hands still. I've written up my journal. So if it ever turns up, they don't own it because it was meant to be disposed of. Sure. And, um, yeah, so it's interesting because that really threw me. Yeah. Because I didn't draw for about two, three weeks after that. Mm, that's and then my Yeah, and then my friends got me back into it. And they said, Paul, just one, one bad egg. Yeah. You drew so many people, no one really complained, mm. and um, and you're documenting history right. and so on. And um, the, I think the person who, who actually was complaining, you can tell by her language, she was a, a law student. So I think this was sort of an opportunity or something. She was a bit of an opportunist, I think. Okay. But I thought, yeah, I thought, no, look, you know, yeah, so, um, but majority of comments I got were great. There were mm. people who were, and I remember one time I was drawing this woman's hands. Mm. And they look like Rubens paintings. Yeah, yeah. The hands were so very Rubens. And when I finished the drawing, then she went like that. She went to scrum her hand. I thought, oh, my gosh, did you actually sit for me? She says, yeah, I saw you doing the drawing, so I thought I'd sit still for you. <laughs> and I said, thanks so much. That's great. That was really nice. And, That's yeah, great. so, and, yeah, and the local paper wrote something about that, and that was good. Great. But, yeah, um, most of the time people liked that. You know, they would talk about art, they would talk about things that they never do. Yeah, that's a, that's do. great. It, it's a shame that um, some of the people on that train, when the lady started complaining, did sort of take her side. Yeah, mm. yeah. It's funny because a couple of them were actually from my parents' background, so oh, I knew yeah. the language, and yeah. they were saying how wonderful it is someone's drawing. Yes. <laughs> and then suddenly, when she started, they were saying it's not right what you're doing is wrong. And I said to them, "Look, I know you." I know Maltese, and a moment ago you were saying how wonderful it was that someone's <laughs> drawing. So yeah. you know you're just being. Um, puppets to that yeah. purpose don't be silly mm. and I said it's quite innocent what I'm doing and I, I've got permission from the railways and they said yeah. oh do you I said yeah they know I'm doing this it's, sure. it's fine and this is in a in a public space in a public carriage space. that's a, a carriage a that's train. right you know if you want privacy go and go in a car yeah get an Uber. it's a public space public you're space. entitled to, to do it's, that and it's an interpretation it's only an interpretation yeah, and someone needs to document history you, yeah I'm not yeah, exactly yeah, well right. actually technically you can well if it's um, a public space it's a public space you can, can that's yeah, right that's take right. a photograph but it's not what I was doing I was just doing drawings mm. and to me it was to keep myself same while I was in the train. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I sort of relaxed and mm. and keep me drawing because I, I wasn't having much time to do my art. Sure. Did yeah. you ever consider driving or it was just an issue of parking? No, I used to drive to to, um, to the city and it used to take me an hour and a half to yeah, get there. traffic-wise. And then it cost a lot of parking. Yeah. And because I used to get there and park after a certain time, for the class that I was teaching, you know, whatever it was, I was paying it on a – parking mm. uh, so, so i'm actually paying for parking yeah coming to teach take away for parking was about train us 20 minutes yeah. and i was doing something practical yeah sure. so i thought from that point i thought that's it no more car i'll draw i take the train in Fantastic. from now on good yeah. so the series of portraits that you created uh, on the line mm. co culminated into an exhibition in the foyer of victoria university flinders street campus in 2009 what were some of the responses you received from the public about this body of work. So that's the On The Line yeah, series. Yeah. First, uh, first of all, um, as a group, they look like stamps. Okay. So most people kept on saying they look like stamps. The whole thing looks like stamps. And But what most people were saying is that they would look at them and they can actually recognise people or they would recognise a type of people. Yeah. And they can relate to them. And then one person said to me, um, I bet you I know that 
that was on the Lilydale line because I know that person. I said, actually, no, that's on the Sunbury yeah. line, on the Sydenham line. Yeah. Oh, okay, because I'm sure I know that person. But that's what I like. Yeah. They're identifying people, those drawings that people they know. Right. And that's what I wanted. I want, and to me, it's like, you know, that person could be that person, could be that person. Sure. And I used to see some of those people in the shopping centre, mm. in, not in their working clothes, but in their everyday clothes. Mm-hmm. I thought, I know that person. Oh, that's right. I drew that you person. Drew them, yeah. Yeah. So, so that's the response I was getting. I was getting a lot of response about the, um, the, the setup of the show and how um, you can utilise a what we call a travelling time to actually do something productive. That's right. Yeah, yeah. and that, they thought, gosh, you know, you don't, you don't think of that. Yeah. And um, I thought, well, know that I, I just kept myself drawing. So <laughs> That's interesting. That whole exhibition came about through just you working uh, through getting to point A. To, to point, point B, B, yeah. During it that was, downtime. Exactly. Yeah. It wasn't a planned show. It was just something. And, and, and a lot of people still think that was the strongest works I did because of wow. that. Especially artists that I know that that's your strongest body of work. That's incredible because it documents history and it has a lot to offer, and I can see that. Sure. But and then someone wrote to me and said, "Love your drawings, and when you work from the photos of to do those drawings, I said, no, I don't work from photos. These <laughs> I had to write back and say these are done from life. Yes, I do them on the spot. There's yes. no photographs. I don't touch them after I do them. That's it. Once they're done, I leave them. Sure. Once you touch them, then you ruin them. That's right. They're done on the spot, spontaneous, and they're left That's like it. that. That's it. No photographs and no overworking, just mm-hmm. leaving them. Sure. Yep. Now, in total, you taught part-time on a permanent contract at Victoria University between 1985 to 2014. Did you notice the attitude of art students and the trends they followed change over the 30 years that you were teaching there? Yeah. I, um, the... It, it chops and changes, but I've found that um, in the last few years, um, you, you had students who were um, there because they had nothing to do, mm. so they had to do some sort of course because their mum and dad wanted to do some course or something like that. That was fine. I was finding um, students with a lot more talent, mm. so they, because they're being exposed to things, they're becoming more talented, and their sure. schools are teaching them something, their high school, so they're becoming a bit more talent. Um, I was finding it was a little bit more less coming from the western suburbs, uh, yeah. and because we were situated in the city, we were, uh, we were getting more students coming from other places. Mm. Um, so, unfortunately, because this, the fees for TAFE was getting expensive, mm. a lot of the kids were not able to go to art school. There's no way their parents would let them go to art school yeah. and pay, you know, whatever it was, 10000 whatever it was or something, whatever. And the, the, the students were shocked when I used to tell them that when I was in TAFE, it only cost me um, $60 a year. And when I was at um, VCA, it cost me $650 a year. Yeah, that's incredible, isn't it? And when it? you tell them that, then what? You know, now they're paying so much. Yeah. So, so yes, yeah, things like that have changed, mm. have changed. And... Um, but in general, it's um, the age groups were very similar. Had a mixture of, um, we had more mature age students. Yes. As the years gone on, we had much more mature age students, people who were leaving their jobs mm. or semi-retiring and wanting to do a co- go yeah. back to what they've always loved to do that weren't allowed to do it when they were younger. Sure. And they can afford to do it because they had retired, so they had a bit of money so they can actually do a, sure. a course or something, yeah, mm, in great. that sense, yep. Great. And were, were there phases as well where you noticed there were years – where students were really interested in, in, you know, abstraction and then they might be really interested in maybe collage. Um, yeah, and, and um, you had things like that because it all depends on the fashion that was what was being taught in high school. Yes. So in high school they were focusing on, like if I saw any one more Andy Warhol painting, <laughs> and another um, A Way Way artwork, I'd scream mm. because that's all they were seem to be teaching at high schools. They were exposing them to those two artists only. Sure. And so I would get in folios and they wanted, they were doing things about Andy Warhol. Andy Warhol, oh my gosh, you know, there was more to life than Andy Warhol and A Way Way. Sure. And so, yeah. And, um, but it was interesting though, because we used to interview students all the time for, for the following year watching the trends in the folios yeah. and in symbolisms that it will come through. Like one year, there little frogs. There'll mm. be frogs in the folios. There'll be drawings of frogs. One year, it's eyes. Mm. There's something drawing eyes, horses, whatever it might be. Sure. So we used to think, okay, what's this year's theme? I wonder mm. what's this year's theme mm. and things like that. Sure. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. Now, regarding teaching, you have stated, quote, 
I do like the contact with the students. I got so much from my own teachers and I want to pass that on. And there's a lot of talent here in the West, mm. but often young people aren't being directed or their families don't encourage them. I can help these kids because I've been there. Unquote. Have you found that teaching has interfered with your own painting or is it something that reinvigorates you? No, it reinvigorates me. Okay. Um, I love teaching because mm. I like, it, 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 um, it inspires me and encourages me and it tests me. Yes. It tests me, you know, how much do I know? Do I know this? And I, as I keep telling the students, when I'm teaching you, I'm teaching you how to see and how to teach you how to paint and draw and so on, but I'm not God. I don't know everything. Mm. You know, I might suddenly learn something today, new that, I didn't know. Mm. So we're learning from each other. Right. But for me, when I'm teaching, it inspires me to work. Mm -hmm. It inspires me to look up things and research things and so on. Sure. And, um, and I find that it goes hand in hand. Mm -hmm. It goes hand in when, when there's an old saying that people say, those who can't teach, I used to hear that and say, what a lot of rubbish, you yeah. know, because um, when you look right through history, you know, those ones who were good teachers were good artists. That's right. And so forth. You know? And um, um, as you know, in my studio, I've got quotes on the walls sure. that I put up and students put up. Yeah. And there's one there of um, about Van Gogh. Mm. And um, Van Gogh had a teacher when he was put into a boy's home he had a, a teacher who was um an artist i think he was an artist and he used to say to van gogh or to his students i want you to paint that fence mm. but i don't want you to be obsessed about how many bricks there are and the mortar and everything else mm. if you're obsessed with that when you, you missed your calling you should be a bricklayer okay right so tell me about the fence yes through paint and through yeah, the thing. Interpret it. Don't exactly. It. Yeah. So that obviously was a teacher that really inspired Van Gogh. Sure. sure. You know, all yeah. those sorts of things. So, and I, and, and that's how I take the approach with teaching is that it's very laid back when mm. I teach and um, I teach them skills and, and so on. And then I let them find out what they want to learn. Yeah. And then I help along with those sure. and so on. Fantastic. Yeah. yeah. One of the useful things that comes with teaching full-time or part-time is a regular income which can create a sense of financial stability for an artist. Did you find this to be the case while teaching at Victoria University? Yeah, well, Victoria University, for me, working part-time was enough for my lifestyle. Um, I, I don't live expensively. I don't go and buy expensive clothes and lots of stuff. I live from up shops. All that sort of stuff. Sure. And even though, even when I was in a family situation, um, um, my ex and I, we didn't have, we didn't worry about too much expenses and stuff like that. Mm. So it was enough for me to get by mm. and, um, and it was enough to survive. I mean, I know a lot of people couldn't live on 0.5 contract. There's no way. Sure. Um, but to me, it's like I said, I don't. You know, I don't go and spend expense. I don't. I'm not interested in buying expensive cars. I'm not expensive this or that and so on. Or sure. go and uh, go on expensive holidays. I'm not like that. So for my lifestyle, that was enough. Mm. And I had no interest in applying to go and teach in tertiary at all. Right. I never had any inclination because I was happy at at, at the TAFE. Sure. And I didn't. And because I knew. Um, high red, a lot of politics that goes on right. in there. Yeah. I wasn't interested in being part of politics. Sure. And, and I think that's what this slowly destroyed where I used to teach. The TAFE politics came into it slowly mm -hmm. and it made it, it, um, it became toxic. Sure. You know, and um, I don't like that sort of environment. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sure. During the years teaching at Victoria University, you continued to actively paint in your spare time. As the years went on, you saw the impacts that urban development had on the western suburbs and its residents. As you have stated, quote, when I was a child, it was all paddocks and now you look at it and it's changed so much. It's something that interests me, but it also frustrates me in a way to see all that beautiful open space disappear, unquote. When observing your body of work, one can see this documentation of the changing environment. Why have you felt compelled to paint, to paint the evolving area around you over the years? It's an interesting one because, um, you know, like you said, gr growing up and seeing the landscape changing and um, has become a big interest of mine. But when um, a lot of my colleagues and my friends, um, even um, uh, um, teachers that had taught me, 
who I was still in contact with, they used to say to me, you know, go, you should go away overseas and find international images that you can work with and so on. Why painting the suburbia and so on, whatever. And I thought, yeah, that's right, maybe I should get out away from it. So I went overseas, all that stuff. When I came back, I, I, I gravitated back to suburbia. Sure. It made me see in a different light. I mm. started to see, no, I, I, I see something here that people don't see. Right. That to me, the colours, the terracotta roofs, the metal roofs, all those, it, 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 the landscape was changing. Mm. And it was changing from what it used to be. Sure. And, um, and, but uh, in a sad way, predictable. Right. Yeah, like I, um, some paintings I've done, there's one of a freeway that's on the way to back of Smash, and at that stage it was just an overpass with empty paddocks around it and the bypasses. So I painted it what I think it's going to look like in the future. I see, right. And, yes, there's all these houses on the side and everything else, and the, and the painting's very much, now when you drive there, it's almost looks exactly it looks the, as what so, I did so in the you, painting. You predicted it. I predicted well. it. The yeah. suburbia has become very predictable. Sure. Um, and that says, but there is, apart from that, I see the beauty of the colours, the roofs, the all of those, and mm. the the way we, it's the, how it's made. To me, it's, it's I see it in paint. I mm. see the landscape in paint. Sure. And that's what I like, yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Now, in 2011, you became a registered research supervisor and completed an external associate doctoral through Victoria University. Why did you choose to become a registered research supervisor? I, actually, I didn't choose that. What actually happened is that there was a student from a different department who was doing writing and painting, okay. and he was doing his research, and he wanted someone to actually... Um, supervised, but he wanted me because he knew of, he had heard of me right. and everything else. And he said, I want Paul to supervise me. Now, the person who runs the supervising thing, I had to have a meeting with him. I had, the person who does the supervising runs that. I had to have a meeting with him. And I said, look, um, this sounds interesting, but I don't have a PhD mm. and I don't have any of this stuff. So I'm not sure if I can qualify for this sort of thing. And he said, give me your CV and give me all the articles about your career and everything else. And he presented that to the academic board okay. at VU. And he presented to them and they assessed it and they said, yes, we give him the right to be an su external supervisor. Oh, great. And definitely. And everyone else, even today, some people say, no, I, I don't agree with that because you don't have your PhD, you don't have your master's. So, well, it was approved by an academic board. Mm -hmm. Go argue with them. Sure. You know, and so the, I had to assess this person and help this person out, all that sort of stuff. Great. And they said, you know, the years of work with experience proves enough that you can yeah. supervise someone in that sense. So, yeah, that, that's how it came about. Sure. Did you only supervise that one student? That one student, yeah, that one student then, yeah. Sure. Okay. Now, during 2014, the TAFE sector in Victoria underwent some funding cuts and many TAFEs were closed down, resulting in some teachers losing their positions. TAFEs that weren't shut down underwent significant changes in administration. Would you like to explain the events that led to your resignation from Victoria University in 2014? Yeah. Um, I actually didn't resign. Um, they wanted me to resign. We had new people take over who just treated us as a business income, a business, and that's it, and had no idea how to run an art, um, to know what art is really all about. And it became toxic and it was became um, a lot of bullying going on, all those sorts of things. And, um, and people were being cut off one by one. Sessional staff were cut away and, um, and people were being forced out because the new person wanted different people in and so on. And they knew they couldn't fire me because I'll get rid of me because I was permanent staff mm -hmm. and I never had a complaint made against me, all that sort of stuff, um, permanent contract. And, um, so yeah, so, um, yeah, it was interesting how, in that sense, it got to a point where I felt sick going to work in the morning. I was mm. going there, it was like, it's not the environment I'm used to. It's all about um, having, uh, doing things that, we're not, uh, that we were expected to do that was, we never had time to do. Mm. Um, redo this, redo this, redo that, rewrite, re rewrite the briefs, rewrite the briefs because the person there was basically trying to keep her job as a... Uh, educational officer, so she kept reinventing the briefs. So right. we're doing things, wasting our time. Right. I had no time to go and research stuff for the students. Mm. And even things like, you know, um, why do you need a model for figure drawing? Why can't you use a photograph? This is <laughs> this is the director of the, the art department. Yeah. Coordinate. 
But it, for, really, it's called life drawing because you're, paint, you're drawing from life, mm. you know. So it got to a point where I decided I can't handle this anymore. So I, I went in there one time with my folder and took all my stuff and, and then I re- learned um, that I had 800 hours leave, wow. sick leave that I never used. So I actually used it up and took a lot of time off and I know they were trying to get me to resign and, and, and I refused to. I said, this is what you want. You want me to resign? I'm not going to resign. Sure. And then I had sort of a b- bit of a breakdown. It was because they were, they were putting a lot of pressure mm. onto me and everything else and so on and going to have a meeting with that, have a meeting with this and so mm. on and whatever. And I, it was just getting too much and eventually it came to a point where they offered us a package it was only a small package and i thought i'll take that and just keep my my well-being safe and just take it and go good and did that instead and um and then i decided well what am i gonna do you know i'm not trained for anything else Mm. i don't have a job and um so i was panicking at that stage and i was worried and stressful and whatever and you know 30 years in the job and suddenly you're not there anymore yeah. that was really hard to deal with and um and then um then i was getting phone calls from students who were still there mm. who would say things like oh can you tell me how to if i want to paint this how to do that because the person who teaches painting here doesn't really know Mm. and the person who does drawing here doesn't really know how to draw that well. They haven't drawn for years and so on. And so I was getting all these students calling me, right. and I thought, why don't I just run my own school? Yeah, makes sense. And I thought, I'm run my own school. So then I decided to go into a program. Um, it was uh, called, I think it was a Nice program, to learn how to run a business. Sure. So I did that for a few weeks, and I did that, and I learned how to run a business, and then I started to set up. Right. And I decided I'm just going to set up in the – I was going to rent, trying to find a place to rent, and my friend who's a real estate agent who I've done commissions for in the past said, no, don't rent a place. You've got a good studio. It's going to cost you a fortune on rent. Yes, yeah. So don't. You've got enough space. Just teach from home. Like you've got your studio, do it that way. And I thought, well, that's true. Sure. So I decided to do that. So there's no – costs in that way and i started teaching from here and then it became word of mouth and now it's just word of mouth that's great yeah and it's working out really well i'm getting quite a lot of students and that's it keeps fantastic. going and and when COVID hit um i was lucky because i had abn i was able to get job keeper yeah but so i decided though to still keep running classes but i wasn't charging um, oh, I, was, okay. I was only charging a fraction yes because i was getting job keeper anyway but i wanted to keep the students so i'd say look um we're going online and i'll show you how to do this and we all have and they all joined in and then i used to run sessions where they paid nothing it was just four or five hours just to talk about everything and anything (laughs) because i knew them a lot more isolated that's right they're isolated they used to come here this is their well they tell me now which i love this is their happy place oh that's great so for them yes for them it's like they lost that happy place for a while yeah so i thought okay let's get online and just talk you know grab a glass of wine and let's talk about this the weather and whatever it might be and talk even about what's going on Mm. in the world and and that way kept in touch Mm. we kept in touch and and now they're all back they all after covid um the lockdown stopped they all came back because we're all still in touch with each other and so on great yeah so when you completed that um, NICE program, yeah, it's called NICE program, NICE program yeah. Paul, they taught you how to actually run your school, run your business? Yeah, how to run a business. They t- in general, how to run a business. You have to do these go-to sessions or online and they you have to do these questions and answer these questions and learn about the meaning of running a business, how to do tax things, all that sort of stuff right. and how, um, how to do all that. So you learnt all those mm. and um, and you got a bit of a uh, bit of a income to, to for a few weeks so you can actually survive while you're setting up your business oh that's great and it's a great program i think it should be continued sure that sort of thing because otherwise there's no way i could have done it there's no yeah. way my brother did it that's how he started his business mm. and he did that and he actually helped him get his business going that's great and um yeah so i thought yeah and um and there is no art school in the west except there is a art room in footscray yeah which is great and um but that's in footscray but around this area this immediate area here there isn't anything sure at all around here and there is community arts and so yes. on but they do very more crafty, very crafty stuff yeah. yeah and i get parents who ring me up and say look i want my daughter or my son to do a class 
but I'm not interested in you know, throwing paint around and being expressive and stuff like that. My my son actually wants to learn how to draw. Yes. Or my daughter wants to learn how to paint properly. Yeah. Is that what you do? Yeah, I teach them from the basics mm-hmm. and so on. That's great. And and that's what they want. Fantastic. And that's what they want. You know, they're not going there just to pass the time and be. You know, be creative and be splash creative. paint because that's the idea of art. No, no. you that's know, great. if you're going to teach a kid how to do physics, you're not going to just going to say, "Oh, just put a couple of chemicals together and have fun." Mm. You know, you're going to teach them the proper the principles, the principles of it. That's right. And art's the, the, same. the same. It's the same. Yeah. Well yeah. said. Well said, yeah. Paul. Mm. Having taught at Victoria University for over thirty years, I imagine the environment would have really become part of you. Did you find it difficult to leave and mm. was the change to your daily routine once leaving refreshing or did it make you feel a little bit lost? And you have touched upon this somewhat. Yeah. Is there anything else you wanted to add? No, I didn't. I think um, I did miss it in a sense of the environment of the people that we had that sure. I used to work with because they were very close friends of mine that we used to always go out together and go see movies and go whatever it might be, paint, um, painting trips or whatever, and that community thing was lost. Mm. But they all were going one by one anyway because they were being pushed out. Yeah. So in that sense, that community was sort of lost. And um, when I went, for example, through a divorce, they would help me and they'll mm. take me. Are you not going to be, are you okay? No, no you're not. They'll come and pick me up. We're going for a long walk, and that's how we were like. That's you know, great. we were a community. That's fantastic. And we would help each other out. And like one teacher who worked with us, um, Jan Henry Jones, um, fantastic. She lived in the eastern suburbs, and and she knew I was going through a rough patch. And I was bringing up my taking care of my stepdaughter because my then ex wife we had a little one, and my daughter was pre born prem. So right. she was in the hospital for a while, my wife wasn't very well, and I was teaching, so I had to teach all that sort of stuff. So this wonderful person used to cook meals and have them at work for me and said, oh, Paul, I've prepared all this stuff for you, so when you get home, you've got food for you and your daughter. That's lovely. Your stepdaughter. I thought, oh, my gosh, you know, this is what it was like, you know, and what it was a, a great community. Great community. Yeah. yeah. And now the students are the same here. The students are like that. They help each other out. We help each other out. I had my 60th. Uh, um, a few couple of weeks, a few weeks ago, just before Christmas, and and I wasn't sure I was going to do anything. And my daughters said to me, "Oh, you're going to have to have a six I thought, oh, I don't know about that. And and then the student said, "Yes, you will." And I said, "Okay, well, well I'm, I'll have my sixtieth." And then I thought, oh, "We'll get this." And I said, "But you're not, no, no, you're not cooking." Yeah. And the the students all cooked. They all <laughs> made food and they all brought food and everything else. And I so saw on. photos. Of yeah, it. yeah, it was great. It was they, fantastic. It's fantastic. You know, yeah. they all organized everything and so on. And they said. You know, you, you just relax, we'll handle the barbecue, we'll do all this and you just, you know, of all of us being together, we see students that we don't see during the week because they're at different times, sure. at least we get to meet others. And That's fantastic. It's a great environment. This is, yeah. a, a you know, a beautiful thing that you've done here, Paul, in, in the West. You know, Thanks. you've yeah. opened up your studio, um, but you've also opened up your home. Yes. Yeah. And um, it's just a beautiful thing to see. I mean, you know, you're not doing this for financial gain you're doing mm. it and making money to get by to live we will need to make a living but it's it's great like some of those stories you were able to share just before about the students who were stuck in covert and this was their happy place and but you still gave your time you know mm. and that's um you know that's that's what that's what makes a special teacher I think. It, thanks for that yeah well actually one of the students told me the other day her, her mother passed away mm. not long ago and she had to go and collect her ashes the other day and she said she said, it sounds a bit weird, Paul, but I must tell you this. When I picked up my mother's ashes, I had to go drive past your place and tell my mother that this is my happy place, Mum. Oh, and I thought, wow, isn't, isn't that lovely? And I thought, yeah. wow, that's yeah. really nice. That's yeah. Yeah, to me, it, money is nothing. I mean, money helps, of course, but it's that community thing. It's all that stuff that keeps you keeps us going, and that's what we're losing. And mm. and um, yeah, and that's what the university was losing. Sure. It will become about you know, rush them through, get the money, rush them through, get the money, and it was wrong. Sad. And it was sad. Yeah, it yeah. was sad. It's and a shame. Towards the end, yeah. Once you left Victoria University in 2014, you wasted no time in taking action to establish your own art school, mm. the Paul Paul Borg art school in your garage of your home in St Albans. Did establishing the school seem like a natural decision or were you apprehensive about it? Now, mm. you have already touched upon this yeah. somewhat, but um, when you started to get those phone calls from those students from um, Victoria University asking you technical questions and such, at that point you just made a decision that 
this has got to be done. Yeah, that's right. And that's true because um, what I had decided is that when I left there is that um, when I was looking for a place to, to live, I was more concerned about finding a place with a big space, not the house. Yeah. The house isn't small enough. That's okay. But I had a big space that had a studio mm. that I can create a studio in it. And then when it came to setting up as a school, I thought, well, that's perfect for the school. So, um, yeah, so in a sense, it's, um, yeah, I think that answer, basically I felt like, um, yeah, it, to me it seemed natural because I still like teaching. I still like that communication with people. Mm. So it seemed natural for me to um, – to do that, even even my family and my friends always say to me, they joke around with me sometimes. And when I say something, they go, "So here he goes, he's in this teaching mode now, <laughs> teaching." And I'm like, I, I know that I'm sure. like that, and so on, and I'm fine because I like sharing that. I like sharing knowledge right. and so forth. And some people say, "Do you give everyone all your information, your secrets?" I said, "No, there's secret secret things I might use and paints and so on, and I might do. I won't give them away." Mm. Jokingly, I had a student one time because I paint skies with a certain colors right. and i won't give that away and he said to me can you tell me how you you the blues you use can you show me how to paint the skies i said yeah no worries and all the students this is when i was at the tape looked at me and said you've not done that to me and i said come over here and i'll show you and he came over to me and i pointed to at the window and looked at the sky and i said have a look what colors do you see yeah. well i don't know well then that's what you need to do mm. i'm not going to give you my the answers i'm not going to give you what i've spent you know, 20 years discovering myself that's not fair for one because my secrets and two you need to learn to look sure so yes yeah, so, so in that sense i like to share things but sometimes it's like um teaching them or showing them how to look mm -hmm. um, helps me understand about things that i've learned mm. at the same thing it, i'm i'm, I'm in, encouraging the idea of observation as i keep telling the students I'm not teaching you how to draw and paint so you can learn how to paint and draw. Mm. I'm teaching you this so you can learn how to look. Sure. So you can look. That we take things for granted. Right. Now, if you're going to make, draw a brick today, for mm. example, when you go out there, you'll see bricks differently. Right. That's right. And that's, that's what it's all about. Learning to see. Learning to see. Sure. It's all about learning to see. Well said. When you did um, open up your, your school initially, Paul, and, and you're, you, know, you had some students that you had never met before, mm. initially, essentially inviting them into your home, was that something, I mean, considering you, know, you have a uh, you have, uh, family that lives with you, was that something that you felt um, a bit nervous about? Um, yeah, I, yeah, I did for a little while. I thought, I've got some people in here who I don't know. But I've learned, I sort of learned from the TAFE years how to understand people's characters from interviewing students and students year after year. So when people used to ring up and inquire, I used to ask certain questions and the certain questions will let me know are actually really serious about art or are they just sussing my house out right? and all that sort of stuff. So I'm like, I'll ask certain things and those certain questions will help me define um, who they are and I might say um, wh whatever it might be. And, and, I'm, and even in the first class, I might actually, for example, get them to do a drawing that comes from their mind mm. and that tells me a lot about them. Sure. And I learned that... Um, when I was at the, at the university, for example, I used to teach figure drawing. Um, I used to teach figure drawing, but also I used to organise figure drawing classes for other teachers. Okay. And there was a teacher one time, and she had a male student come in to do a class. He was in his 50s. And the next week, there was another two male students who joined him. And then she said, uh, I've got these students who've come in, and they're not there to learn how to draw. Mm. They're there to perv. Oh, and I know because of the way they act, mm. but we can't get rid of them because they've paid their fees. Mm. And I said, yeah, you can get rid of them. No, we can't. They've paid their fees. I said, yeah, you can get rid of them. Mm -hmm. you, and you'll know what, what they're here for. Sure. So what I did, I said to her, let's not, let's not book female models. I'm going to book male models for the next few weeks. Okay. Right. So I did that for her. So when the students would ask straight away, I said, they're going to ask you the first week how can we go male model are we going to have any female models mm. say to them no for the next five weeks we're not because they're actually they're not available there's sure. any male models they never came back that's great they never came back yeah and i said that's how you do it that's so great. i've learned here is that when i question them i ask them certain things to find out whether they're genuine or not good yeah because you are, have to be aware you know i do remember the first 
um, for a few weeks I set up the, the school, uh, we were getting calls that were abusive. Is that right? And they were really abusive, and I had the speaker on, and, and they were really, and some of them were teenagers mm. and young people who, who, who were saying disgusting things. And then one time when it happened, when I had the speaker on, my daughter was here, oh. and, I, and, and, and I knew that these weren't, they were just, they saw my pamphlet somewhere and they were just being nasty and so on. But they kept ringing, and you ring up the police, they will do nothing about it. That's right. So I learned an old trick where I just get, a heavy book, mm -hmm. and when they start talking, slam on the on the table really hard, so mm -hmm. it really echoes in their ear. And they never called back. Oh, well, that's good. Good on you. <laughs> that's a good, good. Trick. Yeah. So, so you have to suss people out, you know. Sure. And, yeah. And touch wood, most of the students I've had over the years have always been genuine, have always been good and helpful and supportive. That's fantastic. Yeah. Paul. So yeah, which is well really done. good. Good. Mm. Now moving on. Paul, regarding your sources of inspiration, we have come to understand that the western suburbs provide you with a great deal of creative fuel. In fact, when you travelled to Malta in 1990, you thought you would come back to Australia with a different set of ideas, mm -hmm. but this wasn't the case. As you've stated, quote, when I got home, I saw suburbia in a whole new way, with different colours in a different light, unquote. Throughout your life, I understand critics have tried to convince you to focus on different subjects for the sake of gaining more popularity with galleries. However, you have remained true to yourself and your immediate surroundings. You've stated, quote, I was told years ago that I should travel the world and come up with more universal images away from the home, but on my return, I gravitated back to suburbia, seeing it in a different light, seeing its real beauty. Mm. Following in the footsteps of Constable, Turner and Van Gogh, who painted their immediate environment with such love and honesty, I want my own works to become as universal as theirs, unquote. You go on to state, quote, I know it sounds cliched, but when I look at the landscape, I see it in paint. I see the contrast of the bricks, the tin roofs, and the different colours of the terracotta roofs. It's simultaneously predictable and musical. To me, the Western Bypass is a new monument of our times, and I don't even find the Western suburbs ugly." Unquote. At the same time, you have claimed that working in the Western suburbs can feel as though you are, quote, pushing nothing uphill and not being taken seriously, unquote. Do you feel as though representing the humble Western suburbs as you have over the years, this has caused galleries to ignore you? It's an interesting point, and it's very much like I was saying before, when we were saying about going and then seeing in a different light, and Fred Williams did himself, Fred Williams, when he came back to Australia, they said to him, now what are you going to paint now you're back to Australia? And he said, I'm going to paint gum trees. Sure. And they said, oh, everyone paints mm. gum trees. You know, the Heidelberg School, he said, yeah, I'm going to paint gum trees, but he did it in his own way. Mm. And um, But you're working and staying and, and making a choice to stay in the West. I could have moved if I wanted to, but I chose to stay here because it's my subject matter here. Um, and the idea was um, in terms of galleries and so on, um, I had approached galleries in the I used to have a commercial gallery in the past, but, you know, they're a business, which I didn't like the way they run things. But And, I, and, I'm, and sometimes I feel that the subject that I paint is – uh, well, one, one actually gallery told me, a commercial gallery told me that he liked my work. So I like your work, but I can't sell your work to my client because the subject, you sure. know, because it's to do with out here and all that sort of stuff, you know. And unfortunately, the people in the Western Suburbs don't buy art. Right. You know, um, I get people in the Western Suburbs who ring me up and say, oh, can you do me, can you do a portrait for me of my mother for her thing? I said, yeah, no worries. And they'll come over and we'll have a chat and and then I'll tell them how much I'll charge and they get shocked because they think I'm going to charge them $50, $100. They have no idea. It's, you know, it's going to cost you a few thousand. It gets a lot of work. That's right. They have no idea. Oh, but it's like, it's a hobby. No, it's not a hobby. This is my job. This is my living. It's, it's a business. Wow, your business. Just, you know, it's my life, you know. So, yeah, so sometimes I feel that the galleries um, might see my subject as not suitable for their clientele, sure. which is fine, but I won't change. I won't change f just to make those galleries happy. Good on you. No, it, I can't because I'm being dishonest. That's right. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll take up another job where I'm actually going to um, earn money and not worry about that because, you know, galleries put pressure on you, mm. all that sort of stuff and so on. You know, they want this and they want that. And 
you know, you've got to go here because you've got to show this, or you have to fly here. I, I'm not interested in that stuff. Mm -hmm. And um, to me, it's, yeah, so I wonder, and um, yeah, look, to me, it's like um, there's an artist called Pizarro. Yes. And Pizarro, if I remember my readings rightly, and actually Anthony Riccardi was telling me this too, mm. um, and John Walker, who I worked with, is that when he went to war, he had to go to war, his studio was basically raided and they actually um, took his paintings off the stretches and they used them to wrap their around the legs oh, because they're right? waterproof, so yeah. they needed them to get through mud and so on, if, if this is true what I was told. And so on. And then, when, and then what, many years later when they came back and someone went to interview, to find out where Pizarro came from and to interview him and everything else, to interview people about him, no one knew that he was an yeah, artist, right? except for those ones who raided his studio. But no one knew that they had an artist in their town called Pizarro. Mm. Because there was no, no, no interest. No interest. There was no interest. Yeah, that's there sad. There was no interest in there. It was quite sad. And so, yeah, so, um, and to me, the immediate environment, like when I went to um, Holland, you know, when people talk about he, Van Gogh exaggerated his colour, yeah, he did to a point, but the colour's there. You know, the blue of the sky is really blue. Mm -hmm. The yellow is really yellow. Mm -hmm. You know, it's exactly as his paintings are. Sure. And, um the constable, you know, the constable painted in the landscape that owned, was owned by his father, all that land. Mm. So he painted the immediate environment that he knew. Mm -hmm. And and that's what I learned is that when I went there, overseas coming back, it, it um, I was glad I did that because it opened my eye to what I already knew. Sure. But I wasn't seeing mm -hmm. properly enough. Right. So enough. you came, was, you came yeah. back with more of an appreciation for yeah. your immediate surroundings exactly in your suburb yeah, yeah. I, I, I used to get people saying you know what you should go to france and go live there and painted owls for a while what because van gogh were painted there or we should go here and these are people who are serious artists or um things in the arts you should go and paint them paint why yeah there's so much here to paint for me that's right why why would i do that you know that's it's great. like <laughs> you don't have to travel far no I don't have to travel far. That's great. You know, the subject's here. It's really there. I just got to tap into it and that's just, it. And, and that's it to me. That's it, you know, and, and that's why even with the still lives, you know, everyone says, like one gallery one said to me once, came to the studio and said, mm, it's hard to really pinpoint you because, you know, you, you, you're a landscape painter, you're a still life painter, a portrait painter. It's like there's no connection and I don't see any connection. And I thought, well, that says a lot about you as a art person or art director because they are you know it's the people of suburbia that i'm painting mm. the objects of suburbia mm -hmm. all of that you know mm. it, unfortunately in australia they pigeonhole you you're either a still life painter mm. or you're a landscape painter mm -hmm. or or whatever i mean it's not really just that i mean for example um Gainsborough was a pa portrait painter mm. but he actually didn't like portrait painting mm. he actually preferred landscape, landscape yeah. he preferred landscape yeah so yeah so to me it's like if i'm painting a still life it's got a a brick in it and a tooth and a um a cloth peg and everything else they're part of suburbia that's right they're objects of suburbia well said yeah and if it's a wheelbarrow yeah it's objects of suburbia that's it and if i'm painting my dad you know and all that sort of stuff because it's, he's from suburbia and so on but those objects are his that's right you know? and that's how i see it mm -hmm. um to me there's no difference it's just the, su the subject matter is different yes yeah, sub still life portraiture landscape but to me it's all one mm -hmm. it's all one it's interesting so you've substituted uh you know exotic fruits and pearls all these things that were used in in you know exotic still life paintings for the rich yeah and instead you're just you're using things that make sense to you that makes that sense reflect to me. your environment exactly yeah. and i used to use in my teaching when i was teaching at the tafe i i was um doing still life drawing and so on and there was a group of guys who were 18 19 and I knew they weren't going to be interested in drawing and, and so on. But I used to listen to conversations. Yeah. And I heard them talking about cars. Mm. They were from the West, so they can talk about cars about and cars. stuff like that. Yeah. And I said, next week you begin doing a still life. And one of them goes, oh, God, we're going to be this doing still life. How boring. Yeah. I said, what does still life mean? And they said, oh, apples and fruits. And so I said, no, still life means it doesn't move. That's right. Okay. Mm. Now, I just heard you talking about cars. Mm. So next week... Bring in a piston, yeah. bring in a brake thing or something like that and set them up and draw them. That's it. Yeah. They're what you know. But that's not still life. Still life is something that doesn't move. Mm -hmm. Bring them in. And they did. They said bring them in. They said enjoy the class because they're drawing something they know. Fantastic. They know. That's great.
And That's good that you got them to engage by, yeah, by opening engage. your eyes. Open your eyes. Perspective. Yeah, exactly. Paint what you know. Sure. And draw what you know. Now, Paul, do you think if you were painting more affluent neighbourhoods, galleries would give you more attention? Who knows? Probably. Because mm -hmm. it's interesting. <laughs> I mean, you know, Howard Arkley, the popular Australian artist, he'd done a lot of paintings of suburbia. Yes. And he yeah. got very very famous that's right it, yeah, exactly right? that's right so and you're doing a similar thing yeah albeit more of a you know representational realist approach yeah but uh but he received a lot more you know recognition for it I, and i think it was more because of the stylistic yeah quality, the stylistic, the airbrushing and the hard exactly. lines that he used throughout his work as and well. it's sort of tapping on the on the rock world because of that whole mm. you know the pop image the, and all that sort of stuff and so on and, and, whatnot, yeah. and, and that worked for him really well sure in that sense mm. yeah but yeah i do wonder um you know if if I painted things on the other side of town, how would they react to that mm. and so on? But interesting you said that though, because um, one of the art historians, I know, art history teacher, um, that, that taught me, Elizabeth Gertzakis, she said mm. to me one time, she said, Your freeway paintings are interesting because even though I know they're from the West, they're actually freeways on the eastern suburbs are the same. Right. So they you're actually, the same. they look the same. Yeah. So you're actually not just painting about your area actually it's telling us something about melbourne altogether sure so yeah so it's interesting so yeah so so it, to me it doesn't bother me it's subject that i like and if people like it they buy it. they don't well, you're, you're not phased i'm not phased i'm not phased great. great i know hopefully down the track that people will see what i'm doing mm. and they might not i mean we don't know how history will turn out sure but to me i'm um, just painting what i enjoy painting that's it great you know, and that keeps me keeps me focused because I'm documenting what I know. That's I it. suppose that's the best way to say it. I'm documenting what I know. That's the attitude to have, I, yeah. I believe, anyway. Yep. Yep. Now, I understand you have had gallery representation in the past. Mm. What has your experience been like with galleries? Now, again, you have touched upon this. Is there anything you would like to uh, yeah, look, contribute to I'm not a, uh, It's an interesting point um, because I'm not a business person. And the galleries are a business. Sure. And the, the gallery I was with, even though this person used to represent my work, um, they used to sell a lot of my work and I never used to see the money. You know, uh, um, the first show I had, I sold about $13,000 worth of paintings for young artists of only about 25, I think I was then. Wow. That was, that's a lot of money. It is, yeah. But I was lucky from that twenty from that 13000 to see about three or $4,000. Oh, that's terrible. And it was all money that was still being paid, still being owed. And and then the person who ran the gallery would um, come and take the painting and put it into someone's house because they like your painting and we'll leave it there. They'll grow, they'll grow to like it and then they'll buy it. They never did. I was, by well, that stage, I left the gallery because I had to get up because I was not, you know, seeing any money. So I lost a lot of paintings sure. and lost a lot of money. And that really gave me a bad taste about galleries. Mm -hmm. And then we found that a lot of galleries, especially in the 80s and 90s, were actually keeping the money and buying land here and buying land there, all that sort of stuff. Right. And so on. Um, so I never approached, um, I, I think I approached a couple of commercial galleries after that, but after that, I gave up. Mm. And I thought, no, look, you know, they're business people. I'm not a business person. They'll just take advantage. And I knew that this person was selling a lot of my works and I wasn't getting known, but I was selling. Sure. Which this person had a lot of artists who were getting known but weren't selling, right. but they were getting written about. Mm -hmm. So she was using my money to give to them to keep them in the gallery because they were getting written about but they weren't selling, yeah. but they were getting written about and giving them my money. That's not ethical. And it's not ethical, you know, and it was like, I was working my, I was, I was too ashamed to tell my family that, oh, look, I haven't got my painting, my money yet, and so on, all that sort of stuff. And, um, by that stage, I had a young family and, um, all those sorts of things. I couldn't go and say to people, I don't need to borrow money because I got no money because they're not paying me. Mm. It was embarrassing. Right. It was embarrassing. I was, well, stuff this, you know, this, mm. if this is what galleries are about, I'm not interested. Sure. I'm not interested. And that's why I got, I got involved with artist run spaces and so on because I was showing it my own way. Yes. And if something was bought, I made the money. Right. And I kept the money. That's right. You know, and I don't have to give half of it to someone or, or all that sort of stuff, you yeah, know. Sure. And to me it was like it's I just felt like I was being used. Mm -hmm. And um uh, you know, 
and they would use my work for advertising because they like my work and then I'll be told now you owe money for that because the advertising is expensive and I'll say young and I even think oh okay and I didn't have the money so they'll take a painting in return mm. and then I realized later on I didn't have to do that that was their gallery they were promoting well that's part of the commission they received that's yeah. part of their duty to promote yeah to, sh to share your work with their mailing lists with their community exactly with their patrons with their collectors yeah yeah it exactly. can be very um, it can put you in a very strange position when you are being represented by a commercial space. They mm. can really own own you and what you're doing and how many shows you have, the subject matter of your exactly. exhibition, so on. So yeah, they forth. control you, and I don't want that. You yeah. know, most guys will say, I want you to have 12 paintings by this next year, this time, or something like that. And I don't work like that. I work on a lot of paintings, and one, a painting might take me a week to paint. Mm. One, a painting might, might take a day, but one painting might take me about two, three years, maybe ten years, mm. because I go over it, I rechange it and do that. Sure. And when that series is ready, that's when I'm ready to show it. Right. And that's why I go and look for other alternatives to show it, yeah. rather than a gallery, because a gallery would be frustrated. They'll say, well, you haven't got those 12 paintings. Well, yeah, I can whip up 12 paintings for you, mm. but they mean nothing to me. They're just whipped up for you. Yeah. They're not from your heart. They're not from my heart. I'm just doing them because you want 12 that's paintings. Right. Right. But I like to go over things and rework things and redo things because I know that once with my paintings, the surfaces, when I scrape them back and cut them back and turp them and redo that, that's when the painting starts to talk to me. Mm, there's a history there. And there's a history there, and that painting surface starts. Like I showed one painting not long ago that I started 30 years ago, mm. and a, uh, a painting of an airport scene and all that sort of stuff and so on. And I reworked that painting and scraped it back and everything else, and it got to a point where, bingo, this is what I want. Sure. This is what I want. This is what I wanted to get, and I finally got it. It's an yeah. organic process, isn't it? It really? is. Really, your, 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 your particular process. It is. It's mm. very organic, and it's funny because someone said, um, said to me, um, it was Gordon Morrison, mm. director of the Ballarat Art Gallery, he, mm. when he sat for me, um, he said, do you look at scales, colour scales, and all those sorts of things, and so on. He was just questioning me, basically. I said, actually, no, I don't. I don't. I don't care for those sorts of things and so on. I just paint. And he said, I saw, he said, so I see you're an intuitive painter. Mm. And I said, I, I, spoke, I assume so. Yeah. Right, <laughs> I right. assume so, yeah. Because I don't, you know, I don't sit down and do colour scales and that wheel says, nah. To me, it's like, no. Nature teaches me more. That's right. You know, nature That's teaches good. me more. Like at this time of year now, there's a lot of red flowers out. Mm. You know, this time of year there's red flowers out and so on and whatever, and there's a lot of red and white flowers out. Mm. Uh, um, a couple of months back there was a lot of purple and yellow flowers out, the complementary colours. Right. So there's all nature tells you. It teaches you. To me, that's a, that. there's my colour scales. That teaches me. And I'll sit there and look, you know, I'll sit there and look at the sunset for a while and see how it changes the colour of certain sure, things. Sure. That tells me. So you're a student of nature. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Now, your latest group exhibition was in 2022 and was titled The Three Twins. Mm. It was shown at the Black Sheep Artist Gallery. Prior to that, you had a virtual solo exhibition in 2020 titled Paul Borg Local E, while the Melbourne lockdowns were in place. You seem to show your work quite frequently. How important is it for you to exhibit your work? Okay. Well, for both of those shows, I was approached. Okay. So for, for Local E, it was actually, I was approached by someone at, at Bring Bang Council who knows of my work and he's shown my work before. And because my, my paintings were about home and home and family mm. and because we were in lockdown, sure. he said, are you interested in having a show about your work because it's about home and family? And right. I said, yes. Yeah. So they actually did a, a show online yes. to do with that. So that, that's how that came about. And with the Three Twins one is a friend of mine wanted to start a gallery and he didn't know too much about galleries and, I, and he said will you be interested in showing have a show of your own I said no, I want to have a show of my own because it's a new gallery have a group show mm. and but I um, select some artists but I need to see the artist because he, some of the, his artists he had were hobby artists everything else. so I'm not going to show with hobby right. artists yeah. and they had um, two other artists that he showed me their work and I thought that they I like these and um, one was um, uh, Ricardo Angelo yeah. and the other one is um, uh, Mark, Marco, I can never pronounce his surname, pronounce Panaccia or something like that. Very mm. Anyway, and um, he showed me their work and I thought these are good works and so on. And then we 
had a meeting to talk about our work. And on the way home, um, the guy who runs the gallery, um, he, we were talking about family, and, and I was telling him that I, I was a twin. And he said, oh, Ricardo is a twin. Okay. And I said, oh, that's interesting. And then, and, then, and then he said, wouldn't it be funny if Marco is a twin? Mm-hmm. And he rang him on the spot and he said, Marco, I know this is a stupid question, but you wouldn't be a twin by any chance. He goes, yes, I am. Oh, wow. So it turned out that we're all twins. <laughs> the coincidence. So anyway, so we thought, oh, my gosh, this is weird. And we had a writer who was going to write some things about the, the show. Well, she wrote things about the show and about things about my train drawings that was part of the show. And when we told her the story, she said, you're not going to believe this. But I said, don't tell me you're a twin. She goes, no, I'm not a twin. She said, I, I'm working with a team, a team of writers who are writing about twins. Okay. What's the odds? So then this guy decided, I'm going to call your show The Three Twins. The Three Twins. The Three Twins, yeah. yeah. So, and that's what it's about. So he selected the work. So he, he selected a range of works of, over the years that I've done. Sure. So they weren't recent works. They were, some were recent, but some weren't. Mm-hmm. And we did a selection of work. He wanted to represent different types of work that I've done over the years. Sure. And did that. And, um, yeah, so, and, um, so it was a good show. Fantastic. But unfortunately, we had to cancel it the first year because of COVID. Right. And he unfortunately opened the gallery at the wrong time because the lockdowns hit so he only had one show in that whole year that uh, he re- released that space so he lost a lot of money right. because he leased that space and he couldn't show anything because mm-hmm. of covid sure, sure. yeah so, so unfortunately so, it doesn't continue the gallery yeah sure so so paul you're you're big on the idea of showing your work i mean you're for it you're not mm. you're not trying to keep to yourself these days you, you want to get your work you still want to get your work out yeah to a point i do i i i try to have shows in different ways in certain ways. I do still apply for certain art prizes. Mm. A lot of them I don't. I got to a point where a lot of art prizes, especially big art prizes, I find them stressful. Yes. And a lot of anxiety involved with them, all that sort of stuff. Um, like, for example, um, the art world, there's a lot of politics involved with that, mm. and I don't bother um, unless someone approaches me and says, can you paint my portrait like Gordon? Morrison yes. did, and yeah. I did that. And um, um, but yeah, I try to get my work out there. At the same time, I find it nerve wracking these days. I find it stressful. Mm. And um, yeah, and for example, I used I always used to apply for the Doug Moran. And I got into it yeah. so many times. I haven't applied for it for about three years now. Mm. I just find it stressful sure. and the whole th- anxiety, all of it, all. And I just find it's um, and at times it's like I'm. I, I found myself focusing too much on those shows yeah. that I was uh, swaying away from my other things. Right, right. And I thought I'm focusing focusing on that, and then why why am i doing that you know if i come up with a good painting then i might enter it if i might or i might not i'll see how i go sure so yeah so i still have to get him out there but it depends it mm. depends on what but i wouldn't go out my way and say okay i'm gonna go and find someone famous and paint them for the art right. i'm not interested in that right sure. i'm not interested in that it's to me it's like you know because when i entered that arts world with morrison's one that cost me a fair bit of money to mm. put the painting together but also to send it there right Cargo and then to go there, but I, I didn't get into it. I got into the Salon de Refuse, right, yeah. but I still had, had to go to Sydney because it was being on the show, and altogether that cost me a lot of money, yeah. You know, and it, it, it doesn't, you know, I don't, I can't afford these sorts of things, so, sure, sure. <laughs> so I thought, yeah, so yeah, right. No, that, yeah. that makes sense. I mean, it's, it's good for the exposure, but at the same time, it's not free. Yeah, it's not yeah. free. I'm actually finding I'm getting a lot more attention on Facebook. Yeah. If I put show, um, it works on Facebook, people see it, they talk about it more. That online show that I had, the E1, that got 3,000 views. Wow. That's great. 3,000 views. That's great. Now, of course, they can't see the details and the texture and everything else, mm. but they can see the paintings. That's 3,000 views. That's a lot. That's good. That's a lot. And I thought, gosh, you know. And um, But, yeah, um, with certain paintings, there's one painting I've been working on over the years. I've reworked it. It's a large one, and um, it's about nearly six meters. It's probably, mm. I think, five point something meters. Now I'm trying to work out where I want to show this painting, mm. and whether I show it in a gallery or not. Sure. My intuition that shows tells me not to show it in a gallery. Yeah. Um. But I don't know. I, I was even thinking about um, showing it in a shopping centre. Right. In a empty space for a while that's protected that people can't touch it or anything like that, like right. you know, a shop that's empty. Right. I don't know. 
I might do something. I don't know. I don't know um, how I'm going to show this one yet and, sure. and, and, and when the time is right to show it. Sure. Yeah, when the time is right. So, yeah, so, yeah, I'd like to get my work out there, but at the same time, if there's costs involved, you yes. know, when I had that last show, even though um, I sold the painting, which was great, so it covered a lot of costs, but I, I make the frames myself because it's too expensive to frame works. Mm -hmm. I do have a framer. He frames my drawings, but... Some paintings he does, small ones, but big ones I do it myself because it costs too it's much. It's a lot of money. Yeah. It's a lot of money you've got to fork out, you That's know, right. and if you're not going to sell nothing, well, then... It's not worth yeah, it. Yeah, it's not yeah. worth it. Where am I going to how come I pay my next bills? That's right. That's right. All that sort of stuff and so on. So, yeah. Sure. Yeah. Now, observing your body of work, your paintings do have a religious vigour, which is evident through the religious symbolism that has been featured in some of your works. Being a Catholic yourself, I understand you grew up with religious symbolism around your home, which has today manifested itself into your work. You have stated, quote, Some people see my paintings as religious. For example, I might paint a crucifix, but the painting is actually about suburbia and how we treat each other and how we all make sacrifices in our lives. Mm. It's not done to make a religious point, unquote. Would you say that paintings created throughout history in the Catholic tradition have been a source of inspiration to you? Yes. Yeah. When, um, when I use religious images, one, because of my Catholic upbringing, even though I'm not a strict Catholic or anything like that, but the symbolisms I've learned over the years, also, I read a lot about Joseph Campbell, mm. who is the, um, the philosopher and sociologist who, who studied about um, all types of symbols. Sure. All those sorts of things. And, um, and what I found is that, to me, is that I can use those, but not to make a religious point. Right. It's not to make a religious point at all. Um, so, for example, that one you touched on about the crucifixion i did the painting of a crucifixion it's a large painting mm. i did quite quite a few long time ago and but it's actually from the back of the crucifixion you actually the, you see from the crosses at the back so you see christ from the back and the people mm. and you're looking at the viewers the people looking on that's interesting and you're looking yeah. on and the people wore are dressed up in in modern clothes and mm. modern clothes so i've the the three this in the story for example in the bible the three men who roll the dice for his clothes mm. i've got they're not rolling a dice. There's three. There's three um, people, um, businessmen standing next to each other. Okay. You know, they're rolling a the dice in a sense because they're trading on land. They're trading on this. There. There's a guy holding a newspaper with the image of the actual whole crucifixion on the newspaper. Sure. So if it, if it wasn't a newspaper, it didn't happen. Right. Yeah. You know, right. And then there's a woman, that's Mary Magdalene in the painting, running towards him, screaming, and um, and I made that figure up. Um, and M Mary's mother, I use the face of a Lebanese woman okay. in the paper that I found in the newspaper. It's like a whole stack of scrapbooks of newspaper cutting faces that I use, mm. that I might use in painting sometimes, like always from life. Sometimes they are from sure. photos but for faces for certain things. Mm. And this woman, her son was executed because he was re um, rebelling against the system and they executed her son. Mm -hmm. So she was running towards his body. So I used that fat woman's face yeah. as her running towards the crucifixion. Okay. And so. all those sorts of things. So so I might use it in that sense. So I'll use them. So it's not really about religion. Mm. It's about it's about what how people are treating each other. And I remember when the university bought that painting years ago, I hung they hung it up and a particular person who ra was important at the university and pass it and they say, oh, oh, religious paintings. I'm not interested. I'm not, I'm not a religious person. I'm not interested in religious paintings. Yeah. I said, it's not about religion. Look at it carefully. Mm. Oh, I'm not interested. It's about religion. Yeah. Uh, Just, whatever. Yeah. yeah it's a symbolism. And yeah. 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 And, and today, it's today, you can't even do anything to have any religious thing because they That's think right. it's religious. It's offending people. Mm. Hello. Mm. You know, it's part of our culture. Yeah. We can't deny our culture. It's a complicated situation. Yeah, it's right. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. One yeah. of your paintings, Paul, that features distinct Catholic subject matter, which has had me curious for a number of years, is your painting titled Super Jesus, which was <laughs> yes. purchased by the Art Gallery of Ballarat. Mm -hmm. The painting features a gentleman carting a shopping trolley 
with a statue of Jesus inside of it. Can you explain the meanings, ideas, and symbology behind this particular painting? Okay. Well, it's actually it's a drawing. It's a pastel drawing. And what actually happened with that is everyone everyone thinks I came up with this idea at the top of my head. I didn't. I went to the shopping centre here in Brimbank, mm. where I live, and I went there, and there was a guy, an Asian guy with a shopping trolley, and he just bought a statue from the $2 shop. Okay. And right. he was pushing the trolley towards his car. I see. And okay. I thought, well, that's an interesting image. So I kept that image in my head, and when I came back, I did a thumbnail sketch of that image. Right. And then I actually decided to do a drawing of it. So I did um, a, a drawing, and um, I took, a, uh, got a photograph of a shopping trolley, sure. and I did that. And I asked my mother, you want to have a statue of Jesus? And she said, no, I don't. And um, and I said, if you know anyone, let me know, and so on, and thing, and and then she told Dad, and I said, but please don't tell Dad that I'm doing a painting of Jesus because he thinks I'm doing something religious. He goes, oh, he's finally doing something <laughs> honest, religious, because he's not going to like what I'm going to do anyway. Sure. So anyway, so um, but I, then I found a little statue, mm. and I used that, and I paint. I did this drawing of this guy pushing the trolley, mm. but he's looking to the side. Sure, he's looking to the side. Um, I deliberately did that on purpose because he's looking away. And when I had that on show, um, one of the directors of one of the galleries of who, who, who oh, I know runs a gallery said to me, he loves it because he, he knows my work well, he follows my work, and he said to me that it says so much. Yes. It says so much about Christianity and everything else. It's like it's um, it's – these days, anyone can adopt any any religion like a supermarket. You can go pick up what you want. That's and right. I thought, well, that's interesting. And he said, and because you've got him as an Asian guy, in parts of Asia, they can't practice Catholicism. Mm. They'll, get, they'll get executed or whatever that might be. Whereas they come to Australia, they can practice it. That's and that's right. what it's about. Yeah. And I thought, no, <laughs> it's just... <laughs> I just saw this guy pushing this trolley mm. with his Jesus and it looked interesting to me. Sure. It was interesting to me and that's why I did it. Mm. Now, since then, I've done a drawing because I went down there and there was a, um, a family with a shopping trolley with a big statue of the Madonna okay. in, the, in the trolley and it's wrapped in plastic. <laughs> so I just bought it and the father is pushing the trolley, the mother is holding the side of the trolley and the kids are holding the trolley also. Sure. It's like this family unit holding this wrapped Madonna. Mm. So I have to, I've got the drawing and I showed it in a show, mm. but I want to do a painting of it. Sure. Yeah. So it's interesting, uh, Paul, you mentioned that the the work, Super Jesus, the painting that you've got is actually a, a pastel, it's not a pastel oil? drawing, yes. Yeah, okay, pastel. so you didn't do Oh, pastel. sorry, yes, you're, my apologies. There's a pastel drawing. Yes. The Ballarat Gallery have bought the pastel drawing. Yes. But there is a past, there is a painting that I've got here. Yes. I've actually right. got a painting, yes. an oil painting. My apologies. Yes, that's right. right. Yeah, because sometimes I do themes, I do them over and over. Over and over, With yeah. that one, the actual painting of the actual um, the, the actual oil painting is actually got the same idea of someone pushing a trolley, uh, but it's actually near a service station. Right, it's yeah, near so a service station. Setting, uh, yeah, the other one has just got cars in the background. It's got a service station. Yeah, and um, and it's like it's a service. It's like you know because their service is red. Yes. Service station with Christ wearing red, yeah. but also the idea of being serviced right. and so on. Yeah. And, yeah. It's interesting yeah. because those paintings, um, they do look very contemporary, the way that you've set up, the, the even the attire, the clothing that the gentleman's wearing. Mm. He's wearing red shoes, I think, in the painting version. Yes, that's right. Um, yeah. And the way that you've got the, the statue of Jesus actually positioned inside the, the trolley, it's, it's very unusual. Mm. But at the same time, there is a, a kind of fresh kind of contemporary beauty to it. Yeah. You know, when, when we think, say that, yeah, because sometimes I think are oh, they tradi tradi traditional paintings in that sense. Yeah. But when you say that, and others have said that, they say contemporary, and I thought, okay, it's interesting you see as contemporary. Yeah. <laughs> but in a sense, that's true, that's they are, because they are, mm. you know, and um, yeah, I'm throwing a different spin on it. Mm -hmm. it's, um, it's interesting, it really yeah. is. Yeah. There's, there's a drawing that I've got inside the house of this guy holding a house frame. Mm -hmm. He's got a frame, and he's actually walking, and, and, and behind him, there's a new suburbia, and the painting is called Finding One's Place. Right. And what actually happened there is that I actually went to a friend's studio in Paran and there was a guy walking through the park with a model house frame. Okay. He, I think because some people learn how to do house through their training as tradies. Yes. And he had a – and I remember that. So when I got home, I, I 
got someone to pose in that sort of same pose and I drew that and I put the suburbia in the background like right. he's trying to find a place. I see. Where, where do I put my house? Yeah, right. Where do I put my house? Yeah. And that painting I did with the suitcases. Yes. Um, the suitcases had this frame on it, house frame on it, mm. and that was commissioned by the guy who owned the Hiberian pub. Yeah. He's a real estate guy. In Port Melbourne. In Port Melbourne. Yeah. And I did commissions and he said, oh, I want something to do about, about Port Melbourne. So I went down there and it's not that picturesque. It's a nice place, but I couldn't think of anything in particular. And then um, I had a, in my room, I had an old suitcase. I've got an old suitcase there. Mm. At one time walking past the suitcase, I visualized a house frame on it. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, I just, did I just see? No, no, I'm imagining it. But I thought, that's an interesting idea though. So I decided to put a house frame on it and, and tie it on. Wow. And did that. And my daughter and I, we actually took the suitcase down to where, um, Williamstown. Right. Not with no house frame on it, just a suitcase, and we tied a rope on it. We threw it in the water, and I took <laughs> photos of it so I get the actual the yeah. movement of it and everything else sure. to make it as real as possible in that sense. Right. Um, because you can't set that up in the studio. Mm. So we took photos of it, and I came back and I, I did the painting and did that. And everyone's, and then I started to realize that it's about migration. Yes. It's about dislocation is being moving it, yeah. trying to find one's home right. in a sense. It's, it's, it's called, I think it was called moving home or something or drifting or something like that. Mm. And I realized it became very symbolic. Sure. So I had two paintings of that. One of them was accepted into the Blake Prize many years ago. Right. And it didn't sell, but then it sold recently in a show I had that someone wanted to buy it because he sees the importance of the symbolism. That's fantastic. And he's bought it, yeah. um, which is great. So, yeah, so sometimes things just come to me, I see them, mm. and sometimes they happen as I draw from life. They just happen, they evolve. Sure, great. They evolve. So yeah. I might plan it, I might not. You know, right. It just depends. Again, that comes yeah. back to your organic, more of your organic process. That's right, yeah. Sure. Like with that um, large painting of the hill, mm. um, with all those fragments of dead trees, but they look like forms. Yeah. All those. I did that when I came back, initially started that back when I came back from Europe. Okay. Because Australia is about the landscape. Mm. Europe is about religion mm. and all about, all the, and symbolism. Mm. And I try to work out in one way, how do I say, what do I say about, how do I do a painting about me, mm. about us? Mm. And I start to realize that I'm just a fragment. Right. Of the past culture. Yeah. So that whole painting is really about that, that all those statues are well-known European statues and statues from um, that might indicate Asia, they might not, all that stuff, mm. but they're, f they're trees, mm. but they look like things and some are deliberately, uh, like the Pieta or is in there also, yeah. which is a symbol of Mother Earth. Yeah. And the whole hill looks like Earth itself. Mm. So the idea is that it's actually that we are fragments of a past culture. Sure. But we are going through a change. Mm. And now the last few years, that's why I had to rework that painting because we are going through a big change that's now. Right. Yeah, that's, it's very clever that, that mm. when, you, when you do break it down and explain the ideas behind it, mm. it is very witty. Yes. And kind yeah. of conceptual as well when you think about it like that. Mm. Now, moving forward, you reference Velasquez as one of your favourite painters. Mm. What is it about his work that you favour? What I like about his work is that, first of all, the portraits speak to me. Mm. When I saw some of his paintings in life, they speak. They spoke to you. And I remember seeing Las Meninas mm. and the, the young girl in that painting, Las Meninas. And when I was walking around the room, she just keeps staring at you. I know all portraits keep staring at you, mm. but she keeps staring at you. But what amazed me is that when I go up really close, because in the past I always see that in a book and it looks detailed. Sure. When I was in life, I was shocked because it's so loosely painted. Right. So here is this painting and I go up close and it's just a mark here and mark there. There's no detail to the mouth. There's no detail to the nose or the eye, everything else. But you walk away and you think she was there mm. and she was things there. And it moved me. It mm. moved me. And I remember reading about Philip Guston, the painter. Yeah. And he once was, when he, he almost gave up painting, I think. It was Philip Guston. He once gave up painting. And then he realised the emotions that paintings carry. And he said, even though they are just a piece of wood and canvas and oil and pigment, they can change your emotions. Mm. And I thought, that 
those landscape paintings do exactly that to me. Mm -hmm. When I look at that, they speak to me. Sure. They, I, I still think that he still is and was the greatest portrait painter ever. Mm -hmm. And um, it's just that his faces say so much. Mm. And um, and I just love the, the simplicity of his brush marks and all that there. And um, because I like the painting to be at the end about the brush marks, not about the realism, but sure. the brush mark. Right. And, you know, can do a mark here. And there it goes. And That's then you it. see the underpainting. And then you can see the bit of the canvas still showing. Oh, gosh, you know, mm. he's telling us I'm in control. That's right. I'm in control of the surface. Sure, sure. Great. Yeah. He's a very uh, strong painter. Yeah. Oscars. Yeah. Now, other painters that have influenced you, Paul, are Rembrandt, Goya, Van Gogh, Constable, Joseph Wright, Lucian Freud, and Anselm Kiefer. Yeah. When you study the work of a, a painter from a, from a technical sense, what is it that you're essentially fascinated by? What's the thing that pops out to you and says, that's a good painter? Okay, it's different things. Like if I look at Rembrandt, mm. I like the depth in his paintings, like okay. the depth of the skin and so on, All right. and how he worked. So I would look at that and I might do a painting, like there's a portrait of my father, a small one, and I actually worked how he did. He painted very thick monochromatically mm. and the dry and then worked with layers of glazing on top and then going back with thick paint of colour and so on mm. just to understand his paintings, sure. understand his paintings and his technique. Um, other artists, I might like them because of their subject mm. and I might look at them and work out, okay, what's interesting about their subject or their composition. Mm -hmm. Like when I look at um, Titian, his, sub his, his compositions and so on, and Vermeer, his compositions mm. and how he places those. So it's, I look at things for different reasons. Right. And Van Gogh, I like how he puts his marks there. There's no overworking, no glazing. It's just colour on colour on colour and it works straight away. Yeah. So I look in for different reasons. Sure. And some of them I try to imitate them or I might just, just look at them. Right. Look at them and, and work out, okay, what's this artist saying? Mm. Like on the weekend I went to the NGV with some of the students to do something there and I – looked at that Rembrandt portrait again, the one with the Coltley guy wearing that wonderful white collar. Yeah. And the more I look at it, the more I realise how easily it's painted. Mm. When I was a student, I used to think, gosh, I could never paint like that. That's amazing. That's, well, that, that uh, collar is so complicated. It's so complicated. <laughs> but now I look at it and think, I know how he did that. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I understand paint well now. Mm -hmm. I thought, I know he did that. And mm -hmm. I think I, I, I think I can paint that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's interesting how that but happens. Whether like him or not, I don't know. But the thing is that I the, the, the paint marks is a language. Yes. And I'm understanding the language more and more. Mm -hmm. The more older I get and the more I look at paintings, I'm starting to understand the language That's great. more. That's great. Yeah. That, must, that must be very enjoyable once you get to that stage mm. where you can sort of demystify how some of these great works from the past were actually created. Exactly. And you can see faults and think, yeah. okay, that's not right. That's not quite, that yeah, hand's not, right. not quite right. And none of us are perfect. Yeah, yeah exactly. The hand's not perfectly yeah. right. The We're mouth. pointing that out and yeah. all. Things like that. Sure. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Now, in regards to contemporary painters, yeah. who are some artists today that are inspiring you? The artists that I like looking at, um, there's not a whole lot, a lot, but there is um, um, Gerhard Rector. I like mm. his work. Mm. I think it's pronounced like that. There's, I like how he changes from abstract to semi-abstract to figurative and so on. Mm. I like how he does that. Yeah, he has great breadth, doesn't he, in subject he, matter? He does. Like, styles, exactly. And, yeah. and he shows he's in control, mm. which I like that and so on. I used to like the work of Eric Fischel mm. and I'm not too sure if I like his work that much now, but there's a – oh, I can't even pronounce his name now. i gone blank. I've gone blank. There's another contemporary painter. I think he's from Bel um, – Where's he from? Belgium, I think. Uh, uh, come back, I just have it written down. Mm. But there's a contemporary paint, uh, which I like some of his work. Mm. So it varies. You know, sometimes I, that, it, not just painting, sometimes I might be a, a, a conceptual artwork that I might see or artwork sure. I look at and think, I like that. There's something about that that's telling mm. me something. And, um, yeah, and um, I remember there was, I can never remember her name. There was an exhibition that I saw. So years ago in Sydney, it was one of the, um, um, it was a Biennale or something like that, and there was a room and there was these little speakers, you know, the speakers they had, they're all hanging from the ceiling, all of them. Okay. And they looked like flying little UFOs and the shadows on the walls were created like UFOs. Sure. And I thought it was interesting. And, um, but all you hear is this shh sound. Mm. That's all you hear. Mm. And then I went up to it. 
And then you can actually grab a speaker and listen to it. And there's actually someone talking about being abducted, oh, claiming okay. to be abducted yeah, and stuff yeah. like that. So, oh my gosh, okay, it's about that. And I realized, yeah, at the end of the day, there's all these personal things, but at the end, it's all white noise. No one wants yeah. to hear, no one really cares. Sure. I don't know, that was what she was trying to say. Yeah. So it wasn't a painting, it was something something else. Right. So that was telling me something there. So yeah, it, it varies. For me, it varies, you know, yeah. and um, some of the, can, like Ron, Ron Muick, his sculptures, they yeah. inspire me, mm -hmm. something about his work. Mm. And um, But yeah, in terms of painters, it's... Um, there's a lot of paintings that I've seen that are uh, contemporary which I just can't stand because <laughs> they're just putting the paint down it's very naive and it's like, you know, oh, this is it and it's painting. Well, that's what painting is today. Well, to me, it's like it's, you know, we've come this, this far to learn about technical painting and you're just saying if you put this against it, it doesn't work, the colour, but hey, it's, it's okay. Mm. I find that a bit sort of like yeah. mishmash. It's just, um, you know, it's like... Slapdash painting. Slapdash painting. It, it, to, to me, it's like, yeah, the subject might be fashionable or mm. might be PC, mm. but it's not really telling me anything else. And, sure. it, and to me, after after the subject matter, mm. I want to look at the paint and the surface. And if it doesn't tell me anything else, then that has nothing to offer me anymore. Sure. Well, it's, it's really interesting me. how... Um, diverse the artists that you look at are from old masters through to 19th century artists through to contemporary artists mm. conceptual art you know i think one of the things being a teacher as well is you, you you've got to be open to a lot of different things yeah, you have you know, to. especially when you're trying to uh, influence students and guide them you're not essentially um trying to dictate to them but open up uh, pathways for them help exactly. them see things in different ways and and that's a great thing about teaching you know it does keep you continuously learning and ke keeps you open it does and, and a lot of my students um they all know that they, when i show them works if i'm going to talk about portraiture i would show them all sorts of portraiture right from classical to contemporary sure and um and a lot of them, some of my artists, right, students are actually got, are abstract artists, and mm. some are more conceptual artists, mm. and so on. And and I keep that open, mm. and I, I tell them that I'm a figurative painter, but doesn't actually mean that's the answer. Mm. That's just how I look at it. Sure. But you've got to decide what is it that you want. I'll teach you the skills about drawing and painting and so on about how to use paint and how to use all these drawing mediums and so on. But you've got to decide what is it that you want. Yeah. Like I've got one student who. Um, She's just had an exhibition, um, and she's very much thick, expressive painter. Right. She's got mental health issues, and all her works are about that. And mm. she, the local paper wrote something about her, and all her paintings are about that. And she does all these things. There's one scene I taught years ago. She was in the late sixties, and she could draw, and she draws well and paints well. But she was interested in abstraction. Right. And when we did the classes, she said, "I know you don't." I'm, I'm more interested in abstraction. I said, yeah, I can tell by your work. Mm. How do you know? I said, because the way you did your still life, the way you cropped it, it's very abstract. Sure. So you need to look at the artists that you like or you want to learn from. Look at them. Sure. Look at them. And how, where do I want to take my work? Mm. If you're interested in abstraction, you look into abstraction. Right. You know, and I'll help you with it because just because I'm a figure of painting doesn't mean I don't know about abstraction. I can tell you about abstraction. Mm. You know, Mondrian understood abstraction really well because he understood Vermeer really well. Yeah. And all those sorts of things. There's all these things that people... Um, you need to put it all together. That's you right. need to put it all together, and it, it goes in all fields of the arts. You know, sure. if you're teaching music, and you're only interested in rock and roll, but someone comes up to you and says, "Oh, can you teach me how to sing classical?" Mm. and you you can't say, "Oh, well, that's rubbish." Right. So, well, if I know, I'll teach you as much as I can. Sure. Because that's what you want to learn. And it's particularly important when you're a young art student, you know, in art school, yeah. you know, to be a sponge and to absorb as much as you can. There will come a time later when you do uh, develop your practice where you'll come to understand, okay, this is who I am, this is what I do. Mm. But it is very important uh, in the start when you're in art, and art school to experiment and try things that you may never return to, but yeah. it is important to have tried them. Exactly. To see if, you know, you can develop in that area or if it's not for you. Oh, so for exactly, and that's what I did. I over the years experimented with the things. That some things are a bit more figurative, more abstract, and so on. But I keep coming back to my own thing, sure. and I do that with the students. I get them to draw something and say, "Okay, today you're not doing your thing. Today I want you to all to do this, and I want you to. I've got this image. It's upside down." Mm. 
and I want you to draw it upside mm, down. Sure. Why? Because I want you to understand the form. I want you to understand what the picture is, right. just understand the dark and light and sure. doing that. And then I want you to turn it into something else. Mm. See what you can do with it. Mm -hmm. You know, abstract it. See what you can come up with. Sure. You know, because it could be your strength, but you don't know it. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not going to help you find out what you've got by telling you. You need to find yeah. it. Yeah. Get out of your comfort zone. Get out of your comfort zone things. and try something yeah. and, and see how you go with that. Sure. Like th there's a, um, large painting which is rolled up there mm. that's about seven eight meters long mm -hmm. and that was a drop sheet that used to be on a printing table at the university <laughs> and they were going to and because it builds up with layers and layers of color yeah. they throw that out mm. because i said can i keep that and i took it home and i worked into it with, with a broom with paint brushes everything else and i turned it into a landscape right it was experimental for me it was experimental yeah. But it was so, it, that helped you sort of get out of your comfort get zone. out of your comfort zone yeah, and indeed. open up new possibilities and new possibilities. And I realised from that, oh, okay, I, I can do this. Sure, sure. And this has really changed the way I think. Great. Yeah. Now, uh, Paul, you tend to use family members in some of your paintings. Mm. What's the significance significance of that? Is it just because they're readily available, or is it something deeper? Cheap models. They don't have to pay them. <laughs> yeah. No, they they're available. They're there, and um, and for example, my father always sits for me a lot. Mm. He's a very patient person, so he'll sit for me. Um, and brothers and sisters, if I needed a model, they'll, they'll sit for me and doing that, and cousins and so on. So they're they're there, they're there. Mm. They're there. But at the same time, I want to paint them because they I know them well. Right. So when I paint them, I know them well. And then others, when people look at them, they might not know who my father is, mm. but they would say things like, you know, your father's portrait, he's like my dad. Right. Or your mum's portrait, that's like my mum. Mm. Or that's like my grandmother. Mm. And all those sorts of things. And to me, that's what I'm doing. I'm painting who I know best but people were related to themselves in their own way right. but if it was a famous person that'd say oh that doesn't look like so and so or that looks like so and so exactly and that's it and that's all they're concerned about mm. i'm not interested in that sure uh, if i paint the everyday person that i know mm. people relate to it in a different way that's true in a different way sure and that's what i'm interested in great yeah. great now, some of your landscape paintings contain a sense of aviation as they are painted from bird's eye view, mm. depicting the western suburbs. I understand some of these paintings were composed prior to Google Maps being developed. How did you manage to paint these images without a reference? Yeah, they, they were, I started those, the first ones I did was in the 80s. 80s. When I did those, and... Um, and what actually happened is that I wanted to paint them from an aerial view. And at the time, I'm not sure if I can even say this today because of the political correctness, but I actually like, used to like looking at Aboriginal art. Okay. And uh, of the aerial view of the landscape, yeah. all that sort of stuff. And I went on a trip for the first time on the plane when I was about 21, 22, and I saw the, the, the land from the top. Yeah. And I could see their paintings. Mm. Even though it, they, they weren't copying the landscape, they were, it's all symbolism and so on. But I could see that. And and then I thought, okay, I'm going to paint the landscape from the aerial view, mm. but I don't have the information. So I deliberately love the scenes I've done. They don't exist. None of those places right. really exist. Mm. So I used to do and say, okay, I'm going to put a house there. That's going to be my uncle's house. Now I know he's got, and because I knew about something about, about building, because my family would like builders and uh, the trade industries and all that sort of stuff and i've learned about things so i thought okay well i'm gonna build my uncle victor's i'm gonna paint my uncle victor's house he's got a house that's that shape he's got a, uh, a shed here and he's got a greenhouse there and everything else and that's what i would do oh. so i would visualize right and visualize what someone's house would look like because mm -hmm. i've been to their house and mm -hmm. so i might make a street and it might have houses of people or i might invent them because right. they're very predictable you know that the house is going to be there sure. the shed's always going to be here and the greenhouse is going to be there, mm -hmm. and the footpath is here, and the swimming pool's there. Sure. So, so they're very much in general. So there's one that's called Fertile Land, mm. and it's actually made up. It's just made up. There's no street at all. But I deliberately cropped it because it looks like a fallopian tube. 
Okay. So when you look at it, it looks like a fallopian tube, and it's what's called fertile land. The suburbia is growing. Mm. So the, the trees with their shadows, right. they look like the eggs Yeah. in the female fallopian tube. So it's all about this new growing suburbia. Sure. And that's why they're not in a particular place. Mm. And there's one where I've got these two courts together, mm -hmm. um, or cul-de-sacs, they call them technically. Yeah. And it looks like a tap. Right. But at the same time, it looks like a wing nut. I see, right. And um, wing nut in the suburbs, if someone has got big ears, right. their, nickname their nickname is a wing nut. A wing nut. Yeah. A wing nut. So the painting is called Where, where Wing yeah. Nut Lives. That's clever. It's yeah. really clever. So it's using that sort of thing. And um, so I'm not trying to p depict a particular place in particular. Yeah. It's actually general. So it could be anywhere. It could be anywhere. Anywhere in suburbia. Again, so people can identify with it. And work in, read into the painting, in a see their way. own environment. It's yeah. an environment. That's and that's right. why a lot of people say, you know, oh, you, you, yeah, you, wow, well, Google Maps comes in handy. I said, no, these were done way before Google that's Maps. incredible, yeah. Way before Google Maps. That's incredible. How you it's just that I just sort of try to visualize it right. from the, from my head, you know, what someone's house would look like. Mm. And, and because I know about light, because I studied still life about light and shadows, yeah. I know where to put shadows. If, I, if I'm going to build a house, Mm. Paint a house with a square rectangle shape. I know what the shadow is going to look like. Sure, sure. You no, know, so I would do that. So you conceptualize a light source. Yeah. yeah, sure. Yeah. Now, out of all your subject matter, you seem to be most fascinated by portraiture. In fact, you have painted several self-portraits throughout your life, many of which have been entered into popular Melbourne art prizes. In 2015, you painted a portrait of Gordon Morrison, who was the former director of the art gallery of Ballarat which you entered into the Archibald Prize. This portrait is titled Gordon Morrison and the Dusty Miller. Gordon became interested in your work after he saw a portrait you had painted of your father for the Doug Moran National Portrait Prize. He approached you and asked if you would paint his portrait. I understand that this event itself lifted your confidence and gave you a sense of achievement as an artist, as oftentimes it's the artist who approaches the sitter and asks if they would be willing to sit for a portrait. Can you recall this particular moment in your life and how it made you feel? Yeah, it was quite interesting because um, at that stage, the drawing of that Jesus in the shopping trolley was shown at the Drawing Prize, the Wicked Moore Drawing Prize at Ballarat. Mm. And the person that won it was actually one of my students, Gina. Okay. She won that prize. And anyway, uh, he then Gordon approached me and he said to me, we want to buy your drawing. And mm -hmm. I thought, that's nice. It's great. And then after that, he said to me, there's something else. I was wondering if you're interested in painting my portrait for the Archibald. Okay. And I yeah. thought, oh, okay. <laughs> and because the Archibald was going to be shown at Ballarat mm. the following year. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. And I said, okay. And I was shocked because, like you said, normally artists approach the sitter. Sure. Whereas here's a, here's a sitter approaching and he was an important person. I was just in Nepal from the from St. Albans. Mm. And um, he said, I've been following your work and I love your work and would you be able to paint my portrait? So anyway, so I, I agreed. And and um, so he came and did a few sittings um, and I drew, did a lot of drawings from life first and did that. And then I tried, I was asking questions about him mm. and, and so forth. Um, and it was interesting because um, the reason why it's called Gordon Morrison and Dusty Miller mm. is that when he actually moved to Ballarat, someone gave him a plant which is called the Dusty Miller. Yeah, yeah. And um, that was his introduction to Ballarat. I see. And so I put that into the painting. And um, now when I actually looked him up and I did some research on him, everything's about Scotland and the Scottish background. He wears his kilt and yes. all that sort of stuff and so on. And when he sat for me, I was curious about something. And I said to him, look, I'm drawing you and I'm observing your face and so on. And I know about your Scottish background and so forth. But there is something about you that's not. And I'm trying to work out. It's, to, it's got to do with the colour of your skin. It's got to do with your patterns of your, your face a bit. That I'm seeing there's something that I cannot figure out. And then he turned around and he laughed and he said to me, actually, my mother's Polish. Oh, wow. And I said, I thought so. Mm -hmm. And I said, that's where the, the art comes from. And he said, yeah, she was, she was well, she was, she knew a lot of well-known artists. Okay. And so on. He says, no one's picked up on that before, but he goes, I'm not totally Scottish. I'm actually, my mother's Polish. Mm. And I thought, now it makes sense. It was easy for me then to work from there because there was that thing about him that, that I couldn't tap into properly. Sure. And once I got that, then then it was easy. And then I did, and I actually painted him from life. And he was shocked because he said normally in the past when he's got people to paint him, they paint from a photograph. Yeah. 
and he said, you're, you're going to paint me from life. I said, yeah, I want you to sit down and I'm going to paint you from life. Mm-hmm. And I did it, the, his whole face in one session mm-hmm. and everything else. And then we entered it into the Archibald. And unfortunately, it didn't make the Archibald. Mm-hmm. It, um, it got into the Salon de Refuse. Yes. And I rang him and I said to him, oh, Gordon, I've got some bad news, but unfortunately it, it didn't make the Archibald. Mm. It got into the Salon de Refuse instead. He goes, great. I was shocked because he was great. That's what I want. That's exactly what I want. It's perfect. And he said, you don't under- I understand it, Paul, but it's actually better to be in the, the refuse better and you'll see why. Mm. And um, so we still had to go to Sydney for the show there and yeah. then that Salon de Refuse was being shown at Mornington um, Regional Gallery. Right. And, um, and then I was asked when it came to um, the Regional Gallery to go and give a talk at the Regional Gallery about that portrait and sure. about portraiture in general. And then Gordon invited me to Ballarat Gallery to give a talk on portraiture Great. also. Great. So, yes, yeah, so I, I felt really um, honoured mm. to be asked by someone like him to do his portrait mm. and and so forth and and it was you know he was wonderful to paint he was a he's a great guy and he knows his plants inside out mm-hmm. and um yeah he sure. just knows them really well so he's not just an expert on art he's actually um he could tell you um in the painting itself in the background there's a ladder yes against the fence and there's a tree that's being pruned mm. And uh, because he likes his trees, but also his job as a director mm. is he's actually pruning and taking care of someone else's mm-hmm. things over the fence, that's or someone right. else's growth, or someone yeah. else's art, basically, yeah. Yeah. and so on. So that's why I did that painting sure. with that in the background, and and it's Ballarat in the back. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it was interesting. Yeah, yeah. that that painting's uh, got actually a bit of symbology in it. You've got the the hose that has actually your initials, the P. Uh, in the in the hose in the garden. That's right. Yeah. yeah, there's a there's in the, there's a P which is to do with Poland. Yeah, and also eight was his infinity mm. and all that sort of stuff because it's about we were talking about you know the beginning and the end. Where does it begin? Where does it end? And so on. Mm. But yeah, they deliberately did the shadow. I think if I remember rightly, the shadow from the pot or something becoming the P, which is to do with Poland. Yeah. Or Polish, but people probably won't notice that. That doesn't matter. But for sure. us, it's a little secret, little yeah, yeah, <laughs> image lovely, there. Lovely, yeah. Now uh, that particular portrait of Gordon didn't make it into the Archibald, but as you mentioned, it did. Uh, ex- it did get accepted into the Salon des Refuse, and that was at S H Irvine Gallery in Sydney in 2015. That's right. Yes. Right. Yep. Yeah. So yep. at that point, when you, when it did get accepted, well, when it didn't get accepted into the Archibald, but got accepted into the Salon des Refuse, you felt as though. So Gordon wouldn't be happy, but uh, were you pleased to be accepted into the Salon yeah, I was. de Refuse? I was because you know um, this is Salon de Refuse is selected on the on the um, quality of the work, not mm. not who's famous and who's not. Right. You know, the article is who's famous and who the public are going to know and everything else. Mm. Whereas the Salon de Refuse is on the merit of the work. Sure. And that's what most of us know as artists. It's the merit of the work. That's right. And that's why I, I was I was happy to be in that. Mm. Because a lot of people are going to go see the art world. It's still going to go see the, the Refuse anyway. Yeah. They're going to they make that one trip and see it anyway. Right. So, yeah. Right. So it worked out well. It worked out well in that sense, yeah. It's it's yeah. interesting because the, the origin of the Salon des Refuse goes back to the 19th century with mm. the, the French Salon and the, uh, the French Academy. And it was uh, Emperor Napoleon, I believe, who developed the Salon des Refuse for people who didn't get into the annual salon so had an opportunity to exhibit. Exactly, well. exactly, exactly yeah. that's right. So I, get, I suppose there runs this risk when you do get accepted into the salon des refusés. I'm not necessarily saying you, but someone mm. hypothetically speaking, where you almost feel like your, your work wasn't good enough. So it didn't get accepted into the major, major prize. Right. So you, you got, you know, you got uh, your work just got placed into this uh, salon. But if you look at the history, a lot of the well-known artists, a lot of them that we know, mm. are worth were those ones in that yeah. Salon de Refuse. They're well, the ones who got rejected at the time. That's right. And they got into Refuse, refuse and uh, they became the more famous ones. That's right. Like, yeah. A typical so example is uh, Edouard Manet with the luncheon on the grass. Exactly, that's right. That was refused, yeah. Exactly. Sure. I think, was it um, Delacroix or Jericot, one of those, got refused mm-hmm. and it was in there, and Courbet, mm-hmm. yeah, all those. A lot, of, lot of famous artists mm-hmm. throughout history. Exactly, yeah. 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 Yeah, that, that painting now, the Gordon Morrison, mm. now is owned by the Art Gallery of Ballarat. That's they, fantastic. They, Great. they decided to buy it because he was retiring. Great. And they rang me up at one time and said, what's going to happen to that painting? I said, oh, I'm not too sure. And they said, well, we're interested in buying it. Are you mm. interested in selling? And sure. I thought, 
yeah, I, yeah, yeah, of course, yeah, no worries. And they, they tricked him because they had a meeting, the normal meeting, and then he stepped out. They said, can you step outside um, for a sec? We're just going to discuss something. I thought, what's going on? And when he came back in, the portrait was there? No, it wasn't there. They, they had discussed that they were going to buy his portrait oh, okay. and they all agreed. Right. And they said, we're going to buy that portrait. Oh, lovely. Yeah, so he That's was That's a nice way of uh, showing their appreciation. Appreciation of him, mm, yeah, yeah. which is great. Yeah. Now, moving forward, in 2014, you submitted a painting of your daughter, Eva, to the Doug Moran National Portrait Prize. This painting is titled Interrupting Her Moment of Concentration, Eva and the Apple. The painting speaks to ideas of the anonymous nature of online communication and the lack of face-to-face -face contact in contemporary times. I understand the painting took you four years to complete. Upon completion, you received many comments stating that the painting really reflects our contemporary era through juxtaposing symbols such as the Apple MacBook that Eva is using mm. with the skull which is featured on the top that she's wearing. Once you received word that the painting had been selected as a semi-finalist, you were shocked. In that particular year, I understand the Moran Prize received 985 entries who were all competing for the $150,000 grand prize. You were in the top 3% of artists in the country who got selected. You have stated, quote, Some people don't respect what you do. They think it's just a hobby. But when they learn that you place in these kind of competitions, they see you differently. It gives you a sort of respect and acknowledgement, unquote. This is well said, and being selected as a finalist in any major art prize does give you a sense of credibility as mm. an artist. Mm. You have been selected as a finalist in the Moran Prize multiple times over the years. Can you explain just what is like when you uh, do receive the news that you have been selected as a finalist? Yeah, I, I, the best way I can explain it is that you feel, you, feel, you feel accomplished. You feel like you're actually being respected sure. and that you feel like you're of worthy because you, you've been, um, that you've been selected that when you see the number of people apply for it mm -hmm. and then you get selected, you think, oh, wow, okay, my work is, is, must be good. Sure. If it gets selected for that, that's right. Mm -hmm. Now, with that portrait of Eva, there were two. There's that, two versions. There's two, two, two versions. versions yeah. That one with the she's wearing the jumper with the skull on it mm -hmm. and the apple. That was in a semi-final. It didn't make the final, that okay. one. It was the other one that was called um, um, it's something else. It was actually about the same sort of concept and idea and so Technology, on. Technology. Exactly, yeah. yeah. And interestingly enough, someone who's a well-known artist who I know of said to me, how did you do it? And I thought, what? It, when it was in the semis, the one with the apple and the skull, he said, art history has an apple and skull in it, and you did it in a modern context. That's interesting. It's very clever. And I thought, yeah. oh, okay, I didn't realise that. Because all, what actually happened is that my daughter was turning, had a 16th birthday party mm. or birthday coming up, and I said to her, I'm going to paint your portrait. How would you like, want me to paint you? Mm. She said, I like my laptop and I want something, that my favourite thing. And I said, what favourite things you have? And she showed me things and I like the jumper, so I said, I'll, I'll paint with that. Yeah. So I actually was painting that, but the... Uh, the painting was due the next week. The actual photograph of it. So we oh, had her. Wow. So the, <laughs> we had a six, her sixteenth birthday party in here. So all this was converted to have a party in my studio. Right. So when everyone left after the party, I had to put everything away, and I stayed up till three or four in the morning wow. to finish that painting off. That's incredible. That's a <laughs> tight to, turnaround. Yeah. <laughs> so you know, I was a bit tired from setting up the party and everything else, but I said when everyone was gone, I had to hurry, hurry up and paint it, wow. finish it off because it was due. The, photo, the, uh, the image of it, mm. and then it, it made a semis but didn't make the finals. It was a second version of one. That took a few years because I painted it, then I reworked it and I changed it. Sure. And it was um, called um, um, hashtag um, um, uh, in conversation and so on. And, and that, that, I can't remember the full title, but the actual painting was about her looking at her laptop. She's kneeling on the couch. Mm. Um, but... Oh, she's um, in, a sort of in, in a Buddha position. Yeah. It's the enlightenment. That's right. You know, what is she looking at? Mm. And she's wearing a onesie, which is very creepy. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's her, the one that she had. Mm. And it's like, it, it's looking over her shoulder. It's like, you know, who's looking over her shoulder? Right. And what is she looking at on the computer? The nature of being online. Being online is scary. To, and, yeah. Yeah, and the painting on the background, on the wall, there's a freeway. Yes. It's about access to here and there. So we have access to everything. But in the 
left side, there's a room with a person that looks like me and I'm talking to people. Yes, that's right. Yeah. So I'm having a conversation. So, yeah, so the paintings about conversation in my generation, we're talking to, to each face, other face yeah. to face. With her generation, they're all online. online yeah. They're all online. That's an interesting juxtaposition. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Clever. Again. And that one made the finals. That got into the finals. Sure. And um, yeah, so it was interesting. And my daughter and I both flew over to for that show. That's great. Yeah. So yeah. when you were painting uh, Eva for the, the, the first version of the painting, yep. did you actually have her sitting for you? Yeah, she did. Okay. She sat for me. But, of course, she was a bit younger and a bit impatient, so I did have to use a photograph. Yes. At, at yeah. some, I took photographs closely, and then I worked to, to get the bulk of it done. Yeah. And then I got to sit down to actually get the fine details, to get the light properly and everything else because sure. the light's different on the photo. Of course. So she sat for me and, um, you know, but Dad, I don't Eva, if you do that, I'll get you this, I'll buy you, know, whatever, all that sort of stuff. Oh, okay, Dad. It's, gonna, it's for you, Eva. It's for a portrait for you. That's great. So, yeah. That's and um, yeah. and yeah. that, that, uh, that portrait's currently hanging in your home, I understand. Yeah, that's right, yeah. The, um, the one with the, the first one is actually here in the studio. The one with the sitting on a couch like a Buddha, yeah. that's actually inside the, inside the house. Yeah, that one's inside yeah. the house, yeah. Lovely. Yep. Now, this next question is quite important. Paul, do you see yourself winning the Doug Moran National Portrait Prize one day? Mm, that's a really tough one. Um, like I said, I haven't applied for about three years and uh, because, yeah, it's stressful and the politics, all that sort of stuff and all those. I don't know. I think um, I think it's changing the Doug Moran mm -hmm. and it's starting to go for more popular, more famous people, more famous artists, more all that sort of stuff and so mm. on. So I don't know. To me, I, I was told once by someone from the art world that someone like you will always be selected for a major art prize because you're good, but you'll never win it mm -hmm. because of where you come from. And I didn't believe that. And I said, nah, that's ridiculous. Even my friends say today, nah, that's not true. That won't happen. I'm not sure. I, I sometimes feel that it's possible. That, I, feel, that, I feel so too. I, yeah. I feel that, that, you know, they'll say, well, you know, like I remember at um, the... Um, the last Doug Moran I went to, the publicist said, we know nothing about the artist. All we know is their name and their postcode. Mm. Okay. And why well, is that important? says a lot. Yeah. Why would you want to know their postcode? Yeah. Why is that important? Yeah. But, I mean, it could mean innocent. It could mean, mean nothing. Maybe they just want to know what state they're from yeah. so they make sure they get some from different states. Sure. It could be that. Mm. Yeah. But then I thought, is that maybe? Maybe I'm reading too much into it. I thought maybe not. But I don't know. I think... Um, and um, my brother told me once that when my father's portrait was in the National Gallery, in the Doug, in the Doug Rand there, he and his then wife went to look at the painting so no one knows who they are. Mm. And there were, he said there were two women there who actually were, um, they knew a lot about art and they were well-dressed and everything else. And they said, one of them said the other one, see, look at this painting here. This is a great painting. Wonderful painting. But someone like him will never win a major art prize. They won't allow it. Mm. And he told me that, my brother. And he said, you're right. And that's what I heard them say. And I thought, yeah. I mean, it doesn't mean I could give up. It's just I, I gave myself a break sure. from these major art prizes. Maybe I'll try again someday and maybe maybe I'll be lucky. But apparently I was runner-up twice <laughs> because well, yeah. when my father's portrait, um, they put that in the, news, in the Herald Sun. That was the bad before the bypass? Was yeah, that, that, that one, yeah, that, yeah. because um, someone who was in connected with the, the whole thing at the NGV said to me that, um, that your painting was a runner-up. Wow. And I thought, oh, wow, that's nice. And then when my, the portrait of my ex-father-in-law, his portrait on a drop sheet, right. um, the judge was from America. Right. And she was then a specialist in Spanish art and Spanish portraiture oh, and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. And... Um, and then she said, um, she was about to announce the winner, and she said, and it's actually written on the transcript that's in the book, what she said, and she said, before I announce the winner, I just want to talk about a couple of other paintings I really loved, and I found it very hard to choose. Um, Paul Borg's painting of Vern in, mm. in a Day's Life is just a fantastic painting, yeah. and she said something about it. And everyone's get up to me, Paul, you're runner-up, you're runner-up, you're runner-up. Mm. And I said, no, she just said that she liked the painting. They said, no, and that means if she didn't pick the one that she had to pick, she would pick yours. Yeah. And, that, and that's I interesting. Thought, oh, that, wow. <laughs> that, that, that painting of your ex-father-in-law um, was painted on a drop sheet, and it features uh, him 
in a pair of overalls cutting an apple. That's right, that's yeah, that's yeah. right, yeah. yeah. Yeah, with that painting, what actually happened there is that I painted my father and then I decided that uh, who and I'm, who am I going to paint next? And then I decided to paint my father-in-law. Yes, my then father-in-law. And then I I prepared a white canvas, went to his house, and I started to paint and draw, and it wasn't working. It just wasn't working. Mm. Nothing was happening. It looked plain, ordinary, and was boring. And then while I was painting him, he had a stack of drop sheets next to him on the floor. Yeah. And I, I kept staring at them. My eye kept focusing on them, mm. and I thought. Oh, hang on. I said, Vern, can I take one of those? And he said, yeah, help, help yourself. So I took one of the drop sheets, took it home, stretched it. Wow. Yeah. And <laughs> I took photographs of him to do the drawing outline of him. Sure. And I came back and I drew him directly on that drop sheet. Oh, great. And I left it. The overalls are transparent so you can see, actually still see the drop sheet. Yeah. And everything else. And the apple is because he eats apples. He loves apples. But he's also knowledgeable. He was a... Mm. Um, German, he used to he reads a lot, mm. and and the apple, of course, is a symbol of um, Adam and Eve and the tree, tree of knowledge, knowledge yeah. all that sort of stuff. There's that religious thing, and um, and and then someone saw the painting and said, "Are oh, you copied that from a photograph because it's reversed because the ring's on the wrong finger?" And I mm. thought, "No, I drew it from a photograph, the outline, but I drew it from life." But yeah, how come the ring's on the wrong finger? Mm. And then I saw Vern. I said, and I looked at Vern, and he had the thing. He's ring on the wrong finger. Okay. And I said, Vern, how come your wedding ring's on the wrong finger? He goes, oh, because a pro he's a maintenance worker. He used to paint houses, do brick laying, everything yeah. else. He said, if I pick up my the brick with this hand, oh, I'm going to ruin the, the ring. Uh, yeah. So I put it sense. on the other hand. Makes, makes sense. sense. Yeah. I thought, oh, that's right. So I wasn't, I did, sure. yeah. But the interesting about it is that the, the judge referred to that painting as being a shroud of the sitter. Okay. And it's interesting because it is. Because it is, yeah. when he when I stretched it and I started painting it, he came up to the painting, my ex father in law, and he said, That colour there, that was Betty's house in nineteen seventy eight. <laughs> that was so and so's house in nineteen sixty three. So he knew every single colour and whose house it was Such and he painted. History, yeah. So it was a shroud. Yeah. It was a shroud of him. So did yeah. you um, prepare that? At any uh, with any kind of primer, or yeah. I think or? I can't remember. I, put, I think I put concrete on it or something to, to seal it, yeah, to make sure it stays strong, sure, because sure. it's very fragile, so it'll break. Yeah. And there's rips in it, and I left the rips in there, mm. and I cut bits here and there to add it to actually position certain colors I liked onto it to sure. put it on there. Okay, so it was arranged, um, it's arranged also, yeah. even on the overalls, there's a patch. I actually cut that from an off cuts and put it on there so it looks like a patch on okay. his overalls I see. all that sort of stuff right. so I played with that because it, the surface to me we spoke and yeah. I thought I'm going to use that because it, it, I use that surface and to me it says a lot Fantastic. and I, I've got a, a portrait of my mother and the top part of the painting is is tea towels mm -hmm. the second the bottom part is tent material because she spends six months at home in St Albans yeah and then her and dad spend six months at the caravan Okay, right. So the tent material is the top, the actual material, which is real tent material I got. And I got them, her to sew them because she's a seamstress. She knows how to use an overlocker. Yeah. And she sewed the two material types together and I stretch it and I painted a portrait on that. Uh, that's, a, and that's another interesting portrait. It's got these suburbs in, in the backdrop and there's some fish you, in the composition. Yeah, because my mother's a mad fishing person. Yeah. She knows her fish really well. Sure. She, um, where they go fishing on the pier and so on, everyone knows her well there. They always go up to her and ask her, is this the legal size I caught? Look, I have to throw it back. She knows. <laughs> No, that's where they are at the moment. Sure. Yeah. So, great. Yep. Great. Yeah. Now, Paul, one of your most heartfelt portraits was painted in 2006, mm -hmm. shortly after your separation from your ex-wife. This painting is titled In the Matter of Self-Portrait, Respondent Father of Two. Mm. The painting is composed almost life-size and depicts yourself with both of your daughters looking at the viewer in a state of reflection and contemplation as you stand in your parents' living room. The painting is remarkable in its ability of capturing your despair at this point in your life. I understand the idea for the painting was conceived while you were on the train one day, as you've stated, quote, One day taking my daughter to creche on the train, I overheard two men talking about their daughters who they hadn't seen since their divorces. I said to myself, 
no way in hell is that going to happen to me and decided to put what I felt into a painting, unquote. Can you reflect on this period of your life and how you went about creating the painting during this difficult period? Yeah, it was a traumatic period. It was really hard and I couldn't sleep and we had the courts because it was all decided to go to court for custody and so on. Mm. And um, so, and, and I couldn't sleep. So I used to stay up late and I thought I'm going to do a portrait because we had, we been really, really, really been to court a few times and they weren't favouring the father, only to favour the mother yeah. and so on and all that sort of stuff. And I thought I'm going to do a painting about this because this is how I feel and I feel maybe not, not anyone's going to listen, but I'm going to do a painting about what I'm going through and um, I wasn't allowed to see my stepdaughter because she was living with her mum and because I wasn't her natural dad I had no rights to her which I found it really shocking mm. and and then even my own daughter I had to fight to see my own daughter which was you know I'm a fathering type and I used to spend half the week taking care of all that stuff when I was living together we, I, you know, I was brought up that way that family first sure so um, when I came to do that um, that portrait it was difficult so I had to use a couple of two mirrors to get a reflection on my, my face double so I can get it right. Mm -hmm. um, I did take a photograph because my do my stepdaughter was able to visit only once. Okay. So I got all of us together. I took a photograph so I can do the outline. I right. did that. But then the rest, I had to do it from life of myself in the mirror. My younger daughter, I painted in her clothes from the photograph but then her face from life. Right. And I did that. With my stepdaughter, I started to use the photograph because I had to, because I couldn't see, I wasn't, um, she wasn't able, allowed to come over, all that stuff. And I did it as a photograph, and everyone said, yes, it looks like the, her, the photograph, but it didn't, not to me. Mm. To me, it's, a, it's not her. It's sure. not her. So I end up, um, let it dry a bit, then I terpsed it right back, okay. and I threw the photograph away, and just, I had the structure there, and I painted it from what I know of her. Oh, what wow. type of personality she is. So she's from her imagination. From my imagination of what she's like. Okay. Because what actually happened when we um, won that time that she was able to come and stay over, um, she, I went to go, she went, her and my natural daughter went back to their mum. Mm. And I went to go and put my shoe on in the morning. And when I put my shoe on, there was something in my shoe, and I thought, what have I dropped in my shoe now? And I took me, sh I got the shoe, and it was actually a card that she made my stepdaughter. Okay. And she's, and the card said, smile again, Paul. Oh. And it was such, yeah. so touching. I thought, that's what she's like. She's always concerned in there. And that's why in the painting, the light's coming from her, from that side onto her face. Yes. Across to yeah. us. And I, Put that there. So then I decided, okay, I'm just going to paint from what I know of her. I know she's gentle, she's quiet, and she's always got that those eyes, that sm that little smile that makes you feel homely, makes you make you feel happy. Yeah. So I I worked from that from my of what I know her. Once I did it, then my family said, oh yes, that looks like her now. That's amazing. It's exactly. And in the, in the painting, she's wearing red shoes, which she didn't have, but that was deliberately from. The well-known movie, um, um, Wizard of Oz. Oh, okay. The Red oh, Shoes. Yeah. There's no place like home. There's no place because like what actually happened yeah. when we went to the courts, my ex's um, solicitors were fighting that. You now he doesn't have a home. He he's just staying with his parents and all that sort of stuff. And he doesn't have a proper home mm. and all that sort of stuff and whatever. And my solicitors were fighting. Were saying, well, house has got home's got nothing to do with bricks and mortar. It's got to do with love and all mm. that sort of stuff. Mm. And that's what made me think. Yeah, there's no place like home. Yeah. What is home? Mm. So I ended up doing the painting like that with, with her with the red shoes on and on the floor um, in that painting there's a scale mm. that's fallen with the white sh um, that the um, the blind you know how the blind justice oh the ju justice yeah, yeah so that's on the floor yeah. because they they're only judging by um, being more towards the mother rather than the dad yeah. all that sort of stuff and so on and in on the table is a butterfly in case in the glass case and I did that because everyone said to me oh you're free now you're free as a butterfly you can do what you like yeah but I couldn't because emotionally and everything else I was still trapped yeah I'm fighting this invisible mm. glass this invisible thing that I can't fight sure I don't understand you mm. know I don't understand I don't know how to deal with it mm. and so on and everyone said well don't worry about it you know um, let her bring her up and just live your own life. No, I couldn't do that because it's not the way I was brought up. Sure. So yeah, so that was for me. That was emotional doing that 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 painting. Mm. Um, 
And as one of my colleagues said to me, he saw it on show um, and he said, you can see the tears in your eyes in that painting. And I thought, can you? And um, yeah, because it was hard. It was really hard. But it kept me sane. Mm. It kept me sane. Sure. And my daughter at the time when she was sta- when she came and stayed with me, I used to draw in sections of it, like the, the jeans on my portrait there and I said mix up the paint I said okay can you paint in the, mm. the underpainting so she would help me do the underpainting all that sort of stuff and sure. then I'll just do all the other bits fantastic but yeah it was very emotional right. and that got selected and it was shown and it was funny because it wasn't until the opening one of the judges said to me oh I, I know what that painting's about now and I thought oh okay it took you that long um I called it um respondent father of father of two because i couldn't come up with a title and all and that night before i had to send it off the documents were on the table to go to court and it has their um respondent mm. um and yeah. i thought um yeah I, respondent father of two sure. all that sort of stuff and that's what i decided sure. to do clever yeah 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 well um it's it's interesting because uh, from what I understand, Paul, you had written a letter to the lawyers who were handling your divorce, asking for shared custody of your children. Mm. However, you felt they had interpreted the letter wrongly, so you decided to create the painting with the intention that it would have greater impact than a written letter, hoping they would listen better to a picture. Is mm. that correct? Well, not totally. I mean, what I did is that the solicitors I had were helping me right. and they understood my perspective mm. my perspective it's the other side that you were just not um, understanding my perspective sure my solicitor for example and this is what shocked me is that before the whole thing started mm. in court she actually said to the judge um your honor before we actually start we actually have a, a willing father here this time yes what does that mean well so all the other fathers weren't really willing they just wanted something yeah and and yeah, so and I thought, but then it was still in her favour, and and then I learnt when we had to go to court again. You know, the, the, my solicitor said you can fight again, but there's six family law court judges, and five of them are more interested. Uh, they're more favour of the mother, yeah, yeah. and the second one, if uh, the, the sixth one, if he's interested in you, he might be lucky, but you have to get that person. Mm. That's terrible to hear. Sure, someone's fighting for their own to see their Ridiculous. own child, yeah. and I. And I thought, I'll just do this painting. And I did the painting. And look, it got um, around and people knew what it was about. And my friends and family, everything else knew what it was about. Mm. And others who saw it said, oh, gosh, I can relate to that. Yeah. 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 Especially hearing those guys on that train saying, yeah, you know, one of his daughter, I remember clearly she's 16. He said, I haven't seen her since she was two. Wow. Yeah. You know, and I thought, there's no way in hell that's going to happen to me. Sure. No way in hell. So did the, yep. did the judges in court end up seeing the painting at all? No, they, they didn't. didn't see it. Um, I, my solicitors did. Okay. Because it was it was written about in an article okay. in The Age. Yes. And someone wrote an article and they wrote about that painting. So they might have. Mm. The judges might have seen it too because it was in The Age and it, my solicitors said, oh, we, we saw the article in The Age. Yeah. And I said, that's good. Yeah, yeah, it's good. Yeah, so um, this writer wanted to write about my work and write about that painting. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Yeah. yeah, so you you actually got attention from the Age newspaper for yeah. that, which is fantastic exactly, because it yeah. is a. Uh, I mean, the the painting is striking. If you stand before it, it is painted at life size or yeah. close to life size. Yeah. Um, but just the expression. I mean, in your face in particular, um, you can definitely, you know, sense what you were going through at that particular time. Yeah. It's, it's very um. It's a it's a beautiful painting, but beautiful in a in a in a in a painful sort of uh, painful sort of way. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It was a good release for me to do that. Sure. And a good and and a documentation of that. But um, yeah, I spoke to a lot of fathers who were going through a lot of um, things at that time and talking to them and what they're dealing with and how they were dealing with it, and some weren't dealing with it well. Mm. And yeah, so. That was an eye opener. Sure. So yeah. So I hope the people who understood it, who are going through it, will actually relate in a different sure. way. Sure. Great. Mm-hmm. It's a fantastic portrait, Paul. Yeah. Thanks. Now, one of the things that I really like to hear is you have expressed that teaching and the support of your students really helped you through the difficulty of your divorce. Mm-hmm. That is something amazing about teaching. Classrooms are full of life, and it doesn't matter what you're going through when you're working with your students, you tend to forget your worries and you become fully present in that moment. Yep. Students always have things they say that will make you smile and laugh. Have you found that to be the case when you're teaching? 
Yeah, yeah. Students do that you, when you go through rough, rough, difficult times and so on. They put you in a different frame of mind. That's right. And um, and they actually um, help you. They make you laugh and so on. And because recently I've been suffering from a stomach issue that wouldn't go away. They know that. They know that there's something wrong. And they can, are you okay? No, I'm fine. No, you're not. And then they'll talk to me. You know, Just let it all out. Tell us what you have. I mean, and I'm open to them about it, things and so on. And they. Talk and when they chat and they advise, why don't you do this and try doing this sure. and try? Yeah, it's like you know they're all like you know well, we want you to be around because we like coming here, so we want to make sure that yeah, we take care of you. That's great. So and that gives me hope and it gives me at the same time gives me this sort of that that sort of that again that family unit in a sense a community unit more community unit. Yeah. And and it keeps me going. Absolutely. It keeps me going. Like this is the longest time I've decided to have one month break from teaching during the summer. Mm. This is the longest time I've had because I've always had just one week. Right. Um, because most of the students want to work during the summer because that's their time off. Sure. And it's it's um, I've been finding it difficult because I'm used to having students all the time around me. Mm-hmm. So the other day we went to National Gallery because a couple of them were going to see something and they said, you want to come? And I thought, yeah, I'm coming. Yeah, <laughs> so, sure. Yeah, you're just- I said, but I'm not going to be in teaching mode. No, no teaching mode. <laughs> I'm just going to come, all right? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm on so, a view today. I'm yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's right. And um, yeah, it's true with the with the breaks as a teacher, you do get to a point where you start to miss the students and, yeah. and especially the routine of you know being in the classroom teaching that's right yeah um, having that 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 strict routine is something that's that's good that's healthy that that, that helps you make progress keeps you pushing forward gives you something exactly. to look forward to that's right exactly yeah now moving forward majority of your portraits are painted from life a mirror is used to reference your own face and sometimes you will use photographs as a reference when painting portraits of others you usually spend several weeks on the initial planning stage and then two weeks on the actual painting can you elaborate on your process of painting a portrait yep it changes from one painting to the next Mm -hmm. sometimes i might get into painting straight away i don't do any drawings i just from the mirror and i paint it and that's it sure and i'll do it in a a session and that's it Mm. sometimes i might do a few drawings Mm. and i might do some pastel drawings of what i'm going to propose in terms of a composition sure and then i'll see how it looks like from there Mm. and then i'll decide if I'm going to do a painting from that or not. Yeah. So it, it varies. Mm. So sometimes the drawing might take only you know, a couple of days to work on. Right. And then the painting, that might take a couple of weeks to work on mm. and so forth. So it varies from painting to painting because I don't like sticking to the one style. Sure. I change. So I don't let my um, um, paint dictate the, the um, subject. I let the subject dictate the t- way I'm going to use the paint. Sure. So if I decide, okay, today I'm going to do it in thick monochromatic paint and then put the thin glazes and so on, I would do that. Right. Whereas the next one I'm going to do thick paint, no glazing, and that's it. Right. Or I'm going to do a painting there, I'm going to paint all, all this colour, put all this thick paint, and I'm going to let it dry for about two, three days, and then I'm going to scrap it back. And what stays, stays. What goes, goes. Sure. And that's how I tend to work. Do yep. you find, uh, uh, depending on your mood, that yes. influences what, the way you approach the, uh, the my mood. painting? It's, yeah. on my, it's my mood. Yeah. My mood. And sometimes if I'm working on a painting and it's not working at all, I'll turn it upside down. Right. And then I would, okay, I'm just going to play around with the colours for a while upside down. Sure. Then I'll turn it around the other way around and then get back into it again with the portrait. Sort of resets your brain a little Reset bit. Reset my brain. Doesn't it? Yeah. It does. Do you always create a, uh, a pastel study before embarking on a larger painting? No, not always, no. Sometimes, some paintings, I don't do any drawings at all. I just mm. get straight into it. Mm. Like the front yard one, that I did the front yard, I yep. did two of those. I set up and I painted directly from that. No drawings. Wow. No drawings. Mm-hmm. And some of the still lives, the series I did, um, I had those colour ones on the wall, no drawings. They directly set them up and I just paint straight away. In one session. In one session, them. yep. That's in that. one session. Yep. Because they're wet into wet, so that might take a day and a half to work on those ones. Sure. And there, so, yeah, so it, it um, I don't always draw. Not mm. all the time. Sometimes if there's an idea, then I draw do the drawings because I'm thinking of what am I going to put here, what am I going to put there. Sure. That large hill one I mentioned before, there's a lot of drawings for that because I'm not sure how it's going to put what I'm going to put in there, how I'm right. going to compose it, how I'm going to change it, what I'm going to add, mm. all that stuff. So then I would be doing drawings for that one. Sure, sure. But some of them don't, some of them just painted directly there and then. That's interesting. Yeah. So you have different approaches. It's not just one set method that you no, would use no. for all I've paintings. never been like that. Mm. And sometimes I might do a drawing and a few drawings, but I never paint it. I would not do a painting of it. To mm. me, a drawing is enough of that. I don't need to do a painting. So you, you create drawings for drawing's sake? 
Yeah, for a sometimes as a drawing, and that's it. Yeah. There's a couple of pastel drawings I did of the lockdown mm. and locked inside the house. Yeah. And I did them in my bedroom looking out on sure. the window ledge, and they're pastel drawings. Yeah. And I was going to do paintings from them, but I decided, no, the drawings are enough. Mm. I don't need to do past uh, paintings of them. I right. don't need to. If I do paintings of them, um, it's, it'll be dry. It'll be too sort of, it's like revisiting something I've already done. Mm. I did them in the spur of the moment. It was locked down. Mm. And that's enough. I don't need that's to it. revisit those. I don't need to do any paintings of them. That's enough as and, drawings. And, uh, when, you, when you do make that decision, is it something you sense in you? It yeah. just feels like you've conquered the idea yep. or conquered that particular you sense it. Co composition. You sense it and you know, okay, it's time to move on now. Yep, I conquered okay. it. I know, that, I know straight away whether I need to do a painting of it or not. Sure. Or I, need, I know whether I need to do a drawing or not of something. If there's something that I'm going to paint it, I don't need to do a drawing. I, I know I can just... Go into the paint straight away. Sure, lovely. Yeah. lovely. So I, I tend to change, and that makes it exciting for me. Because mm. if I have a formula, mm. it's like you're doing the same thing all the time. Yeah. And that bores me. So if I'm doing small painting, suddenly I'd say, okay, that's it. The next one's going to be big. Mm. You know, I do just to break away. Yeah. To break away from that. Sure. And, um, and I tend to do that. I like doing that. Right. Yeah, I like doing that. And it is interesting because you do work with oil painting. You mm. do create pastel uh, paintings as well. Yep. Um, uh, you do create some charcoal drawings. Yep. One yep. thing I haven't seen a lot of in your total body of work, Paul, is really fine uh, pencil drawings. Is that something that Yeah, you, I do a lot of them. You do the fine? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I, just, I don't show them much. I but I've, them I've, got of, yeah. I've got drawers full of fine pencil drawings, sure. graphite pencil. Graphite pencil. Yeah, yeah, I use graphite pencil a lot. Mm -hmm. And I do a lot of those. And um, so, yeah, there's those ones, the graphite pencil. There's, there's a few biro drawings that I've done. Do a few biro drawings, yeah. Yep. And there's even watercolours. Like, like people say, you don't do watercolours. Yes, I do. Yeah. I do watercolours mm -hmm. and I take a sketch pad with me when I go out um, and I, I do watercolours mm -hmm. rather than taking a whole lot of paints out. Yeah. And some of the pastels, you know, they're just going to smudge. Yeah, that's true. I'll just yeah. take watercolours. Mm, and I just convenient. do watercolour studies, yeah. And you do. And gouache, yeah. Sure. And you have uh, used egg tempera in the past. Yes, yep. Sure. Yeah, because when I was an art student, because I didn't have any money, I was actually experimenting and I was making my own paints at times. Sure. And my father used to work at this tyre factory and they used to use titanium because people don't realise that rubber for tyres is actually clear. Okay. So they actually mix titanium white and carbon black mm. to make it grey, to make the tyre right, colour. Right. So he used to bring this bag full of titanium. Mm. So I used to make my own oil paint. Wow. And... Um, Funny story is that one time I was giving some to my friend um, so he can make paints himself and on the train I gave him a bag of white powder, not oh, thinking, and people thinking, yeah. what the hell is he doing? <laughs> yeah. But look, we used to, I used to make my own paint. Sure. And, and then I learned about egg tempera, so then I studied about egg tempera and I decided to make my own egg tempera. Mm. And, and, I did it, and I used to use it as, um, mainly as a surface rather than to do the finished painting. I used to use the egg yolk and I mixed that with... Um, pigment and um and i'll put that down as a ground or i might okay. be, i might mix a bit of linseed oil with it okay and something like that so i, I vary it from there so oil tempera essentially yeah. is what you're working yeah, yeah. Um, it's not the traditional tempera where it's the pigment mixed with the paint with a bit of um distilled water or vinegar water. as they yeah. put yeah and then paint the portrait like that and no, i don't no. do that no. andrew wise used to do that and yeah. so on um so i don't do it that way i mainly use egg tempera as a surface, as a ground. So what I do is that when I actually get the egg yolks, I used to have a lot of chicken, so I used to get a lot of eggs anyway, mm. and I actually mix it and I, I mix it with a pigment and then I might put a bit of linseed oil uh, and then I put it onto a ground, onto a, a canvas after the canvas has been sized um, and then I let it dry. Mm. So when I actually paint into it and put glazes, it sinks into it. Sure. And it gives you the skin feel to it, and that's okay. what I like about it. Interesting. But I don't do it where I'm actually doing it. I don't use the egg temperance in the fact like detail line drawing mm. like Andrew Wyeth used to do. And, no, yeah. um, I don't – or the traditional way, I don't do it that way. Cross-hatching. Cross-hatching, no, I don't yeah. do it that way, no. no. And I just use it more as mixing with the – and sometimes I mix oil paint with the egg yolk. Okay. And, um, and people say, you can't do that. Well, you can, mm. and you're just going to know how to do it. Sure. And um, and the surface you put on so it doesn't crack all these things. I right. mean, it will crack because it's oil paint. But um, sometimes um, I might just use vinegar with the egg yolk and I put it onto a surface. Mm -hmm. 
and um, and a surface um, and a settle, sure. and then I'll work into it right, and right. do things like that. Interesting. Yeah. Now, I understand you sometimes use calcite in your oil paintings. Mm. Would you care to elaborate on how yeah. you use it? I actually learned about calcite because I, I had this book on Velasquez, mm. and they talked about when they actually um, – analyze his painting he used to use calcite right and it was it's cal um ca uh, calcium ca carbonate. carbonate yeah yeah and i thought ah oh, okay that explains because when you look at these brush marks especially in life sometimes they look like they're floating above the canvas yeah they're not on it they're floating mm. and then i thought now with calcite when you mix the calcite and you're mixing it with um um gum or, or, or linseed oil you're mixing it um when you put that on, it's clear. It dries clear. It's even though it's white, it dries clear. Sure. So then I can put washes on there and glazes and paint and everything else and get this nice effect. Or I might mix the calcite with the white oil paint mm. and make it very buttery mm. and I put it onto the canvas and it dry and it has a nice skin feel. Right. And again, when I put glazes and thin washes into it, it goes in and it sits on top in areas. Lovely. And it's beautiful, nice surface, and it's flexible. Okay. The calcite makes it, if it's just oil paint on its own, it tends to you fold it, it cracks. Yes. Whereas with the calcite, it doesn't. Makes it a bit more flexible. Makes it more flexible. Yeah, yeah. lovely. It's right. a beautiful medium. And, um, yeah, some people use marble dust and um, all that stuff. But the calcite, I find, it's quite nice, actually. Yep. Great. Yeah. Yep. Now, oil is not the only medium you work with when it comes to painting, as we've no. been discussing. You also use pastel and sometimes even acrylic. Mm -hmm. Pastel painting has a rich history and was used frequently by artists of the past, sometimes for studies and other times for finished works. However, it seems not to be as popular as oil and acrylic painting nowadays. What is your opinion on the pastel medium and how do you decide what media you will use for a particular painting? Yeah, um, it all depends on what I'm trying to express or say into the work. Now, a lot of people I know, even some of my students, I get them to use pastel. Some of them don't like it because it's too dirty, it's too messy, yeah. whatever it is. And and I keep telling them, stop being afraid and get your hands bloody dirty. Mm. And um, once they get to know it, they actually love it as a medium. And I'm finding more and more people now wanting to know more about pastel. Sure. And especially soft pastel. And, um, and to me... Like I said before, it's actually like paint. You can push it around. You can do all sorts of things to it. And and I think some people don't like it because that, that if, if it's not fixed properly, it's going to fall off. Eventually it falls yeah. off because it's just dust. dust, dust it's just yeah. dust sitting there, and that's fine. But uh, to me, it's um, Chardin's got some beautiful portraits yeah. that he did of himself and his wife, and they're in pastel. Mm. They're in pastel. And, of course, Dago's got beautiful drawings they did in pastel. Yeah. And then someone said to me, yeah, but he used oil pastel. No, he didn't because oil pastel wasn't invented. Uh, it was invented by Sennelli, I think, for, for Picasso mm. because Picasso wanted something he can draw and paint with but not actually paint. Mm. And that's I think that's how oil, oil pastel came about. Mm. So Dago really only used... Um, um, dry pastel, mm. but he probably um, put a medium to it, maybe in some of them. Um, and that's what I tend to do sometimes. Sometimes when I'm drawing on the canvas, I might draw with a dry pastel, sure, or oil pastel, and then I smudge it with the medium, right? And then I work into it with oil paint. So it depends, right? It depends what I feel on the day mm. and, and what I want. If I want to be more textural, then I use a, a, a more heavier weave canvas because it's got more texture on it. Right. Or I might put paint on very thick. If I want it to be smooth, I use a, a finer weave canvas. Right. Or I might put the primer on very thin mm. so it doesn't actually leave any lumps anywhere. Sure. So it all depends. Right. And, um, and then sometimes I might say, okay, I want this to be really textural. So I'm going to put on the paint, scrape it back, scrape it back on, put it back on there, leave it there, put some... Um, um, a little dry for a couple of weeks and then get a sandpaper and sand over it and get the sand around and sand it <laughs> and get a nice surface. Sure. And um, um, sometimes I mix acrylic paint yeah. um, rather than mixing uh, – with, with plaster. So rather than actually mixing plaster with water, mm. I mix a bit of plaster with acrylic paint. Okay. And it solidifies. Okay. And um, – and it goes really well and it's flexible. Mm. And then I put it onto a surface and it gives you a really nice texture. Sure. And when I was actually, and I used that 
knowledge because I did the painting with that 30 years ago and it hasn't cracked and I bent and it still doesn't crack. So I actually used it. Instead of buying any of these putties they have to patch up walls and holes, right. I actually use when I made that same thing I did 30 years ago because I know it's not going to crack. Right. That's interesting. <laughs> so I've used it in renovating the house, <laughs> fixing up patches and so on. Sure. But I, I allow, as I said before, I allow the medium to, um, the, the subject to dictate the medium. Right. So if I'm going to express the landscape in this way, how do I do it? Right. You know, if I'm drawing, like one time I went out drawing and I only had pencil and I was drawing a landscape and I thought, oh, I only got pencil with me and white paper and that's it. And I thought, okay. So I start drawing and then I grabbed the grass and I rubbed the grass into the paper. Okay. And I rubbed it into paper and I thought now – supposedly that's going to go brown because green grass is going to go brown, all that sort of stuff. Well, the drawings in my drawer, it was done when I was teaching my early years, about 25 years ago. Mm. It's still there and it's still green. It's still green. It hasn't gone brown. Wow. And I've got one of my sketchbooks I did a couple of years ago at my parents' caravan. I did a, a drawing. I used the grass to rub in to get the grass. Mm. That's still green. And it's still green. That's incredible. It's still green. Mm. So I like to experiment and um, – and sometimes I say to myself, I'm going away to my parents' caravan. I say, I'm not taking any drawing medium. I'm going to have a break. Right. And I'll go there. And I get there and I get a bit bored. And I thought, oh, gosh. And then I, and I find some paper and I, I ask my mum, yeah, I've got anything that's powdery, something like in, oh, I've got some sav um, saffron and some turmeric. Yeah, that'll be great. So I get that and I mix it with a bit of water or else a bit of egg yolk and I put that down and I'll work into it. Wow. And I'll work into it and then I'll go and find something and not far from where they are, there's a rock face that's got ochre, red ochre yeah. and yellow ochre. I'll grab some of that and I'll draw with that and paint Beautiful. with that and some charcoal from a fire or something. And I'll draw with that. You really yeah. improvise. I improvise. Sure. I improvise, yeah. And sure. I work with what's available. Mm -hmm. And um, and that's what I like. I'm glad that I didn't have the money to go and buy these materials because I've taught myself how yeah. to make How to paint, get by. Yeah. And how to get by, how to make your own sure. when you need it. Sure. You need so it. I've seen a lot of soft pastels around your studio, Paul. Oil yeah. pastel. Do you work with that much? Yeah. I do. Um, once in a while I work with oil pastel. What I like about oil pastel, I use a textured paper because I like to scrape it back. Once I draw it, then I scrape it back and it gives you a nice texture. Sure. And then I work again on top with the oil pastel. Mm. Um, sometimes what I do is a, a, me, um, a technique called wax resist mm. is where I actually use wax crayons yeah. and I put the wax crayon down and I draw my subject with that, light colours, mm. and then I put a ink wash over it. Mm. And the ink will only go where there's no crayon. And then I get a, a coin or a blade and I scrape it, and you can see the image, and then I work on top of that with oil pastel. Okay, wow. And it gets a really nice effect. There's a drawing in here of that, and it looks very thick and textural, mm -hmm. and it's just wax crayon underneath with a wash, mm -hmm. scrape it back, and then work on top of the oil pastel. Sure, fantastic. And it gives you, so I, I like to experiment. You know, yeah. I've done paintings where I've experimented with um, uh, wine on, on a drawing once mm. and um, a bit of mud. Right. Yeah, and when my daughter used to come and stay when she was little, on the days that she stayed over, I had no money at all. I was just getting by, struggling, and and her and I would paint. And, of course, I didn't have money to go and buy acrylic paint, so I would get coffee yeah. and um, that, um, coffee that was there, old coffee, and I'll actually make it into a paste and make paint, and she can paint with that. Sure. And um, anything from the cupboard, that we would do that because my parents used to do that. You know, mm. my father used to get nets for fishing and bird trapping and you buy them and they're white and you used to dip them and leave them in a bucket with um, tea, with right. tea and water and let them say it can go brown Yeah, and then they'll be just, um, they won't be so bright. Sure. And my mother used to get us to draw uh, when we were at home and none of them, they're not artists, but when we used to draw we had no erasers and she used to get bread and you used to yeah. get bread and you used bread to erase. Yeah, the bread you know? dough, yeah. 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 Interesting. Yeah, it's interesting, interesting. how. Yep. Now, over the years, I understand you have lectured on Caravaggio's painting technique. Mm. What are some of the methods of research you have used to understand more about Caravaggio and his working methods? Yeah, I think in what I've learned from him is more about the expressions, more about the dark and the light, the chiaroscuro, mm. and that whole thing is and the compositions. That's what I like about his work is compositions. Mm. And um, in terms of the technique, again. Um, in those days, you had to paint very much, almost photorealism. Yeah. You know, to actually show a brush mark 
was actually bad painting. Right. You didn't do that. Yeah. And um, so you had to make it as real as possible, looking as real as possible. So in um, in his, I mainly look at the light and the composition mm. and the fluidness of his paint. Sure. You know, the, and he used a smoother canvas so you get there's no texture. Right. It's just this fluidness of the paint, and that's what I like about looking at his work. Sure. Yeah. So when you do, you just look at reproductions through books. I mean, when you went to Europe, you would have obviously seen a few. Yeah. When I was in Europe in Malta, there were three of them. Yeah. So I saw the beheading of Saint John. Right. That one there, and Saint Jerome, they had that there, and then there was another one. I think what did I see? I think I saw, in London. I think I saw one. But yes, yeah, so I saw those in life, so mm. I can actually see the actual texture the textures, yeah. and the paints there, and so on. Um, but if I had to choose between Caravaggio and Velasquez, mm. Velasquez is still my favourite because favorite at the end of the day, it's just paint. Sure, you know, he allows you to see it's just paint. It's just paint. It's, it's an illusion. Yeah. It's an illusion. <laughs> sure, it's all it's a trick of the eye, and that's what yeah. I like. Yeah, fooling the eye. Exactly. Regarding photographic reference, you have stated that, quote, the photograph lies. Photos are good to give structure. I may use it for their, the person's overall structure, and then the subject will come in for the sitting to do everything else, including the face in detail, unquote. This statement sums up your views on the use of photography in the painter's craft. At what point in your life did you realise that there simply is no substitute for working from life? Yeah. Um, when I'm doing a portrait and when I'm doing a still life, working from life is very important for me because I'm, I'm seeing what I'm seeing. Like when I did Gordon's portrait, I took photographs to draw him out just in case he couldn't come and sit and so on. Now, in life, he's got a, he had a wonderful curly thing on his beard. Sure. In all the photographs I looked at, it, it didn't show at once. Mm. So that means, but he's had it. He's always had it. Mm. In life, I saw it. So I'm glad I actually worked from life because in the photographs, they weren't even visible. Yeah. Now, in some paintings, I do that more imaginative, like there's that painting with the boat with all the people on the boat right. and so on. I would use photographs of faces that I collect from newspapers and so on and whatever, or I might get someone to sit for a certain face and I'll use a photograph for that because you can't get them to sit for that long. Or I might make up the face. Right. Because sometimes I make up the face. I'll just keep going and it looks like something, then I'll leave it. Right. Because I've done faces so many times, I can do a lot of faces from the top of my head. Sure. Um, um, and I do that. And uh, But then again, it all depends. So it to me, it's very much um, like one time I had this discussion with this person and they said that... Um, that they only work from life. Mm. And I said, oh, that's fine, that's, that's great, that's great, and that's what I do, I work from life and so forth. And and they said, but for the body, I said, because it's a long time for someone to sit, they said, yeah, for, for the body, I hire a model, and the model will wear the clothes of that person. Okay. And then I'll do the body from that model that I pay. Mm. Now, to me, that's a lie. Mm. If you're getting someone else to wear someone else's clothes to mm. pose, they're not going to sit like that person sits. They're going to sit in their own way. Yeah. So to me, I'd rather use a photograph then mm. of that person the way they sat because mm. at least it's them sitting, sure. not someone else's body. Sure. Just to put the face on. To me, it's a lie. Right. Then I would, I would definitely use a photograph for that if I'm sure. they're not going to sit. If it's too long for them to sit for the um, for the whole painting in terms of the clothing and so on. The draperies. Yeah. You know, I'll just take a photograph and I'll use that. But, you know, a slight fold could be the way they sit. Body language and stuff. Body such. language says yeah. a lot. Would you ever use yeah. a mannequin as a substitute? No. No, you don't no. like to use mannequins. No, no way. No, a photograph, no. you prefer to use I'll a use it, If I'm going to do, I'll use a model with a, a, a photograph. There's no way to use a mannequin, no. Okay. No. Interesting. To me, it's like it's not, the mannequin is not, no, I know they can bend into to human form and so on, but to me, if there's something about it that's not right. Mm -hmm. It's still, no. Nah. No, I wouldn't use a mannequin. And of course, when I was early, there's no way I could afford to buy a mannequin anyway. But no, I wouldn't use a mannequin. No, I'd rather have someone sit for me. Sure, sure. If, if not, even if it's a model, then I'll pay them and take a quick photograph or, yeah. or a relative. And my, when I did that crucifixion painting, um, I needed the figure for the Christ figures. The Christ and the two guys that were crucified next to him, and of course, I didn't, in those days we didn't have internet. You can't look up things and find no. images. Yeah, and so I got one of my brothers, and he mm. I got him to put, he put a pair of shorts on, just normal shorts, and he and I we made up a setup of a cross and everything else in my mum's back um, sunroom, and he howled on with a couple of ropes and everything else, and I took the photographs from the back, and he agreed to do it as long as I bought him a Tracy Chapman. 
um, <laughs> just because he couldn't afford it. So, okay, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll buy you that if you pay for me. And then I realised today, I took those photos in to be developed. Okay. So they must have looked at those photos and gone, these are a bit weird, That's you know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he wasn't nude. He was only just wearing just shorts, but no top, just shorts. Right, but yeah. to me, to get that experience, to get that, you know, and he was struggling to hold on yeah. and we sort of tied it to make sure he feels that pain yeah. so I can get it right, right so I yeah. can get that thing. Authentic. And very authentic, yeah. Yeah, sure. Authentic. Now, Paul, throughout your life, you have taken on several portrait commissions. In the past, you have stated, quote, someone told me once, no one does a commission unless it's a five-figure sum, mm -hmm. otherwise it's not worth the effort. If it's paying well and if it's for an important person or establishment, then that would be considered worthwhile, unquote. Out of all the portraits you have painted to this point, you have expressed that the most difficult ones have been of yourself. Can you elaborate on your experiences in painting portrait commissions throughout your life? Yeah, yeah it's interesting because c commissions are hard. I know some artists who uh, will never do commissions. They mm -hmm. say there's no way. But I find them hard because I don't know what they want. And at the same time, um, you want to please them, you know, want to make sure you want to please them. Now, when I did the painting of um, my hoe, when I originally painted her, I did a painting of her sitting on this boat because mm. she was a refugee. Mm. She actually saved 190 people that she brought that's, from Vietnam. That's yep, she actually was, she was only 19 and she saved them. She bought a boat and um, tried to get them out of Vietnam. Now, she got then caught by the authorities okay. and they took the boat off her. Right. And then what happened is that then she saved a French diplomat, this woman who was shot in the leg or something like that. I can't okay. remember the full story. And she carried this diplomat for miles to safety. And she, this diplomat said, you know, how can I ever repay you? She said, I want my boat back. So sure. she managed to get this boat back. Mm -hmm. So this portrait I did was a drawing first of her sitting on the boat wearing the purple dress yep. that she came to Australia in on the boat. So she wasn't wearing the mayor's clothes no. that she was. I didn't want to do traditional painting. And then she had suburbia behind her. She had the Westgate Bridge because it's got to do with the West and all that sort of stuff. The committee didn't like that. They didn't want that. Mm. They didn't want that. They said the, the, the public are not, are not going to like it because you make it too obvious she's a boat person mm. and they're quite racist and they're going to say, then no way. Mm -hmm. So I thought, well, this is, this is what I like, but no. So then I decided then to do another draw few drawings and she was just sitting there still with a purple dress I still refused to do the gown yeah. and I had the chain the Muriel chain on her lap and everything else and I made invented on her a brooch on the drawing of the boat mm, I see. and I got one of the committee members who was in my favour to, to just stand by and, and she said I'll she said to me what I'll do is that if the, someone in the committee says oh that boat we don't want it mm. I'll jump in and say that's fantastic it's simple and it's not <laughs> And she did, which worked out well. So, yeah, so it depends. When I did the, the portrait of the vice chancellor of the university, he wasn't a great person to paint. He didn't have an interesting face. Right. Um, he had a huge scar here from skiing, mm. and he didn't want me to put the scar in there. Okay. And I thought, here we go. And he came in and he sat for me in the studio, and he always went on about, because he was a bus driver before he well, he was at uni okay. because his parents died and he had to go and get a job and he was a bus driver. Mm -hmm. And I did these drawings with him wearing his gown and his cape, his um, whatever they call that thing, and so on, and he, they wanted books behind him and I thought, oh, how cliche, how boring. And then, and then um, he, he came over and he brought his wife over and she said, hey, did you change your socks? Again, and your pants, because yeah, and he had two different socks. And I thought, oh, I'm finding something different about this guy. Yeah. And then when he stood outside after did some drawings, he was holding the, the, the gown in his arm right. and the cape thing or the hat thing in his yeah. hand, and he, he looked like a bus driver. I see. The way he stood. Right. I said, stay, stay, stay there. So I quickly got a camera and I took a photo of that pose and I said, and I drew it out and then he came and sat for the face and everything else. And... Because, as I say, his face was un that, that interesting. Um, I remember in the um, Simpsons, yeah. um, because someone at the university said, oh, you're painting so-and-so, he looks like Mr. Barnes from okay. the Simpsons. Okay. Burn, Mr. Burns. Mr. Burns. Mr. Burns. Not okay. Barnes, Mr. Burns. Yeah, yeah. So I thought, okay. So I decided to do a standing pose of him. Mm -hmm. Not nude as is in the, in the cartoon, but just um, standing. And then behind him I did 
all these footpaths, but the footpaths is like snakes and ladders. Okay. So there's all these symbols to do because he's in control of people's lives, mm. their future. It's mm. like a game, mm. snakes and ladders. And then far in the background, there's a road, I think, looking towards Avondale Heights or somewhere, Kilo, and you can see the bus coming down the road. I see. So I put the bus in the background. Right. Interesting. Yeah. So it links to his past He links well. to his past and everything yeah. else and Fantastic. so on. Fantastic. That's great. Yeah. So, yeah, so commissions like that. Now, doing myself, it's hard because... What do I look like? I don't know what I look like. I mean, yeah. looking in the mirror is re- reversed anyway. Mm. And one time I did a series of about five self-portraits and that one I said, yeah, that's me. I like that one. And I showed them all to my friends and they all picked a different one. They said, that's you. And right. I thought, that looks nothing like me. Mm-hmm. But yeah, that's you. What about that one over there? Nah, it looks nothing like you. And I thought, oh gosh, isn't that funny? Yeah. Your opinion of how you look is, is different, different as to how, to how people see you, right? Mm. It's interesting. Yeah. yeah. Now, moving forward, I understand there is a six metre long painting that you started working on 20 years ago. Recently, you finished this painting and it's titled Fractured Fragment Hill, but you are unsure as to where it will be displayed due to its size. Can we explain more about the process of creating this painting over the years? And yeah. throughout the interview, you have, you have uh, touched upon it, it yeah. Some, somewhat. Yeah, yeah. yeah with, with that painting, when I first did it, 20, um, gosh, more than that now, more than 25 years ago. And um, when I did that, I did that to try explain about who I am as an Australian. So, I'm, you know, it's fragments of past culture and so on, as I mentioned earlier, mm. and so on. And um, and I did it, the hill, there's a, where my twin brother lives, there's a hill towards his place, and I based on that hill there. Mm. And then the tree stumps are all out there in that landscape. Right. And the tree stumps always look like forms. Mm. So I decided to make them look like forms that we know in history and okay. so on so we can recognise it because we are. Um, I went to a, a, a museum in London called the Albert Museum mm. and there's a room called the Plaster Room. Mm. And it's all these plaster casts. Yep painted a detail of well-known sculptures mm. in this one room. It's like all history in one room. Yeah. So I based that hill on that right. also. And so I did that, and then I decided to show it in the church mm. um, because of its religious aspect, because the tree in the middle is a tree in my parents' homeland that's got this crucified figure in it that's a natural knot in the tree wow. that looks like a crucified figure. Mm. And I did that, and I decided I'm not going to show in a gallery because they're going to say, is that contemporary? You're going to have the critics and the art people saying, oh, this is not really contemporary or this is not fashion. So I didn't care about that. So I decided to show it in a church context, and mm. I found a church in the city that allowed me to do it. And it's interesting because there's um, one guy came up to me, and he said to me, did you do that? And I said, yeah. And he said, look, I am. Um, he was 60-something. He said, in my 20s, I worked on this land and my job was to take tree stumps out of the ground. Right. And I hated my time of that life, not because of the tree stumps, it's that my the emotional time of my life was a misery. Okay. And he said, but I've been sitting in front of your painting for two hours. Okay. For two hours. I said to you, for two hours, I can move on now. Wow. And that was, to me, that was effective. That means that painting has done something. Sure. So then I, I left that, showed it, and then I hung it, it I put it in the... And Rax left it there for so many years, mm-hmm. so many years, and left it there. But since then, I decided I had this bizarre dream that I, someone, to, I, to, I was told to rework it. Mm. I had to rework it, and I thought, what? And I got up, went to the studio, and looked at it. And I thought, yeah, I don't think I like this. And I made the sky higher, so I actually took it off the stretcher, and I got my mother to sew another section to it. Okay, and. Um, Luckily, underneath was actually done, and the underpainting was done in acrylic, so it was actually flexible. If it was oh, oil, it would have cracked. Crack, yeah. But because it was actually, the top part was oil, but the sure. top bottom wasn't, so it was actually flexible, so we can sew it without it being damaged too much. And then I decided to repaint it and repaint the sky, repaint the detail, repaint everything and build sure. all these things. And I put um, a lot of new information into it. And it looks much better now. And the sky has got a lot of movement. Sure. And... Um, and where I joined it, you can see the join, but I actually painted the very thick paint, so you can disguise the join. Right. And and I couldn't work out why do I have to re- why am I repainting this? And I remembered reading about Mozart that some of his scripts he used to go over them ten years later and we change some okay. of his manuscript and his um yeah um, scores and so on. And and I thought, well, you know, a lot of artists do that. And um, but now I can actually see something else in the picture. To me, what we've been going through in these last few years with COVID, mm. 
what's on the other side of the hill? Because there's a pathway on that hill going to the other side. What's on the other side of it for us? Because the hill looks like a, 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 the world. Sure. As someone else pointed out, someone came in who's never seen the painting and said, oh, is this about the COVID? You know, we're all, it's a new world now. What we're going to, and I thought, oh my gosh. It's an interesting perspective. In perspective, yeah. it's different. Mm. It's telling me something else. Sure. Yeah, it's telling me something else. And then one side's a Pieta, and the other side is the um, Roman warrior, the, the dying warrior. Mm. Whereas one of the young students said, oh, I like this painting because you get the path in the middle, and one side's good and one side's evil. And I said, What do you mean by that? He said, Because you've got Mary and Jesus which is the good, and then you've got that thing that looks like the devil. And mm. I thought, well, that's actually a dying warrior, right. but he saw it as the devil. Mm. So they're all seeing different things. And when, when my daughter had a birthday party, another birthday party in here. I had said, I can't move the paintings. I'm working on it, so I have to stay here. All her friends who were then in their late teens, early 20s, mm. they sat here looking at it. They really got into it. Wow. They really got into it. They that's can great. see a lot of things that we, I can see. Mm-hmm. They so could they, relate they, to they're it. almost dreaming into the painting. Yeah, they're dreaming into painting. Yeah. And one of them turned around and said to me, um, I like this painting. It's like going to headspace. Headspace, which, which is, is the, uh, the, the counseling. For teenagers. For the teenagers, the counseling thing. Yeah. Because I'm seeing things, I'm being aware of things and seeing things that mm. I didn't know that they're there, but they're there. Sure, that's great. Isn't that interesting? And I thought, wow, that's interesting. Mm. Yeah, that, yeah they're, 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 they're relating on a different level. Sure. But that compliment so, yeah. you received from that gentleman who um, was able to almost find some healing yeah. through through the painting, yeah. your, your painting. What a what an amazing compliment! That it was, is an amazing compliment to me. Yeah. To me, that to me is more important than some art critic saying, "Well, it's not very contemporary, or it doesn't fall into the realms of this f- movement." Of the, I don't give a damn. Yeah, I really don't give a damn. Mm. To me, that guy saying, "You've helped me move on." Made your that's day. my job yeah you know it's made my day it made me feel like i've done something for someone mm. you know and that's important sure yeah. great now paul regarding your your studio you've got a, yep. a fantastic studio your school is situated within this studio yep uh it's it's a two-car garage is that correct that's been four complete? car garage sorry it's four car a four car garage it's classified yes. four car <laughs> four car garage yep. <laughs> that you um that you've actually converted into a studio you put a skylight in. Yep. Um, can you tell me a little bit about the, just the history of this particular studio and the conversion, how it actually Yeah. Well, when I got changed. it, um, when I got it, the house is nice and small, it's built in the, like, in the early 60s, but I was, and I like it, but I actually like the, the actual garage size, and you can turn to a studio. And um, so I decided to, um, I had half concrete and half dirt, so mm. I put more concrete and I put a floorboard, um, artificial floorboards and stuff, and I put a skylight to get there, and I could put natural fluorescent lights, which is natural daylight, sure. all those. Now, um, when I got this place, then all the neighbours in the area and people told me, be careful because people in the area will break into your place because you've got a four-car garage, which means you've got cars, you've got car parks, and they're going to break in. Mm. And I thought, well, they'll be surprised when they'll break in because they're not going to find cars, they're going to find paintings. And here in Snowbirds, they're not going to a good damn about paintings. They're just saying, oh, oh gosh, it's art, and they'll just walk off. That's right. They won't give a damn. Yeah. So I wasn't worried about that. But to me, it was a perfect space. You know, it's a nice size. Sure. And... Um, because I've had different studios before. I had in my when I was married to my ex in a garage. It was very lo- low. She used the garage mainly because she used to do woodwork. So I only had a small section. And then I had an ICI gave me a warehouse. Yes, Deer Park. In Deer Park, yeah. that I worked in there, but it was always freezing cold in the winter. Okay. So I hardly went there in the winter. And um, but this is perfect, you know. Yeah, this is yeah. lovely. This, yeah, it's a good space, and got. yeah, I can't complain. And it's a bit getting crowded nowadays, but sure. Um, yeah. Did you and, so with the skylight? Did you have a help with that? Uh, my brothers and I helped me okay. because we all know about build building. So the the roof was all rotted, right? The corrugated. So my brothers and I, we put on the new ones on there, and then we just cut and I put the skylight on there. Great. And then I knew how to do it, so I did the last one myself because I learned how to build and you know I, I can I know how to renovate and build and all that sort of stuff because sure. I learned it from dad, mm-hmm. all those things and my uncles and so on. That's great. So yeah, so a lot of the all the maintenance work was done by myself and that front section there the front door with a double door and all that that's all made from recycled material oh great and actually i found someone gave me the two doors and then the actual section of the glass and the frame it wasn't hard rubbish someone was throwing them out yeah so i took them and i cut them up to size to fit that 
there and then I made a new front because Fantastic. it was just a roller door and I had one small door mm. whereas I wanted a better entrance right and yeah. yeah fantastic well it's looking it's looking lovely for your yeah. studios really uh it's a very you feel very creative in the space you know, Thanks, I know that sounds yeah. like a bit of a, a basic thing to say yeah, but they all, the students all say that they yeah. actually come here and they feel motivated to work you feel motivated to work absolutely yeah, which yeah. is great and I said yeah cool that's good sure yeah yeah. Now, coming back to your school, Paul, the Paul Borg School, Paul Borg Art School. Art School, yep. Can you provide an overview of how you went about getting your school off the ground and up and running upon its beginning in 2015? Yep. Now, again, this is something that you spoke about. Uh, yep. You had done that initial uh, yep. course, which uh, helped you understand how to go about running a business and That's such. That's right, yeah. Uh, yep. But I suppose to add to that, Paul, did you find that in the start, was there a steady stream of students coming in or was it slow? It was, it was very slow. And it used to be actually be called the Studio Art School That's because, right. because it's a studio and it's an art school and studio. Yeah. And it's still a great name, but I couldn't use it because we couldn't get .com. Um, oh, because the domain was taken. The domain was taken mm. and, and, um, and we could have got .net and everything else, but there was a problem because every time you typed in that, it used to give you another school that sounded similar mm. that was somewhere else or a, a school and nothing was in California. Mm. So, and everyone said, oh, I can't find it. So, and then I thought, well, that's pointless. It was a good name, but we just couldn't get .au, any of that stuff. And anyway, and then um, when my students who does, does business said, you're known, you're well known, you should use your name. Yeah. And I thought, of course, the George Bell School. Yes. The George yeah. Bell School that, you know, Fred Williams, all those things. Mm. And I thought, well, I'm just call it after my name. That's it. Yeah. yeah, just do that, use my whole name and that's it. Because I went to a whole lot of names and everything else. Um, West Art School, nah, and I thought, nah, you know, it's only, if I move, then I have to can't change your name, I have right. to change your name, all that sort of stuff. And I thought, nah, and I thought, just stick to my name. That's it. Just yeah. use my name. Fantastic. And that was a good advice, and I did that. So I thought, yeah, just do that. Great. Yeah. Great. And the website that I have was, um, my students will help me out. Yeah. So one of the students, her partner, put the website for me That's together. Great. And and I um, helped them out with other things and so on. And we all work together. That's it. Fantastic. Yeah. It's really a, a, a community effort, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it sure yeah. is. Beautiful, yep. beautiful. Yeah. Having taught in the TAFE sector for over 30 years, I imagine you would have established good rapport with your students. Mm -hmm. Did you find that many came back to study with you once you had opened the school? Yes. Yeah. Some of my students I had here were from the past. Mm -hmm. In the, in the um, Rick and Moore Self-Portrait Prize I was in this last year, yeah. one of the artists that was selected was one of my students. Was that the male? Was he? No, it was a female, female. Okay. Um, um, Kim, Kim Jackson. Okay. She actually was a TAFE student of mine, yeah. but then she started coming here right. and um, she did a portrait and got selected. That's fantastic. And, um, so it was really good to have myself and one of my students in that show. What an honour. Yeah, it was a real honour, yeah. real honour. And um, yeah, and it's interesting because it's, um, um, like you said, it's the the community thing and all all that it's it's very important mm. so and um having them those students if there's one who i taught gosh it'll be my early years my second year teaching because that had been got 30 something years ago mm. he's a air steward and he's oh, gone yeah. back to portraiture yeah. to, to paintings and he's been asking to get re-mentored again so he's contacted me to get re-mentored and so on and um and there's another student who um wants to come back and do uh, painting again and um helping them with that um my plan the actual plan because i actually do music and mm. i sing and do guitar and i and i've got a mentor who teaches me music mm. and my plan is to actually have a school where I have painting and music together. Is that right? That's wow. what I want to do. Okay. I want to do that. And we, him and I have both been talking about combining because mm. he teaches the same way that I teach Sure. and doing that. Unfortunately, I've approached the, uh, the bank about extending and so on. They have no interest. Right. And um, even though my house is nearly paid off, um, I thought they were going to help me first because they sounded really keen and interested and all that sort of stuff. And they said, no, wor no worries, you know, we can help you. And, th and then she got really excited and she said, that's great. And we did the paperwork and I don't live on much. So she knows it's very low, which is fine. She said, you, you have no problems here. And then she said, um, it's great that you're opening an, an, a music school in St. Albans. Fantastic. I said, no, it's not a music school. It's an art school. Right. Oh, 
Oh, okay. I'll be with you in a second. And then she went and saw management and came back and said, oh, we need to change the costs of this because they're a bit too low. They need to be high. They're unrealistic. And I thought, that's how I live. Right. Now, I can live on food, $50 a week. I can survive on that. Yeah. I can tell you how much pasta and... Yeah. No, no, we have to make it more realistic. And she changed everything to really high costs. Mm. Everything. Everything was high cost. Right. And then she said, well, let you know in, in about five to ten days. I get home. I didn't even walk in the front door. I get a phone call. Unfortunately, your application has been denied. Oh, that's a shame. And I thought, why? She said, oh, because your costs are too high. And I said, you changed them. You made them high. You know what I live on. Yeah. And I live on that. You change them. You change your mind as soon as I said it was an art school. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. and as as one of my students who's, who worked for the bank for, for a bank said, your house is paid off. Mm. Your house is paid off, and uh, uh, almost paid off. And you got in an area that's expensive. They should be throwing money at you. Mm. So I found it really annoying that sure. they had no understanding and no respect with an art school. Sure. So I I, I knew they weren't going to help me, and I thought if I was a I'm um, a two dollar shop or some um, what they call construction company. One of these ones of her bankrupt, you'd still give me money. Right. Yeah. Have you considered yeah. um, funds, applying for funds? No, I've appl- I've, 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 I rang the Australia Council mm. and they said, we can't help you because you're, you're, um, you're actually a, a profit. Um, oh, you, you're, you're not. Yeah, yeah you're, you're actually registered, you're actually a business. Yeah. And we can't do that. If you're a non profit, they yeah. wouldn't help you. Mm. So we can't help you at all. Right. And so I rang up a lot of these places and grants. And of course, a lot of the other grants are very PC orientated. Right, yeah. So they say they say things like, you know, um, if you've got this and you've got that and you've got these type of people and so on, we'll accept you. But if you don't, we can't. Mm. So it's really frustrating. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the council at one stage, the local council had offered someone who had something to do with the council. They said they can offer mm. a space that I can use. Mm. But I, because I've dealt with councils before, it comes. I said, "What's what do you want?" Because mm. I know then I have to comply with what they want, mm. and they would want done things their way and classes their way and everything. And no, and I said, yeah. "I'm independent. Sure, I'm independent. I don't want to be controlled by any institution. I've been in controlled by institutions through when I was running when I was teaching university. The the gallery that we had was mm. almost." taken over by institution and sure. um, a council now would have destroyed us. Mm. So, yeah, so so I just get by. Right. I get by and I survive. I survive. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Great, great, Paul. Yeah. Now, with your school, I understand students do not need to present a portfolio to gain entry. Mm. All they need is a passion to learn. Having no barriers to enter your school would alleviate some of the anxiety art students have of applying for art school, as some tend to believe their work isn't good enough. But at the same time, not having to show a portfolio upon entry to your school would mean that you are getting a wide range of student supply, from those who are just starting out to the more advanced. Do you find catering for such a wide scope of students to be challenging? Yes. Yeah, I find it challenging at the same time. I'll give them a go. Mm. Is that, you know, some of them don't have any failure because they haven't had opportunity to make any work or right. they haven't done, didn't go to, like some of the teenagers or even younger ones, where the school they went to never gave them opportunity to actually do any painting or drawing sure. or anything like that. So why hold it against them? Mm. You know, if they've made that step to actually go to a private school and try and get art, thing that's 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 courage in itself they deserve a chance they deserve a chance mm. if they've you know especially if they're in their 60s and 70s and thought you know i've always wanted to do this as a as a younger person but my parents would let me and i got married and had children and now do i like they, they, the idea of going to a university is really ta- daunting it's daunting sure. so if, if they come to if they just ring me and say look i want to do my class i, I, I love painting love drawing but i wasn't able to do it i wasn't allowed to and then got married and everything else but i still want to do it mm. I accept them straight away because yeah. I know the passion is still there. The passion is still burning. Sure. sure. And I'll give them a chance. That's you great. Know? That's all I can do. What That's can they nice say? No, you know, yeah. if it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. Sure. You know? Everyone yeah. deserves a chance. Everyone they, deserves the a chance. Is there. Yeah. Everyone deserves a chance. They're willing chance. to exactly. learn and grow. Absolutely. Exactly. Yeah. Now, the curriculum is also student-directed in your school. Yep. Students have the choice of working with drawing, painting, or sculpture. You demonstrate a wide range of media and cover classical as well as contemporary approaches to rendering. Yep. You do spend some time teaching the beginning students the basics of observational drawing and painting. Life drawing classes are also held outside of usual class time for those students who are keen. 
Do you find that students are interested in learning skills in realism or are they eager to just express themselves and follow their own creative path? Um, it varies. Um, usually they like to have their own path they want to go along with, but they're open to something else. They might open, okay, I might say, okay, you, you're you doing watercolours, that's fine, but tomorrow, next week, I'm going to show oil pastel. You can watch if you want to, you don't have to. Mm. If they're interested, they'll watch. So mm. it's up to them. Or else they just go on with what they're doing. Mm. And some of them don't have enough time. They only got that three hours in that week to do their painting because once they get home, they can't. They've got business to run, whatever. So they know that they, they're only going to spend that time doing their thing. Mm. So I don't sort of say, look, you have to listen to this. Right. They don't have to. Right. It's up to them. Yeah. What I do in some classes, though, is that I'm, I'll talk about the first half hour, or first 20 minutes, I might talk about something in, that's happening in the art world right. or I might talk about an artist mm. just to give them some knowledge, of, build up a library of artists in their head sure. and they'll all listen to that and then they go and do their own thing right? and okay. so forth. And, right. yeah, and, and then it's a matter of um, just monitoring and providing individual feedback for each student? Exactly. So I go around and see what they're doing and working on and help them out and, and do that. And, and and it's flexible. Like if one of them says that they come on Monday, for example, one of them, and says, look, I can't come on Monday, but I can make Thursday, which mm. is the same time, come on Thursday. Sure. So it's flexible. Mm. And, um, and that way, um, when I was at the TAFE in my first year's teaching, you had to work to a deadline. The students always had to work a deadline. Yeah. They do a painting and they have to make sure it's finished by next week or the week after. Sure. That was fine. When I started to change things my own way, I started to learn that everyone has different lives. Mm. Everyone has different styles mm. and everyone has different, um, um, what they call it, um, interruptions in their um, daily lives. Right. So I would say, okay, this week we're doing this and then we have two weeks on that. And then the next week we're going to do something else. Right. But if you want to keep working on that the weeks after, that's fine. In mm. your own time at home mm. or in here when the room's open, you can come in and work on that bl black and white painting. I'm not going to say it's due that day. Sure. I'm going to say it's due in two months' time. Right. So you get enough time to work on it. Yeah. And that's what I've learned for here mm. is that I don't give them a deadline. Mm. They don't have deadlines. They just work on their things. It, sure. it, unless it's a certain, if I'm having a show online that a recent one that we had, they had a deadline to work towards that. Right. And that, that was a few months to work on a project that they all did together while they're working on their other stuff. Sure. So it, it's very flexible. Right. It's, um, I put myself in their shoes, you know. Mm. If I've got a job, if I know that I can't go next week, mm -hmm. I'm going to fall behind, which means I'm going to give up because I'm, I'm, I'm going to fall behind. Sure. So I know from my experiences over the years is that people have these issues. Mm -hmm. So they just come back whenever. If they say, look, I can't come next week or the next two weeks, I'll come after that. That's fine. You just you just continue from where you left off. Yeah, sure. And they, it's fine. Sure. Regarding your, your fees, Paul, do you – if try your best to keep things affordable being in yes. the western suburbs, I'd imagine. Yeah, I do. Yeah, I do. Sure. And um, I try to keep it because it does, uh, for some of them, it's a bit too hard. And um, so I actually um, keep it low as possible. Though they've been encouraging me now, they said, look, most of us can afford a bit more, so mm. we can actually, you can put it up a little bit more. Well, with inflation and, then, and everything. Yeah, that's yeah. right, because the cost of things and of electricity and everything else is going up, and they're aware of that. So I would tend to, I see how I go, but I try to keep it low as possible because some of them, um, yeah, it's hard for them to, to afford. Now, for example, I've got one student, he couldn't afford to do the classes all the time because it's too expensive for him mm. and so on. But um, he said, but I can do things for you if you need anything done. Okay. And because I've got a big backyard and it needs to be mowed and things to be cleared, my arm gets a bit sore at times. Yeah. He, he does that. He said, I can come and mow your grass for you. Oh, fantastic. So it's like a barter system. Yeah, you know? that and, works um, well. Yep, and if I need to go somewhere, I need someone to give me a lift, he'll take me or one of the other students will take me and say, you know, that saves me. So I work out something. And, and work out with them. That's with good. That there, and That's that good. tends to work well. Yeah. All that sort of stuff. So, yeah. You help out one another. Help that, one another. Yeah. That's it. Absolutely. Exactly. Yep. Exactly. I understand you supplement the practical work by giving presentations on art history and featuring artist talks, mm -hmm. as well as taking your classes on gallery visits. What are some of the strategies you have in place for teaching art history and making it engaging for the students. Yeah. That's because it can become part. dry. It can become dry. I try and keep it as short as possible. Right. Not go too long about art history. And I try to always put humour into it. Sure. Humour yeah. humor and, and novelty, novelty things mm. that if I'm talking about 
for example, I'm talking about Van Gogh and I say about his colour scheme and so on, everything else, mm. everyone would say, oh, yeah, okay, whatever. And then I would, because I've done my reading, some of my reading, I said, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll say to him, did you know for a fact that his sister had some of his belongings? Mm. And one of the belongings that, uh, that his doctor had and his sister had access to was a box and he had a box with wool mm. and the wool had different colors in it mm. and he'd pick that one and say today i'm going to do painting in this color in okay. these colors wow. and that's what he did wow that's that to them is oh wow that's interesting Does it that keeps him interested yeah. that keeps in, those antidotes keep exactly keeps him interested yeah. and do that and then we're talking about a painting and i might be talking about something and the student says oh i remember seeing that painting at so and so and this happened whatever i'll let them talk about it if they want to mm. As long as they don't go too long, they know yeah. because it's not about them. Mm. They might want to add a little bit to it. That's fine. That's great. That's fine. That's great. And that way, because we're all learning from each other. Fantastic. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it's an interesting thing. So, yeah. So, yeah, I, I try to keep it as short as possible mm. and just an introduction to the artist. And then I'll tell them, if you're interested in this artist, these are who you look up. Yeah. Look up these or read these books and so sure. on. And, and leave it up to you. Sure. Yeah. Are you offering any, um, uh, do you offer homework or any theory tasks the students have to do, research? Yeah, or anything it, like if that? they want to, yeah. If they, say if they, we want, can, to. If they okay. want some homework right. to do. Yep. But I always, always say to them, I don't always have to set homework for you. All I want you to do when you're at home is just draw and paint. Just draw and paint things around the place. Mm. You know, just draw whatever you like. You know, don't go and find fancy stuff. Draw, draw a brick. Draw it's or, there. Just yeah. draw it's there. Mm. And allow yourself to um, um, do that. And if you if you want me to set a task for you, because it's sometimes it's hard to motivate, tell me and I'll set a task for you. Sure. And sometimes they do. They say, can you set something for me because I don't know what to do. Right. And they will. Fantastic. But I teach them enough in here mm. to actually do their own thing. So when they actually do go home, they know what they're going to do. Sure. They know how to come up with their own thing. Right, right. Yeah. And with your uh, structure of your program, Paul, um, students aren't receiving anything like a diploma or anything at the no, end of it. No, no. Is that something you would like to reach one day where you can actually be accredited and offer, whether it's a diploma in, mm. in fine art or a, a professional certificate of some sort? Yeah, that'll be good. That'll be good. I think it's actually illegal for me to do anything like that. I can't do that. But it would be good. The only problem is once you... Uh, you have a start to, given a diploma and all that sort of stuff. Then you have the issues. Then you have to have a program, yep. and then you have to stick to that program yeah. because you have to stick with that. And then if a student hasn't learned anything from that, like my experience from the university, if you have a program and a student hasn't has failed something or didn't do that yeah. well in that, then that student starts to get upset, and then that student starts to start saying, "Well, I didn't actually wasn't explained properly," and they might. And I said, some hadn't done in the past. I'm going to take a lawsuit against the university yeah. because that we didn't do that. You in that week 15, you said on that brief that on the thing that we're going to be doing that. I didn't. I couldn't come on the 15th week. Yeah. And um, but apparently you did it last week mm. or whatever. Things change. As Things well change, as and so yeah. I'd rather not. Yeah. If I can issue it some sort of certificate, but just the way I teach, that's fine. Sure. Yeah, yeah. but I think to give a diploma degree, I can't. It's illegal. Yeah. You have to have to be done to an institution. Yeah. It has to be credited and all sure. that sort of stuff and so sure. on. Sure, sure. Yeah. Now, during your long career in teaching, you have been flexible and supportive of all styles of art making that your students have been interested in. Mm. I understand you are not trying to create a clone of yourself through your students, but rather you are trying to nurture their own creative path. Would you say that the Paul Borg Art School is essentially a school for realist art? No. I wouldn't say it's for realist art. Uh, to me, I would call it it's a school for, um, for um, art in general and, and what art means to you. Mm. So all I'm going to as I said before, is that I'm just going to teach you skills and show you skills and show you artists who work in different manner, different approaches, and then it's up to you. Sure. So, no. Um, um, I actually did have someone ring up and saying that um, your school, do you only teach how to paint realism from photographs? No, I don't. Mm. I don't teach realism. Mm. I teach you how to paint and draw. Sure. And, and it's up to you what you want to do. If you want to be an abstract painter, it's up to you. If you want to be a conceptual artist, it's up to you. Right. And, and a lot of my art, art students in the past have gone and done different things mm. and so on. But the thing is, that, no, I wouldn't call myself a realist school because right. then you only, you're, you're, you're closing the gates. Mm. Once you do that and if, if the word gets out that you're a realist school, then people think, oh, He's 
just teaches realism, I won't be interested in that. Right. You know, and then you you limit your audience basically mm. or your students. Mm. So no. Sure. Yeah, I wouldn't call myself a realist at school, no. In that case, what do you refer to what you do as? Some artists present themselves as um, so-and-so the portrait painter, so-and-so the still life painter, so-and-so the figurative painter, mm. so-and-so the contemporary realist painter. How would you term yourself, classify yourself? As a painter, As a I'll, painter. I would call myself a, a figurative painter. Figurative painter. A figurative painter. Sure. And that's how I think I would classify myself as a figurative painter. Mm. And that's it. Um, yeah. So as a painter, I would classify myself as a figurative painter. Are you yeah. comfortable with the term contemporary realist? Um, I don't mind it. Mm -hmm. It depends on how people see realist. Mm -hmm. Because some of them, again, think it's they, don't, they think realist means photorealism. Mm -hmm. And I don't see myself as that. Mm -hmm. It's like one, one artist I know really well, he never saw my, my paintings in life. He always saw them on photographs. And he came up to him and saw my paintings. And he said, oh, my gosh, you're not a tonal painter after all. You're actually a colorist. Mm. And I, yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. Because I don't sit there and try and get a tone exactly like realism. No. I don't. No. I don't. I let the colour and the play of marks and everything else do that. Mm. So no. So the contemporary realist, I don't know. I'm not sure if I'm... T I don't mind it, but I'm not that happy with it. Yeah. You prefer figurative uh, painter? I would say contemporary figurative painter. Contemporary figurative you, painter. You contemporary figurative painter. That's sure. probably more like it. Sure. If in terms of realist, as if you're saying that the guy pushing the trolley was realism because he was pushing a trolley, yeah. that realism is different sure but in terms of photo realism no no not no, photorealism, no 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 of no. course yeah the funny thing about it though is that i've gina shannon peter tanky who's another student who he actually just won a prize last week um for his one of his paintings and before that he won a still life prize great quite well great and all those when i used to teach them i used to teach them how to be their own self and lose painting or whatever they want to do and they never liked painting like realism. I said, they don't have to. But they all end up, they're all photorealist painters, all of them. Wow. And I thought, how hey, the hell that happened, you know? And you go to their studio, and their studio, their palette is all neatly laid out and all the colours laid out. Like mine, look at mine, it's a yeah. mess. And I thought, did I teach you anything? Sure. <laughs> so, sure. It's really interesting. interesting. But um, yeah, yeah, very different, very different. One of the yeah. things that you also offer uh, in your school, uh, Paul, is, is the visiting artist talk from time to time. Yes. And um, you've had you've had people like uh, Shannon Smiley yeah. and uh, Gina, Gina. Uh, yeah. come come at certain times. Um, is that something you would like to do more of as yes. you progress into the future? Yeah, I've actually planned that. I've actually planned. There's a few people I want them to come and give a talk. Sure. Um, there are other artists I'd like to, but I couldn't afford to pay them mm. and stuff like that, whereas um, some of them have, have offered to come in and just come and give a talk, and I give them things like materials that I've got, uh, some lot of materials I give them mm. and other things like that. Like Shannon, I give him stretches because, you know, he, he, he's got a young family, so I give him stretches, then he'll take them to work with. So, um, so yeah, it, all, it depends, but I, I'm, I'm planning on um, – there's a few people that I've um, spoken to who – uh, I'm going to come and give a talk. Sure. And I hope we work with them. Right. I'm trying to get the guy who I taught, who, who's a conservative national gallery, to come and give a talk. Yeah. He's not too sure if he can these days, but he might be able to. Sure. Because we've been planning it for the last few years, but the COVID came in and it ruined it. Yeah. All that sort of stuff. So people like him, and there's a couple of artists, um, one that I taught many years ago, he's a sculptor. Mm. He lived with American Indians for a while, mm. and he learned about their healing processes and wow. their crafts and so on. And he he's going to come in and do a workshop Great. with the students. Fantastic. So, yeah, so there's all these different things I want to try and experiment with. Mm. Yeah. So, well, that's interesting because we're thinking back to the VCA, um, the art forums were something that well, I recall when I was there, that would happen every Thursday. Yeah, that's they would right. invite yes. an artist over and uh, they would come and talk about their work, their life, their practice, and it was very inspiring to see where life after art school would lead you. Yes. And I understand from your – back in your day, one of the visiting artists that came to speak with you was actually Howard Arkley. Yes, that's right, yes. Could you elaborate a little bit on that <laughs> and what he was like? Well, yeah, um, yeah, it's interesting because I sort of remember the day really well, but um, – yeah, I don't want to say too much about him. He's gone past, but he didn't seem to be with it totally. He was interesting. It was very interesting to, to listen to and everything else. But yeah, he was, yeah, I think I'll leave that. He was, um, yeah, 
yeah, he, I know he had issues and all that sort of stuff, and uh, I think drug addiction, and all that sort of stuff. And well, yeah, eventually it, it killed yeah, him. It killed him. Yeah, yeah. yeah it, he seemed a bit strange. He was exciting at one at, because he said things that were interesting and funny and so on. But at the same time, he didn't seem to be totally with it. Mm. There, he was somewhere else. But anyway, but um, yeah, it was interesting. But we didn't just have. Um, Artists. We had a psychologist one time yeah. that came from Europe mm. and he talked about things that was really interesting mm -hmm. and talking about how to decipher good things from bad things and, and accept certain things and that was really good to listen to. Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, we had all, all sorts of different speakers coming in. We had a musician one time come in. Yeah. She was a celloist, Sarah... Oh, I remember her name, Sarah Hopkins, Hopkins, and she talked about a new score of music that she invented. Okay. And I remember she came in and gave a talk on music and her this um, different way of approach. She was a celloist and she played music using non-traditional scores. It was a different type sure. that she invented. And that was great. Mm -hmm. It was it opened because I liked music, so it was interesting to hear that. Sure. Great. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Now, Paul, what do you ultimately hope to achieve through your school? A hub, a hub where people can come, make art, enjoy the company of each other and um, learn things and um, and then go out and do uh, make their own lives, make their own lives as artists and so on. That's what I want. Sure. And make the, that's all I want is that it's a place where people can come and feel comfortable, feel at home, feel free to be who they are mm. and not be at home and have people saying, oh, what the hell are you doing? Mm. Oh, are you drawing again? Sure. You know, I've got one student, for example, who used to do very expressive work years ago and they used to go missing. Mm -hmm. And she told her husband, now, how come they've gone missing? I don't know where I put them and everything else. Um, and she found out that her mother used to come over and because they were expressive, she thought there was something wrong with her doing these expressive work and she used to burn them when she Kidding. wasn't home. Oh, that's you know? terrible. And they used to burn them. Terrible. Because she didn't want her making that sort of work. Sure. And so on. So to be able to come here and do something and not having someone judge you, um, that's what I want is Beautiful. that they can come here and be themselves mm -hmm. and not be judged mm -hmm. and not be judged. And I tell that to students, mm -hmm. if you're going to make a comment, we have a Facebook page where mm -hmm. you can put your work up mm -hmm. and people can make comments or say mm -hmm. something. And I made it very clear on there that if you make a comment, be constructive. Yeah. Don't be insultive. No. Be constructive. That's right. And um, because if you're going to make a comment and to be whatever, then someone will say something at you and you might get offended. Mm. It's about being constructive. You're helping each other out. It's not sort of saying, oh, I think you could have done that better. If you're going to say that can be better, then give a suggestion how. Sure. Give a suggestion how. And then let the others make discussions on that and then we can talk together and say, okay, this is what everyone suggested. What do you think would work? Sure. That's a good way of approaching it. And, and do it that way. Yeah. And I've found it a much better way. Right. Yeah, that way. And, yeah, so... Yep. constructive criticism exactly and i said if you're in a classroom you know if you're going up to someone you don't like what they're doing and say oh, i don't like what you're doing there well it, just remember they're not doing it for you they're doing, they're doing it for it themselves for yeah that's right so be aware of that mm -hmm. be aware of that mm -hmm. yep. yeah. well let me ask you this how long do you see yourself maintaining the school and what will come of the school once, uh, once you are no longer able to teach? I have no idea. I, I mean, I'd like to go for quite a few years still. Mm -hmm. It'd be nice to go for another, you know, quite a few years. And, um, yeah, whatever happens to it, I have no idea. I mean, I mean my daughter is studying in de interior design and she wants to be interior designer, so I can't see her running the school or anything like that. And, um, and my stepdaughter is studying physiotherapy and all those things and so on. So I have no idea. Mm. It'd be nice if someone else takes it over, mm. if it continues. But if it ends with me, then it ends with me. That's fine. Um, hopefully then whoever has learned from here, they might start their own school. Sure. They might start their own school and then it becomes another form of another school sure. somewhere else. Who knows? Lovely. Yeah, it'd be Lovely. nice if that went from there. Great. Yeah. The, the only thing I would like to do, even though I like being here, I wouldn't mind getting a place that was bigger mm. so I can build more studios and more spaces, all that sort of stuff. So eventually it becomes a place 
And like Montsel that is, you know, it becomes a place where people, tourists go to and visit and everything else. Yeah, yeah. That'd be nice. That'd be great. That'd be nice. And, but you have to have, yeah, so, and um, would people come to a house in, out in suburbia? They might not. Mm. So whether it be big, a bigger place somewhere else, mm-hmm. out, out, out a bit or something like mm-hmm. that, be nice. But yeah, I think I'll, at this stage, I just see myself working here until it's enough for me. Sure. And then if it continues as a school grade, if it doesn't, well, then so be it. Right. So be it, yeah. Right, great. Yeah, because someone said to me the other day, if you won Satsalotto, you would retire when you won't paint or teach anymore. So no, it'll allow me to keep painting more, mm-hmm. for one, and I'll never stop teaching. And um, one of my colleagues that I went to art school with years ago, I bumped into him in Ballarat when they had when I was in the Doug Moran, the last Doug Moran. Sure. And he said, um, he said to me, all of us in here in Ballarat, Paul, we had our fingers crossed for you. Mm. We were hoping you would win. I said, that's nice of you. They said, yeah, because we knew that if you, if we know that if you won, you won't be using that money to go and buy a yacht or anything like that. You'd be build, using that money to keep building on your school and helping your community. That's, that's great. what you would do. Beautiful. And I thought, yeah, you're right. <laughs> it's great people recognise that. And they recognise that. It says, because you're a community person, that's what you're doing. Sure. We, were, we were crossing our fingers because that will help you expand, expand, build your school more. And mm-hmm. it, was, it was wonderful to hear that. I thought that was that's nice. Great. That's fantastic. That's really nice, yeah. yeah. Now, approaching the end of the interview, Paul. Yep. You're big on the idea that an artist or art student should have support from their family, which is great advice as art can seem like a very unusual thing to pursue for some people. Can you elaborate on why you believe family support is important for an artist? I think it's because all of us are human and all of us want to be accepted in one way or another, especially by our family. We want to be accepted for what we do. We want approval from them. Mm-hmm. And even though you, they know nothing about art, you still want some sort of approval. Sure. Because, you know, especially if you have a big family and all the others are getting approval, are oh, they great at this and great at that and great at this and whatever, um, whatever, it, you feel like you want that approval. Mm-hmm. You want that. And um, it's interesting because um, one time one of my friends said to my dad, um, you know, um, yeah, Paul's doing really well with his art and everything else. And Dad said, oh, yeah, they're all doing good. You know, my his brother does this and his sister does that and all that. So, and she said, no, I'm not talking about them. Mm. You know, you didn't want to talk about Paul. I'm talking about him. Mm. You know, he's doing well as an artist. You know, mm. do you acknowledge that? Mm. You know, and he does, but he doesn't say anything. That's yeah, a very quiet person. Quiet, yeah. yeah. And um, when, I, when his put was in the Doug Moran, when he went to work, um, they actually did – heaps of photocopies of that painting, big ones, and they hung them all on the wall in the canteen of where he worked. How do you, you know? feel about that? And he said he felt – I said, no, he still hadn't told me how he felt about it. He just told me about it. And it was actually someone else that I knew that told me. Okay. said, oh, they put all these things in these off in the canteen of your painting of your dad. I said, oh, okay, it's interesting. He didn't tell me that. Mm-hmm. See, dad doesn't say much. He, if he comes in here, he'll just look around and go, yeah, okay. Mm. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Quiet. Okay. Quiet. Then he'll go in the garden, start working in the garden, or right. do something there because he doesn't. Sure. So he doesn't know how to take it in. But was he aware of the magnitude of that of his portrait actually being selected as a finalist? No, I don't think so. Wow. I don't think so. I think now he does, but then no, I don't think so. I don't think he doesn't realise that you know your son's been selected to be shown in the National Gallery for Christ's sake. You know. Is he I, aware of the the, the cost, the, the amount of the prize? Um, it was a hundred and fifty thousand dollar award. Yeah, well he knew how much it was. Okay. And and then that and my parents would say, Did you win? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's like, you know, it's that's all they're right. concerned yeah. about. Sure. And which is understandable. Sure. Because and my mum keeps on saying, you know, are you okay? Are you have enough money? Are you surviving? Mum, I'm fine. Mm. I'm fine, yeah. you know. Yeah. And and it used to they used to do things like they used to say Mum used to bring me up and say, Paul, can you take me to the bank? I need to go to the bank. Uh, Paul, can you take me? It's like I've got all these other brothers and sisters. Bring them up. Oh, I can't ring them because so and so is working, and the other one has got the kids, and they're going here, and the other one lives in the. Yeah, no, they all have lives. Yeah. Like me. Yeah. I can't just drop everything, and that was a few years ago. Mum knows now. Mum always rings me. 
for you can say no if you're too busy. It's un I understand if you're mm -hmm. teaching it, but are you no? It's okay, mum. What do you want? Can you take me? Yeah, yeah. No worries. I can do that. That's fine. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Because yeah. they took me for granted. He's only an artist, so he can just drop everything. It's not important. That's right. That's right. The others are important because they've got jobs. Yeah. You know, yeah, they've got I, jobs. I understand. Yeah. what you're saying there. And I and now they understand. And it took me years, but now they respect that. They sure. respect it. Good. And I think when the first book that illustrated came out, that's when they start to realize. Oh, actually, he's doing something. Mm -hmm. Proper. If you could go back to your younger days, Paul, what are some of the things you would have done differently? In my younger days? Um, in my younger days, I'd probably been a bit more outspoken. I think what held me back because of my younger days, because I was brought up by nuns, mm. and nuns were incredibly violent. And if you said something or did something, you were hit or belted. Yeah. So it got me f frightened to speak up. Yeah. And I was very frightened to have my opinion. Sure. All those sorts of things. So if I didn't have that, I reckon I would have done gone pushed it further because I wouldn't have been afraid of authority. I wouldn't have been afraid of people. I've just done things. Mm. Um, I think if um, in art school, I've I would like to be able to speak up and say things and do things and partake in things and get involved more. Sure. But I was a bit too naive and a bit too shy. Right. Yeah. Right. And probably I, I probably would have maybe gone to art school later. Not, I was only 18 right. when I was at the VCA, wow. 18, 19. It's very young. It's very young. Yeah. And if I had gone older, I probably would have been a bit more wiser and sure. I, would have been, I would have been a bit more involved. Mm. All right. that sort of stuff. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. What do you hope to achieve with your own paintings in the next five to ten years? I don't know. Um, with my own paintings is that, that they, they get more known, yeah. more recognised. That's the main thing. And, um, and some acknowledgement of, um, of where they're coming from and what they're about. That's what I would like the, with my art to go. Sure. And in terms of where I'm going to go with the work, um, I don't know. I, again, I let it evolve. Mm -hmm. I just let it evolve. It's organic process. It's a very organic process to me. Sure. Just let it evolve and see where it goes. Sure. Yeah. In conclusion, what advice would you give to art students out there who would like to enter their work into art prizes and have dreams of one day winning the Doug Moran National Portrait Prize? Take out the touch photo ticket, you got the same option <laughs> because it's a lottery. It's a lottery. Sure. And um, you can go for them if you want to and try and all that sort of stuff. But at the end of the day, it's a lottery. You know, you know I've been in it so many times and one year that one person won it and it wasn't a bad painting, it was a good painting. Had That was the first portrait and it was the first time she ever entered and won it. Mm. So that's it's a, like a touch of love. It's like a, right. it's like a like um, John Olson used to say, an art prize is, is, is a trick raffle. Yes. So don't aim to aim for prizes and doing all that sort of stuff. And a lot of galleries push that because they want you to get known by putting into prizes and so right. on. No, to me, it's just just do your own thing and treat yourself as uh, just do your own thing and don't worry about that sort of stuff. Sure, that's good yeah. advice. Yeah. Are there any exhibitions or projects you'll be involved with in 2023 that you would like to announce? Um, well, this large painting that I want to show it somewhere, mm -hmm. I, I would like to find out how I'm going to do it, I don't know, but I would like to show that large painting this year because now we're getting through this COVID thing. Yeah. So hopefully I, want to sh I would like to show that one. Mm -hmm. And I did... Um, at one stage, think about putting out, uh, putting a show of the self portraits. Right. Because I've got, I've worked at there's about twenty six or so self portraits there, so that was another option. Um, but I wouldn't mind showing all the suburban paintings. Sure. But where again, you know, renting a space is too expensive, mm -hmm. and of course the galleries aren't interested in what I do. So, um, so yeah, so there are things I would like to do, mm -hmm. but yeah. It's mm -hmm. just being able to get the funding and all that stuff to do it. And sure. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Paul, I want to say thank you so very much. Oh, for thank you. <laughs> being generous with your time today. No worries. And welcoming us into your studio, sharing your, your life and your work. It's been a real honor to see your work in person, but also yeah. to speak with you and to understand your journey as an artist and what you've actually gone through to get to the point where you are. I hope that you will continue to apply to the Doug Moran National Portrait Prize. Mm -hmm. I mean, being a, a semi finalist, uh, finalist eight times and being shortlisted four times, um, I think you've got a great chance of, mm -hmm. of winning it. So mm -hmm. hopefully next year or this year, oh, this when, year, it, when it comes you around, know. you could 
uh, apply with another painting and um, and hopefully you could actually win it one day. Yeah, it'll be great. It'll be good. But I'll, see you again. I also yeah. want to say I wish you the best with the school. Thank you know, you. I think it's oh. I think it's a, it's definitely a beautiful thing that you're doing here in the West. You know, and and you're you're so right in the West here. Art, art the arts aren't very appreciated. Um, but what you are doing is, I mean, this is a real gem, this school, uh, a real gem in the West. And I hope a lot more people uh, do recognize that and that you do get more publicity uh, through it and uh, can get some funding to help grow the school and mm. um, expand your, your studio because you are getting to a point with the amount of students you have now where you're reaching max capacity. And it would be nice if you could expand a little bit more to have more students uh, in the school. But I also hope that galleries out there uh, start to see more of the um, the potential in your work mm. and to see your consistency, your persistence and your hard work that you've actually been sticking with this subject matter for all these years, right? Over over 35 years. Over 35 years, yes. And that says yeah. something. Yeah. That kind of mileage speaks for itself. Mm. So I, I just want to wish you the very best. Thanks for that. For Thank your you. journey in, in yeah. the years to come. I look forward to keeping in contact and, and, and seeing the development of your school yep. and your own painting. And um, I'm really looking forward to see what happens with the school in the future. Right. Thanks very much. Thanks for this time and thanks for actually doing your homework and doing your research. No I problem. appreciate that. I appreciate people who actually really do this stuff well. So thank you and it's been enjoyable actually thanks. doing this. Thank it's you been my much. pleasure, Paul. Thank you. Thank appreciate you very much. That. Thank you. Ta